So hey guys welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto neglected by his family and becomes a ten tails. Part 1. If you guys enjoy this what if. And you want the next part of this video. Comment down below. And let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. And check out my playlist. So let's start the video. Chapter 1. A fortunate meeting and a strong beginning. Sitting beside his window and looking out at the people walking by on the street, one Naruto Uzumaki wasn't sure whether to sign or to cry. Naruto was a young boy of five years old, he had blonde hair, and not the usual kind either. His was an odd golden blonde color that seemed to literally shine like the sun, and startling blue eyes. However, the most prominent feature on his face were the six whisker marks, three on each side, running horizontally across his cheeks. The blonde-haired child was sitting alone in his apartment, on his bed with his knees drawn up to his chest doing the same thing he did every day. Which was essentially wondering why he was alone, why no one liked him, and why all the villagers glared at him with such fierce hatred, it would make demons flinch in fear. Unfortunately, he had never been able to figure it out and had learned long ago that trying would only give him a headache. Or make him even more depressed, whichever came first. He stared out of the window to his apartment and watched as people walked along the street below. Adults were walking, carrying their kids, holding hands with their significant others. Children were running through the street, playing tag or some other kind of game. Naruto often wished he could do those things, that he could have someone carry and hold him, that he could play games with the other kids, that he could be loved. But he knew it was nothing more than a dream, he knew what he would get if he went outside. There was only one person in the entire village who treated him with kindness. Just then someone knocked at the door and a smile split little Naruto's face as he ran to the door and swung it open. Ajisen. He shouted his greeting to the old man who stood in his way. Hirazan Saratobi was an aging man in his mid to late sixties. He had graying hair and a wrinkled yet kind looking face, which helped create his grandfatherly aura. He was wearing a long white robe with red lining that covered him from head to toe, and a large white hat with a kanji for fire on the front. Hello Naruto-kun, Saratobi chuckled at the boy's enthusiastic greeting. He bent down and ruffled the boy's hair, getting a playful scowl from the young blonde. Despite the boy trying to knock the hand off of his head, he actually enjoyed the small gesture of affection due to the fact that he rarely ever got any. Something that Siratobi was all too aware of. I hear someone has a birthday today. You remembered, Naruto smiled brightly at the one person who never treated him like some kind of freak. Siratobi was the only person who ever treated him kindly, coming to visit him when he had been in the orphanage, giving him this apartment after he had been found getting beaten by several drunk villagers. He was the only person who didn't hate Naruto. Of course I remembered, Saratobi said with a smile, how could I forget? You've been yelling about it for a week now. Naruto blushed before his good mood faded a little, no one else even bothered to figure out when my birthday was. Saratobi winced at the desperation in the blonde's voice. In an effort to get rid of the boy's frown, he stood up and held out his hand. Why don't we go out and spend some time in the village to celebrate your birthday? There's a festival going on today that I think you would enjoy. I Naruto frowned as his eyes clouded over, I don't know if I want to. Why not? Saratobi asked with a frown of his own, you enjoyed the last time we went out didn't you? Truth was Naruto didn't, the last time they went out he was glared at. But he didn't want his Ajisen to worry, so he quickly shoved his own insecurities aside. You're right. Let's go. Naruto grabbed the hand and began dragging an amused Saratobi behind him. Saratobi frowned as he noticed the large scowl on the face of the ice cream vendor he and Naruto had just gotten ice cream from. Not that it was all that hard to notice, the man wasn't even attempting to hide it from the Hokage. Sighing, he looked at Naruto who was happily licking away at the large triple scoop chocolate fudge sundae he had gotten. At least the boy was too busy to notice the man's glare, or so he thought. Come on Naruto-kun, Saratobi said, why don't we try some of the games here? Okay. Naruto said before they began to move into the crowd. Everywhere they went it was the same reaction. People would give Saratobi a differential bow, smile at him, right before they noticed the little blonde he was with. Then they would scowl, their eyes would glare, showing a hatred and maliciousness that shocked and depressed the aging man to his core. He tried not to let that bother him as Naruto led him around. They played several games, scooping up goldfish, a throwing game where if you knock three bottles down, you'd earn a prize and several others. Many of the vendors made their displeasure at having the blonde inside their established booths clear, but with Saratobi there they were all smart enough not to try anything. However, not all people were as tolerant with Naruto's presence. Hey Takeshi, take a look at that damn demon. Walking around like he owns the place. I know what you mean. And the way our Hokage gives him such attention and preferential treatment, it makes me sick. Makes you wonder. What if the Kaiubi has the Hokage under some kind of spell? Do you think it's possible? 
I mean, he may look old, but he is the strongest ninja in the village. So was Yandame, look at what Kaiwubi did to him. You're right. But what do we do? Heh, some friends of mine are getting together tonight to mourn the passing of their loved ones. At least that's what everyone thinks is going to happen. Instead, we plan on taking that demon out once and for all. We won't let him walk around like he owns the place anymore. But wouldn't the Hokage notice when he goes missing? You know how the old man is about Kaiubi. Don't worry about it, my friend is on the council, and when I informed him of what we were gonna do, he said that he would convince the other members to put the old man in a council meeting. With him out of the way there will be no one to stop us, those ninja who aren't getting drunk are patrolling the festival. No one will even be near the demon's apartment. So, you in? Sounds like a plan, I'm in. It was late at night when Naruto awoke to the sound of his door being busted in and his windows being broken. Jumping out of bed the blonde had just enough time to stand up before the door to his bedroom was busted down. Two men were standing in the doorway, but only for a second before they stalked into the room, towards Naruto whose eyes had gone wide. W what do you people want? Naruto asked as he backed away from them. He knew what they wanted of course, this wasn't the first time this had happened. It had happened a few times before when he was living on the street, but he had thought he would be safe now that he had an apartment. Shut up, demon. You don't get to ask questions. One of the men shouted, spittle flying out of his mouth, from the smell, and the slight way he was swaying the man was drunk. Not that Naruto knew or cared. Said blonde tried to get away only for both men to lunge and grab him. Naruto started kicking and screaming, trying to escape or at least alert someone who might help him. It was too bad Suratobi had so much faith in his people to do the right thing, even after all that had happened. Otherwise, he may have given Naruto an Anbu guard to protect him. Alas, they were all being deployed elsewhere at the moment, ensuring that nothing happened during the festival. The men dragged Naruto out of his apartment, where about a dozen men were waiting. The moment the two came out a cheer went up and thus began Naruto's torture. H-H-H-H. Naruto screamed and tears came to his eyes as his hands were nailed to a wood fence with a kunai. His feet were dangling about four inches off the ground and his hands were above his head, blood was beginning to pour out of the wounds on his palms, down his arm, chest and back. W why are you doing this? Asked Naruto through his grit teeth as tears stained his cheeks. Why? Why? Shouted one of the men, because you killed our loved ones, that's why. But I didn't. Cried Naruto, what could he say to make these people understand? Like hell you didn't. Shouted another man, he pushed the one who shoved a kunai through Naruto's hands out of the way and smashed a fist into the blonde's stomach. Naruto gasped in pain and began to cough as all of the air was knocked from his lungs. That childlike visage you hold won't fool us demons. We know all Kitsune are tricksters. Well guess what? This time the trick's on you. The mob soon began to take turns beating on the blonde, for the moment the only weapons used were fists and feet. They hit his face, his stomach, his ribs, one even kicked him in the crotch, claiming that demons shouldn't have children or some other tribe. All throughout it Naruto could do nothing more than cry out or gasp depending on how and where he was hit. Then, they brought out weapons. Ah ah ah. A-H-H-H-H-H. The first thing they used was a broken bottle. The village who stabbed him with it did so on his left bicep, making blood begin to gush down onto his head. Another came up, this one with a kunai he somehow managed to get. He took it to the little blonde face and began to carve out his whisker marks, not just opening them enough to put out blood, but carving all the way through the flesh until the muscles of his jaw could be seen. Blood poured down his cheeks, running along his chin in a thick stream that looked like a miniature waterfall. The young boy's screams intensified, but that just seemed to goad the villagers on more. The number of wounds they inflicted on him were both numerous and horrifying. One man had used a pair of pliers and tore off Naruto's toenails, one by one. Another had taken a hot branding iron normally used for cattle and scalded his chest, face and stomach. When the man was finished the whiskered blonde was suffering from multiple third-degree burns. Be please. Naruto gasped, no more. I I'll be good. I'll do whatever you want. Just please. You can't give us what we want. A dozen strong mob roared. You can't give back all the people you killed. They continued their torture, one man busted Naruto's kneecaps with a mallet. Another had done the same to his feet. However, it was the last attack that hurt the worst. A man came in with a pitchfork and stabbed it right in his stomach. More specifically, he was stabbed right where the seal was located. Gah. I-H-H-H-H-H. Naruto's wails continued, if it weren't for the fact that the festival that celebrated the Yandame sacrifice was still going on, and the council had managed to drag the Hokage into a meeting, they may have gotten caught. Had the villagers not been so drunk they may have noticed the seal appeared when Naruto's blood was smeared across it. As it was, the Hokage was not around to protect the demon, and the spot they had chosen to rid themselves of Kanoha's stain was completely deserted. As far as they were concerned, they had all the time in the world. 
the tortures seemed to continue until Naruto was nothing more than a lump of beaten and bloody flesh, barely even recognizable as a human. The last thing he saw before darkness claimed him was a hammer that smashed into his face and sent him into oblivion. Had the villagers been more observant they may have spotted the second seal on top of the first one, a one-time defensive mechanism installed as a security device in case something ever damaged the main seal. As it was they didn't and they would soon pay the price. The villagers cheered, believing that Kaiubi was finally dead. However as this cheer went up a red energy burst from the lump of raw flesh. It happened too fast for the villagers to even notice, red chakra burst forth from the blonde and formed nine tails that then shot out, piercing each and every one of them. They didn't even get a chance to scream as it burned their flesh, then their muscles and organs and finally, their bones. Soon the villagers were nothing more than dust that scattered on the wind. Sometime during the night Naruto would be found by an Anbu officer who was doing a routine sweep of the village after most of the people had gone home. The red energy would no longer be visible or noticeable, and the only sign of injury the blonde would have, Naruto's eyes opened as he found himself in what looked like a sewer. At least he thought it was a sewer. Gray, drab walls with cracks running along there, and there were pipes that glowed with a blue energy, running every which way along the walls. Sitting up, Naruto realized he was in knee-deep water, yet despite this, he saw that his clothes and body were still completely dry. Getting up, Naruto looked around and tried to figure out where he was. It didn't look like any of the sewers he had ever seen before, and he had been in every sewer in Kanoha during his attempts to escape from the drunken civilians that would occasionally chase after him. The young blonde's eyes found a pipe running along the ceiling that was different from the others, where all the pipes glowed blue this one did not. Rather it had a deep reddish glow, it was also the only one that was leading in a direction he could go. He decided to follow it. Eventually Naruto was forced to stop as he ended up staring at a large cage, it had odd black symbols that glowed with a purple energy along the bars, in the center of the cage was a piece of paper with some odd symbol he had never seen, but looked kind of like the stuff that the old man in the point he had would draw, he wondered if the old man had been down here and drew it. H hello. Naruto called out hoping for an answer, for a second there was silence. Then Naruto heard it, a sound he had grown familiar with, as it had been one he had made countless times. Someone was crying. Following the sound Naruto easily moved between the bars as he continued on towards the source, when he got to it he was surprised. In front of him was a girl, she looked to be about 10 years older than he was. With long red hair that reached down to her mid-back and a pair of bangs that frame a beautiful, aristocratic face, with high cheekbones, luscious red lip, and a small nose, her eyes were currently closed so he could not see the color, but she had rather long lashes that added to her beautiful features. She was wearing a red kimono that hid a rather beautiful figure, long toned legs, wide hips with a small, firm, shapely rear that fit her 5 foot 8 height perfectly and tapered into a lithe waist before moving into a bust that fit her just as perfectly as everything else about her body did. All in all the woman was too beautiful to be human, not that the little blonde had any real concept of beauty. Nine fox tails laid limply at her side and two fox ears were flattened against her head. Currently she was curled up in the fetal position as tears rained down her face. For a moment Naruto was unsure what to do, he had learned long ago that he could not trust anyone except the old man with the funny hat. She could easily be trying to trick him into coming closer, however he also wanted to comfort the strange pretty girl, having cried many times himself he knew she must be hurting and he could not stand to see others cry. He tentatively moved up to her side and knelt down, she hadn't seemed to notice him yet as her eyes were closed. Ah oh no, are you okay miss? He asked in a small timid voice. The young woman's eyes snapped open, Naruto saw that they were blood red, with the black slits running down the middle. They were some of the oddest eyes he had ever seen, and he had seen everything from white pupilless eyes that those blind people had, to those creepy red eyes with the odd looking dots in them. Even though these eyes were also red, they didn't scare him like the other red eyes did. The young woman gasped when she saw a pair of bright blue eyes in front of her and nearly fell backwards, or she would have been in an upright position. She had not expected to meet or contain her so soon, or even if she were honest with herself. In fact, thanks to the seal that held her in place and had been draining her power, she had not even expected to wake up. Were it not for the seal that had been draining her power breaking, she likely would have never woken up. For the past five years she had only been partially aware of everything going on around her, enough to know that she had been sealed and had a general sense of time, but no more than that. Then not but ten seconds ago she had awoken, only to be inundated with several images. Images of her were seen through the boy's eye, images of him being tortured, by people accusing him of being her, of killing others, of hateful eyes and painful screams. The young blonde had been tortured so badly that his mind had been forced to bury itself deep enough within his subconscious to reach this place. The mere fact that the reason he was here because of her caused her even more tears to rain from her eyes. Out of some kind of instinct that she didn't know she had the beautiful Riti groped Naruto, pulling his body to her in a hug as she buried her face in his hair. 
For a second Naruto's eyes widened and his entire body stiffened like a board as the young woman hugged him. Having never had a hug in his life except the occasional small one from the old man he was unused to being so close, except when people were beating him. He was about to start struggling when the young woman spoke. I'm sorry, despite her voice cracking it was still extremely beautiful and soft sounding alto pitch. I'm so, so sorry, she continued, this is all my fault. Naruto's body began to relax as her voice reached his ears, the soothing and melodious sound comforting him in ways he had not felt before. He frowned as he tried to understand what was going on. Unable to think of anything he decided to simply ask the girl who was now hugging, why are you apologizing to me? Those people are hurting you because of me, the young woman replied to his question. Because I was sealed inside of you they feel that by hurting or killing you, it will hurt or kill me. This is all my fault, she began to shake as her tears spilled out harder. However, her body stiffened with surprise when a pair of small arms latched onto her waist. Naruto really had no clue what was going on, but this girl was apologizing to him for something that other people were doing. That simply wasn't right. You don't need to apologize, Naruto said as he moved his head up to look at her. You've never tried to hurt me or done anything mean to me, I don't see why you're saying sorry for something other people have done. The red-haired girl looked at the boy in shock, all of this was her fault, had she been more prepared, she would not have been caught off guard and forced to attack Kanoha. She would never have been sealed in this boy, and he would have never lost his family, she deserved nothing more than to receive this boy's hatred and the beatings he had taken from the villagers because of her. Yet this boy, this little, five-year-old boy was telling her she had nothing to apologize for. Her grip tightened as she laid her head on his, whispering thank you over and over again to the little boy who was still confused. After a while Naruto decided it would probably be best if he knew what was going on, Ano, if you don't mind my asking miss. Where are we exactly? And who are you? The woman blinked, I'm sorry kid I forgot you would have questions for me. Right now we are in your mind, she made a sweeping gesture to the area around her. This place is called your mindscape, think of it as a place inside of you that you can go to when you want to or are in trouble. Naruto only understood half of that, this place was some kind of safe haven that he could go to, but he really didn't understand what she meant by his mind. Could people go into their minds? Despite his confusion he nodded anyway, figuring he would learn what she meant eventually. The young woman continued, as for my name, it's a cane, however you may know me better by my title of Kaiubi no Yoko. Naruto thought for a moment, he had heard the old man tell him about the Kaiubi before he was sure of it. He blinked as he recalled the information. I thought the Kaiubi was an evil demon that the Yandane killed. There's no way you can be a demon. I am Kit, Kaiubi said sadly, however I am not the evil I was. Tricked into attacking your village. It was part of the truth at least, but the boy was not yet ready to hear of the dangers he may face since she was sealed in him. As for Yandane, well he did defeat me in a sense he could not kill me. Demons of my caliber cannot be killed by mortals, so he did the next best thing by sealing me into a newborn baby. Sealed. Asked Naruto, not really understanding what that means. Yes, I am inside of you, Akane said, she wondered how best to describe the art of sealing, or at least how it pertained to their situation to a five-year-old. She shook her head, there was nothing she could really say that would make sense to the boy. All you need to know for now is that I am inside of you. Naruto tried to comprehend what she was saying, so you're sealed inside of me? Akane nodded, and the little blonde tried to grasp what that meant. If she was the Kaiubi as she was saying, and she was inside of him, then. Is the reason those villagers hurt me because they think I am you? He asked, that's really the only thing he could think of. Why else would they want to hurt him unless they thought he was a demon who was somehow inside of him? The redhead bit her lower lip as she nodded. Well that's just stupid, Naruto said with a snort. Wow, how can I be you if you're right here, Naruto said, as if that explained everything. And in a very simplistic way it did. Besides you don't act bad, he added as an afterthought. After all, if she were the Kaiubi and the Kaiubi was supposed to be bad, he didn't think she would be crying and apologizing, bad people don't do those things. A few tears came to Akane's eyes, but she blinked them away as she reburied her face in Naruto's hair, holding on to him like a lifeline. Naruto didn't resist this time as he was starting to get used to the hug, a part of him couldn't help but enjoy the feeling of warmth she gave off. For a while they stayed like that, before Akane perked up. Say kid, she said getting Naruto's attention, do you have any dreams you want to fulfill? Naruto looked at her tilting his head to the side in a cute fashion, had Akane not already been pretty much cuddled up to the boy she would have, after seeing how cute he looked. A second later a foxy grin spread over his face, of course I have a dream, I'm gonna be the best Hokage ever. Akane looked at the young kid for a moment, the boy seemed so determined and full of energy when he said that. Like there was some kind of fire raging inside of those blue eyes of his, she smiled at him. How would you like me to help you? Naruto looked at her, his eyes wide as saucers, would you help me? Of course, Akane said, I will help you become Hokage. 
I will teach you everything I know about being a ninja and will even go one step further by turning you into a Hanyu. Naruto's face crunched up in confusion, and what? The cane giggled, not hand, Hanyu, I will let you become a half-demon to increase your power. Naruto thought about her offer for a moment, she was telling him he would become a half-demon. Was a half-demon like a cane? Well if she was a demon, then he supposed that meant he would be half of what she was. In truth the offer intrigued him rather than appalled him, he was already considered a demon by the village, so becoming a real one would not make a difference, at least it was how he perceived it. Ano, will I become like you? He asked. The cane shook her head, not quite, I am a full demon, well you will become a half demon. That's half demon and half human. I will give you all nine of my tails, since I can regain my power easily enough if I ever get out of this seal. In any event, you will gain all nine of my tails, which will mix with your human chakra to form a weaker variation of Yaoki. Naruto didn't quite understand what she meant by tails of power, nor did he know what chakra was, but put it into the learn later section of his mind. All right, Naruto said, I would like your help in becoming the greatest Hokage ever. The cane giggled at his once again determined look, very well kid. Your training will begin soon. But first, you need to wake up. Naruto opened his eyes as he woke up in a bed he recognized as the one reserved for him at the hospital. Are you alright with Naruto-kun? Naruto blinked as he turned his head to look at the old man in the funny hat, I'm fine Ajison. Did you save me? Naruto asked. I did, the old Hokage replied, not feeling the desire to worry the blonde by telling him he had been found unconscious by one of his anbu. I am sorry I could not get there sooner. I was at a council meeting. I suspect they did that on purpose so they could try to get rid of him, Sirotobi thought with a frown. If only he had more evidence of their wrongdoing then he might actually be able to do something, if only they had not been able to monopolize as much power as they have, this would have never happened. Sometimes he cursed the Yandane for dying, had he not died the bastards on the council would never have gained this much power. It was not that they had taken control of his power, but rather, thanks to the Yandame's death, they had been able to gain enough power and cloud over the village that they could cover up their tracks very well. That's okay Ajison, it's not your fault people are bakas, Naruto said. Tsuritobi looked at him strangely for a minute at the odd sentence, well the beating had only been severe enough to send him to the hospital a few times he had never said something like that, normally it would be marked off as the occasional odd words of a child. But Tsuritobi was not the professor for nothing, could he know of the Kaiubi? Tsuritobi shook his head at the absurd thought, there was no way a child could know of that. He was probably just being paranoid. Careful kid you can't let him know that you know about me. Naruto blinked in surprise as the feminine voice of the cane rang through his mind. He looked around for a moment curiously, when he didn't see anyone other than the old man he thought, a cane chan The cane flushed a little at the affectionate suffix having never had someone call her that before. Of course, she had never given her true name to anyone before, so maybe that had something to do with it. She quickly shook the thought off and replied, yes it's me kid, now don't let the Hokage know about me. If he did no good could come of it right now. Naruto did not understand but agreed to any ways, he looked up at the old man who seemed to be in his own world. Hey Ajison. Naruto asked. Tsuritobi snapped out of his stupor, yes Naruto-kun. Can I go now? Tsuritobi blinked before chuckling, no matter what happened Naruto always hated hospitals and wanted to get out of them as soon as possible. Of course your wounds are all healed so you are free to leave. Naruto grinned as he stood up, getting the clothes laid out for him as he left. Tsuritobi watched a boy leave and closed his eyes, I am so sorry I could not protect you more Naruto. Chapter 2. Start of a new life. Kid, come on kid, it's time to wake up. Naruto groaned as he heard the voice in his mind, it sounded familiar, and he really liked how it seemed to soothe him. But right now, he just wanted to sleep. Five more minutes, Naruto grumbled as he buried his head under his pillow, as if that would somehow keep him from hearing the voice. But in his mind Akane was unsure whether she should snicker at how stupid that particular idea was, squeal kawaii because of how cute it was, or get angry and start yelling because Naruto was not listening to her. She settled for an odd mixture of the first two. Come on, get up Naruto-kun, she called out after thinking about how adorable the child was and snickering at the thought that a pillow would block out her voice. It was a stupid idea since she was inside of him, after all. Naruto-kun, you need to get up, we have a long day ahead of us, when her calls didn't work, a cane began to get angry and shouted, get your ass out of bed Naruto. P-H-H. Naruto shouted as he jumped right out of bed, or tried to before he got tangled in his sheets, fell off the bed, and landed on his head when he hit the floor. Ow. He muttered, sitting up and rubbing the back of his head. He looked around and blinked before squinting his eyes. I wonder who woke me up? That would be me, a cane snickered in his mind. So it wasn't a dream? Naruto thought as he rubbed his eyes tiredly. No, it wasn't. Oh. The cane snickered again. Come on kid, get up and get some breakfast, your training begins today. Training. Naruto shouted as he jumped up in excitement. 
unfortunately, he was still tangled up in his bed sheets and fell down again, where he began to squirm along the floor in an attempt to get himself free. Ahahaha. Loud laughing came from his mind as a cane watched a boy struggle with his best sheets. It's not funny, Naruto pouted as he finally got free. It is so funny. Now get up and get some breakfast, you'll need your energy for your training. At the words training all thoughts on his previous mishap were forgotten as Naruto raced out of his room and into the living room kitchen of his apartment. He had gotten this apartment from Ajisen a year ago, after he had been kicked out, and the old Hokage had found him huddled up in an alley using paper as a blanket. The apartment was, in a word, awful, the paint was chipped and faded, all of the furniture was used and beaten, the floors creaked, the windows were cracked, and on the outside walls near the entrance were the words die demon. Painted in red. It had not always been like this, in fact the place had been fairly new when the Hokage had given it to him. But after several break-ins and raids the furniture and walls had been destroyed, and Naruto had been forced to find items like microwaves in the dumpsters. Not that this bothered the little blonde anymore, it might have before, in fact just yesterday before the mob had come for him, he had been crying about how people kept ruining everything he got. But today was a new day, he had someone who promised to help him, and that made everything seem insignificant in comparison. Naruto walked up to the pantry and grabbed a stool before opening it so that he could get to the top shelves where he hid his foodstuffs behind his rotten goods. He had learned a long time ago that people would raid his food if they found anything, so he had grabbed a lot of the rotten smelling food, some of the only things that he could afford, thanks to all the extra money he had to pay, taxes the grocers called them, and hid some of the other things he could buy that was actually edible behind it. He pushed the cabbages and other nearly a year out of date food to the side to reveal his stock of food. Said stock consisted of ramen, ramen and more ramen, all of it in a variety of different flavors, though miso seemed to be the most prominent available. As Naruto began to cook his ramen, filling the cup with water and turning on the microwave for the three minutes it took to cook, a cane decided to voice her question. Is that all you have? She asked in shock. She had only gone through some of his life since she had woken up yesterday during his beating, not wanting to violate his privacy any more than she had to in order to gain a better understanding of his life. As such she had not gone into things like if he was getting enough nutrients and it hadn't seemed as important when he was getting beaten. Yeah, why ask Naruto as he began to happily slurp up his ramen. Oh, no reason, just curious, a cane replied lightly, while trying to get a better grasp of the situation. Naruto-kun, why do you have rotten, out-of-date food in your pantry? Because it was the only thing the stores would sell me, Naruto shrugged as he finished his ramen, he looked over at the pantry again, tempted to get another, but stopped himself. He didn't have much money and couldn't afford to buy more. Something about taxation for letting demons like me live here. Those arrogant filthy monkeys. A cane raged mentally, cutting off her thoughts from her host as she began to pace within her cell. How could they do this to an innocent child? And they call me a demon. A part of her felt guilty since some of this was her fault, but she was determined to make amends for her mistake. More importantly, Naruto did not seem to hold a grudge on her, and that meant more to her than the young blonde would likely ever know. She shook her head as she came up with a plan of action, she would start training him first, then she would work on getting him something healthy to eat. If you're finished eating, I want you to head out into the forest, she told her container. I asked Naruto, not that he had a problem with the request, he loved the forest and the solitude it offered. He was just curious. So I can begin your training away from prying eyes. If people discover you getting stronger they may try to kill you. She didn't want to sound so harsh, but she needed to get her point across, and there was no sense in beating around the bush. Naruto gulped, KK, I'll head out right now. Soon, the young blonde found himself surrounded by trees as he walked through the forest around Konoha. He was not quite sure how far he had gone, but he knew it was likely farther than he had ever gone before. Within his mind Kaiubi was, with his permission, extending her senses out of the seal so she could ensure that no one was around. Okay, I think this is far enough from Naruto-kun, she said. Now sit down and we'll begin your training. Naruto did as told, finding a nice tree to sit against, so what am I going to be doing a king chan you will be learning the first and one of the most important steps for any ninja, she told him, accessing your chakra. But he asked, scratching his head in confusion. Not Katra, Naruto-kun, chakra, Kaiubi corrected. Chakra a acute a tilde macrani chakra is essential to even the most basic mystical arts a ninja will utilize in battle. It is a mixture of the physical energy, s diaresis i acute umlaut u, shintai enri plus, that is present in every cell of the body, and the spiritual energy three-fourths diaresis i acute umlaut u saishin enri plus, which is gained from exercise and experience. Once mixed, it can be channeled through the chakra circulatory system, think of it as a system much like your bloodstream, to any of the 361 chakra points called in the body. 
through various methods, the most common of which for you humans are hand seals. The chakra can then be manipulated to create an effect that would not be possible otherwise, such as walking on water, exhaling fire or creating illusions. By mixing different ratios of the two energies, new types of chakra can be formed. The most common product is elemental chakra, which is used to perform elemental chakra. Most ninja have a natural affinity to one type of chakra, but they have the capacity to create elemental chakra, apart from their own affinity. There are six basic types, each stronger and weaker to another, five have been shown so far, but their relations, weaknesses and strengths to each other are all explored, the six dealing with yin and yang, and the balance of mental and physical energies. In addition to these six elements, certain can mix elemental chakra to form new elements, for example, it would be possible to mix water and wind into ice. While many ninja can use more than one type of chakra, very few are able to use them simultaneously. Naruto listened to Akane's explanation of what chakra was, when she had finished he scratched the back of his head, and were the red-haired woman out of the seal, she would have seen the look of dumb confusion on his face. Right, so what uh, what is chakra again? He asked in a sheepish voice. Akane's face faltered at his words, pushing herself into a sitting position she pinched the bridge of her nose. You don't know what chakra is, do you? No, Naruto said, his mental voice sounding like a sad whisper. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Let you down. Akane realized what was going on, that he was afraid she wouldn't continue training him, and quickly made out to rectify his thoughts. Oh no, don't worry about it, I forgot that you're a little young to understand something that complex. You likely haven't even started the academy yet, huh? Uh uh, Naruto shook his head, Ajison says that I can't start until I'm six, that's next year. Right, so it's not your fault you can't understand that, Akane frowned, how could she best explain chakra to a five-year-old? Naruto-kun, what's your favorite food? She asked as an idea came to her. Raymond. His excited shout echoed throughout his mind. Right, I should have figured that Akane snickered a bit with how it seemed to be the only thing he ate. It wasn't surprising. Okay, think of it like this, chakra is an energy that people use to do superhuman feats. Now I want you to think of chakra as Raymond. MMM. Raymond. Focus kit, a cane admonished lightly, getting an embarrassed chuckle out of the blonde. Now your Raymond is made of two things, the noodles and the broth. What about the toppings? Asked Naruto, interrupting a cane's lecture. The topics come later she said, trying to keep his attention focused on her lecture. Now don't interrupt me anymore. The noodles would be your physical energy, while the broth is your spiritual energy. By combining the two you get Raymond in the same way that combining your physical and spiritual energy gets chakra. And by doing that I can do all those cool things I saw ninjas doing. Asked Naruto excitedly. Like jumping really high and walking along walls. It can do much more than that Naruto-kun, Akane giggled, but we'll get more into what you can do later. First, I need to teach you how to access your chakra. Oh. Naruto looked kind of disappointed for a moment, though it was gone a second later. How do I access it? Chakra. First, I want you to sit in a cross-legged position with your back straight and pressed against a tree. Naruto blinked a few times at what he felt was an odd request, but did as told. Now, close your eyes and bring your hands together, her voice began to gain a hypnotic quality that made it impossible for Naruto to do anything but what she told him. Make a cross using the middle and ring fingers. Now take deep, slow breaths and imagine a small ball of warmth in the pit of your stomach. When you feel it, let me know and describe what it is that you are feeling. Naruto did as told as he sat there, the ring and middle fingers of his hands forming a cross in front of him and his eyes closed. He tried to imagine the ball of warmth in his stomach, tried to feel it. However, after several hours with no success, Naruto gave a disappointed sigh, I can't feel anything. The cane winced at the despondent tone in his voice and sought to reassure him. Don't worry about Naruto-kun, it takes time for people to learn how to access their chakra. Just be patient and you'll get there. Thanks Akane chan Naruto said, even though she couldn't see his face, Akane could almost feel the smile in his words, and it warmed her heart in ways she had not felt before. You're welcome. Naruto's stomach erupted into a growl, interrupting the tender moment between student and teacher. He, I guess, I'm hungry, the blonde rubbed his stomach absently. The cane rolled her eyes but smiled as well. I can hear a stream nearby. I want you to go there and catch some fish. Why do you want me to do that? Asked Naruto, confused by the request. So you can eat them of course, a cane replied absently, unable to see the horrified look on Naruto's face. B but why would I want to eat a fish? They're alive. Well, yes, they are, Akane blinked in confusion at the horrified tone in his voice. But they won't be once you kill them. Kill them. Naruto shouted, his voice thundering across the mindscape, causing Akane to wince. Why would you want me to kill some helpless animal? So you can eat them of course. But I don't want to eat some helpless animal. That's really mean. I love animals. Akane actually blinked several minutes before snorting, and people thought this child was a demon. 
Burrito Khan, she said as gently as possible, it wouldn't do for her to get upset at his odd morals, especially since he likely didn't understand. This is the way the world works, it is natural. All animals are eaten by other animals. Insects eat grass and other plants, they in turn are eaten by lizards, fish and bats, while they in turn are eaten by larger animals. You are just doing as nature intended. So it's not bad. Questioned the blonde. No, it's not bad at all, in fact, without other animals eating the smaller ones the balance of the world would become upset, it was an exaggeration, Naruto's eating of animals would have no bearing on the natural community. But it was better to tell a small eye so he would eat something healthy, rather than going to get some Raymond back home. Well. I guess it's. Natural then it's okay. Yes, perfectly okay. Arg. You stupid fish. Naruto shouted as he tried to catch one of the many fish that were swimming in the stream he was standing in. So far he was having no luck, as the fish would seem to know what he was doing and just swim away from his hands. Come here you little. He growled, trying to grab another fish. Splash. Not only to slip on a particularly slippery rock and fall into the water, scaring off the fish he was near. Arg. Why can't I catch any? Shouted Naruto in frustration. The cane watched a boy fail to catch anything with a mixture of amusement and exasperation. Naruto-kun, she said as said blonde, stood back up, grumbling a little about his clothes being soaked. Close your eyes. Why? Just do it, she said. Okay, Naruto closed his eyes. I want you to stay absolutely still, she once again modulated her voice into that hypnotic quality it had been when she had been helping him try to gain access to his chakra. I want you to feel the current of the water, which way it's going and how fast it's moving. Then, try to feel the fish as they swim against the current. Naruto did as told, he was perfectly still as he felt the water moving around him in the direction he was facing. At least most of it was. He could feel small areas where it felt like the water was moving in the opposite direction. Those are the fish, a cane informed the boy as to what those small movements were. I want you to concentrate on the one that is swimming just to your left, feel its movements. On the count of three, I want to swipe your hand across the water, just in front of the direction that the fish is moving. Ready, one, two, three. Splash. Naruto opened his eyes as he felt his hand hit something and was just in time to see the fish he had been focusing on hit his hand and fly out of the water and onto the land over by his left. Yada. I did it. Shouted Naruto excitedly. Very good Naruto-kun, Akane congratulated, now do that three more times and I think we'll be good. Three more splashes later and Naruto was carrying four fish, using his shirt as a makeshift net. He walked some distance away and on Akane's orders, gathered a dozen medium-sized rocks and arranged them in a circle, then grabbed dry leaves and twigs and placed them in the center. Okay, now place your finger in the center of the leaves. Naruto did as told and felt an odd warm sensation move up through his arm, then his finger. Suddenly the leaves and twigs ignited in a spark. Naruto jumped back in shock, what the hell. Relax, Kit, Kaiubi snickered a little bit. I just started the fire for you. You did that. Asked Naruto, his voice holding an odd tone to it. Yes, Kaiubi sounded decidedly smug, though Naruto didn't even notice. So cool, will I learn to do that? Maybe, it depends on your elemental affinity. Elephant what? Elemental affinity, it's something you'll learn of when you're older. Oh, Naruto was tempted to ask Akane to teach him about elements now, but didn't want to upset the first person who really talked to him and thus kept his mouth shut. Now, grab those larger sticks I made you get and stick the fish on them so they can cook, Akane said. After you finish eating we'll work on accessing your chakra again. Okay, Naruto replied, he was feeling a little queasy about cooking something that was alive at one point but didn't want to argue and thus did as he was told. By the end of the day a tired Naruto dragged himself back into his room. He had spent several more hours trying to access his chakra with no success. That had him feeling down, but Akane assured him it would likely be a month or so before he would be able to gain access to this power that would allow him to do awesome things. It made him feel a little better to know that she wasn't disappointed in him. He crawled onto the bed and into his covers, burying his head inside of his pillow. Who knew sitting around doing nothing more than searching for your inner energy could be so exhausting? Before he could go to sleep a thought crossed his mind, hey, Akane-chan. Yes. How do I get back to the place you're at? Akane's face gained a confused expression, why do you want to know? I was hoping to visit you, he said, a small, embarrassed blush on his face. Oh. Even though he seemed to forgive her for what she had done to him, Akane had not expected him to actually want to spend some time with her again. It was oddly comforting to know she was wrong. Well, to go back into your mind, all you have to do is close your eyes and think about coming back here. Okay, thanks. With that, Naruto went to sleep. He opened his eyes again, it wasn't to the side of his cracked ceiling, but to the glowing pipes of the sewer that Akane had called his mind. He stood up and wondered how long he had been lying there, it must have been a long time since he didn't feel in the least bit tired. 
Shrugging the thoughts that he considered irrelevant off, he walked forward and made his way to the cage that housed a cane. A cane chan. He called out as he stepped in through the bars. He looked around before hearing the sound of footsteps. Naruto-kun asked a cane curiously as she stepped forward and into the odd light that seemed to surround Naruto so he could see her. What are you doing here? She tilted her head, didn't you go to sleep already? I already did sleep, said Naruto, wondering what she was talking about. He didn't remember coming back here, but since he wasn't tired he had to have already slept. Right. The cane looked at him oddly for a second, before realizing he likely didn't even know that he had just come into the seal immediately after asking his question. He probably didn't even realize that they were inside of his mind and most likely thought that he had teleported to some distant land. The thought was amusing enough to make her smile. So what are you doing here? She asked, sitting down and splaying her tails. Naruto hesitated for a moment before sitting down next to her, I was just wondering if you would tell me about yourself. About myself. You want to know about me? Asked Akane, surprised once again by this strange boy. Yeah, I mean, all I've ever heard about you was how you were this evil demon who attacked our village. Akane's shoulders slumped in depression at that, but Naruto's next words made her shocked. But that can't be right, I mean, you've been so nice to me, and you're smart and really pretty, he looked at her with those ridiculously large and innocent eyes. All the red-haired vixen could do was bite her lower lip to keep herself from glumping the boy. There's just no way you can be evil like everyone else says, he concluded. Damn, how this boy could make her, the most powerful biju on earth, tear up like this was beyond her. She tried to wipe them away before her young companion could notice, but was apparently not quick enough as Naruto saw the tears and his eyes widened and took them in the wrong context. Oh my god. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to make you cry. I'm really really. His words were muffled when Akane covered his mouth with one of her hands, she smiled at him as she wiped her eyes with the other hand. These are tears of happiness for Naruto-kun, they're good tears, she reassures him. So I didn't make you sad. Asked Naruto, he really didn't want what might possibly be his first friend to get sad. No, you didn't make me sad, she said, scooping him into her arms she set him down in her lap and pressed the back of his head into her bosom. Had he been anything other than an innocent child, the position would have likely sent him rocketing with geysers of blood shooting out of his nose. As it was, all Naruto could think of was how comfortable this position was as he snuggled himself deeper in between her breasts. The cane set her head on top of his and asked, what do you want to know? Everything, Naruto told her, I want to know everything about you. The cane giggled at the childish enthusiasm in his voice. Well, he was a child so it was to be expected. Very well, she said, I can't tell you everything there is to know about me, that would take several years, possibly decades. Naruto pouted and Akane giggled again, but I think I can tell you a story about some of my travels. What kind of story? Asked the excited blonde. Well, Akane smiled, why don't I tell you about a friend I had many, thousands of years ago named Inu no Taisho and his two sons. Chapter 3. Beginnings of Power. Naruto Kun came the sing-song voice of Akane. I'm up, I'm up, Naruto grumbled out loud, his sleep-addled brain making him forget to speak within his mind. He sat up slowly and yawned, stretching his arms above his head while he smacked his lips to dry and moisten them. For a moment he just sat there, not doing anything until he got a small mental prod from a cane telling him to get up. Getting out of bed he began his daily routine. It had been a month since he had met a cane and started working on accessing his chakra, and since then the young Uzumaki had fallen into a routine of wake up, eat Raymond, meditate in the forest, eat whatever he managed to catch, meditate again, eat some more, then go home and enter his mindscape, where he would talk to a cane until he fell asleep in her arms. All the training was good, that last part of the day was the best, as far as he was concerned. So what are we doing today? Asked Naruto as he began slurping up his morning Raymond. He had just managed to gain access to his chakra yesterday, which had been really exciting for the blind and had him jumping up and down for the rest of the afternoon. It had taken a cane nearly three hours to get him to calm down, not that she was much better, as she had been just as excited for the blind. The day will begin the next stage of your training, a cane told him, go to our usual spot in the forest and we'll get started. Asu. When Naruto finished with his meal he tossed the empty cup and used chopsticks into an overflowing trash can. Akane made a mental note to make him clean his house when he got home as the blonde stepped out and closed the door behind him. He took off without locking it, there was no need since he had nothing of value anymore and it wasn't like it ever stopped people from breaking in anyways. He ran down the street, completely ignoring the scowls and angered glares that were sent his way. Now that he had someone who cared about him, the glares sent to him by the villagers were less than meaningless. Soon enough Naruto was running through the trees and stopped in the clearing he had been using, okay, so what now? Now we'll begin the second step, molding and controlling your chakra, Akane commented as Naruto sat down in his usual spot as he listened to the demoness talk. 
molding chakra involves the extraction of energies from both the body cells and the mind's consciousness, then mixing them together within the individual. The amount of each energy will differ based on the type of technique the ninja wishes to execute. In other words, a ninja could create too much or too little chakra for a given, resulting in the chakra being used inefficiently. In addition, even if a ninja is able to mold the correct amount of chakra, if they cannot manipulate the chakra properly, the desired will not be as effective or will not execute at all. Wasting energy will also create weaknesses like early exhaustion, which would hinder the ninja's capacity to fight long-term battles. General training methods for improving one's molding and manipulation of chakra are the leaf concentration, tree climbing, and water walking exercises, at least for humans. Yeah. Naruto scratched the back of his head sheepishly, um, right. A keen side needs to be simpler. Okay. She clapped her hands together, why don't we just start with a chakra control exercise, and I'll go into more detail behind the mechanics and theories of chakra later. Naruto-kun, I want you to grab a leaf and stick it onto your forehead, channel your chakra to your head to hold the leaf there. Naruto didn't even question her as he picked up a leaf from the ground and put it to his head, he began channeling chakra to that spot, then removed his hand. He was rather surprised when instead of sticking to him, the leaf shot off his head, completely torn to shreds. What happened? He asked. You use too much chakra, a cane told him, if you use too much chakra the leaf will shoot off, too little and it won't stick. Of course he has so much it actually ripped the leaf to pieces, this is going to take some effort. She didn't mention that out loud as she continued you need to find the correct amount of chakra to use in order to make the leaf stick. Okay, I think I understand, Naruto said, he grabbed another leaf and got to work. Sticking a leaf to his forehead proved to be a lot harder than it sounded, usually he found it flying off his forehead with enough force that the leaf would actually get torn. It took the entirety of his three-hour period before lunch to make any progress at all, progress being that now his leaf only flew about a foot away, rather than getting torn to shreds from the force of getting shot off his head. It was a little disappointing that he couldn't complete the exercise by the time he finished, but a cane didn't let him wallow in what he deemed as a failure. That was an excellent job Naruto-kun, she said to him. This exercise is actually harder for you than most because you have so much more chakra than most people. The fact that you're starting at such a young age is also a factor to consider. So because I have more chakra, it's harder to control. Asked Naruto as he ate the fish he had caught along with some of the wild berries that a cane had told him were edible. Yes, the more chakra you have the more difficult it is to control it, she paused. I believe that's why humans start teaching children to mold chakra at a young age. Demons do the same thing with their young, especially considering it is harder to control than chakra. Why is that? Because Yaki is many times more potent and powerful than its human equivalent, even the weakest demon is about three times more powerful than chakra. What about you? How much stronger is your? The cane smiled as she answered, oh, about a hundred times more powerful. Naruto's eyes widened, you must be really strong. Of course, a cane said, and Naruto got a mental image of the red head flipping her hair over her shoulder and smirking. I am the most powerful biju in existence after all. Now, finish eating so we can get started on your training. Naruto nodded, even though Akane could not see it and scarfed down the rest of his food before standing up. So am I going to be doing the leaf sticking exercise again? He asked. No, you're going to be training your body now, Akane said. Another key to gaining strength is your physical prowess, so I want you to do 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups, 100 pull-ups, 200 crunches, and then you're going to run around the forest at full speed until I say stop. Naruto's eyes widened to epic proportions as she told him what he would be doing, why I'd. Why I'd. The scream echoed all throughout Kanoha, causing many people to pause and shiver at the fear and the sheer terror the voice held. Saratobi had stopped reading his beloved Icha Icha Paradise and looked out of the window as the shout came, he shivered. Why do I have this feeling that someone close to me is being tortured? Don't complain about Naruto-kun, Akane admonished as Naruto began blubbering about the exercises being too much. If you want to be strong, you need to do as I say. But but. Fine, the young blonde child's shoulders seemed to drop. Now, don't be all down, this really will help you, the red-haired vixen told her charge, I just want you to reach your goals. I know. Thank you Akane-chan. You're welcome. Naruto's new training regimen soon began, every morning after breakfast he would begin practicing chakra control exercises. It took nearly a month for him to accomplish the leaf concentration exercise, or sticking a leaf to your forehead. When that was accomplished a cane had him move on. The next step was tree climbing, this step was a lot harder than leaf concentration. It required him to channel chakra to the bottom of his feet and walk up the surface of a tree, too much and he was blasted off, and too little he would fall off. It didn't sound that hard in theory, but in practice it was much more difficult. 
the thing about tree climbing was that it wasn't just about channeling the correct amount of chakra to his feet, it required more than just that, every time he wanted to take a step, he actually had to cut the chakra to that foot, otherwise, it would simply stay stuck to the tree when he tried to pull it off. This meant Naruto had to not only find the correct amount of chakra to channel, but had to time when he would dispel the chakra on his feet to move up or down the tree. The cane had him accomplish this by laying on his back and pressing his feet against the side of a tree, he would then channel his chakra and attempted to walk up slowly. She would do what she could to coach him, giving helpful tips like telling him to clear your mind and focus only on the feel of his chakra and climbing up the tree, as well as giving him encouragement. Like his other exercise, this one required a month for him to accomplish. Now he was attempting to walk on water. If he had thought tree climbing was hard, then this was just ridiculous. To do this exercise, the user had to be emitting a constant stream of chakra from the bottom of their feet and using the repellent force, walk across the water's surface. This technique was far more difficult to master than the tree climbing exercise because the amount of chakra that needed to be emitted changed constantly, meaning he had to monitor the amount he was expelling all the time. Splash. WSHH. Keep trying it. A cane said, snickering at her container's plight as he fell in for the sixth time this day. Brr. I hate this. So much, Naruto said as he climbed out of the water, shivering as a wind blew across his cold, wet skin. He stood there for nearly a minute, shivering before he decided to try again. Okay, let's do this again. The young blonde began channeling chakra to the bottom of his feet, placing his left foot on the water he leaned on, his foot dipped a little, but he quickly expelled more chakra to compensate. When he felt ready he placed his other foot on the water, he shook a little as his feet kept dipping in and out of the moving, liquid surface, and he did his best to keep himself from falling. When he was ready, he began to move one step, two steps, three, four. Hey. Naruto smiled, I think I'm getting the hang of this. Splash. Wah. Mahahaha. <laughs> A cane began laughing hysterically as the blonde once again fell in. Were anyone else inside the seal they would have seen the crimson-haired demoness rolling around on the floor laughing as she held her gut and with tears of mirth streaming down her face. Who knew watching Naruto train would be so entertaining? It's not funny. Naruto scowled as he climbed back out. It is too funny. A cane shot back even as she tried to regain her breath from all the laughing she did, I only wish I could see the look on your face, ha 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 ha. Why is this so hard? Asked Naruto in a complaining whine. Well, you can't expect it to be easy, a cane quipped as she got her laughing under control. This is the hardest exercise humans have, at least I think it is, I'm pretty sure they don't go into any of the other exercises. So you can't expect to just get it right away. But it's been two months. Naruto whined, the others only took me one month. Which just goes to show you that this exercise is much harder than the other ones, a cane said. Now, let me dry you off, then you can go and get some food. Naruto felt his entire body relax as Kaiubi's Yaki entered his system, his skin began to heat and steam, drying off as the natural heat from the vixens warmed it. I love the feel of your Yaki, Naruto said with a content sigh, his eyes were closed, so he could not see the light red haze of the canes, as it flooded through his coils and made its way out of the pores of his skin. It feels almost as good as when you hold me. W what? Asked a cane, blushing at his innocent words. He had been making innocent statements like that ever since they met, for some reason they never failed to make her entire face feel like it was on fire. She was confused as to why those words from Naruto always seemed to affect her so, no matter how hard she thought about it, she had been unable to find the answer. Maybe her biological clock was finally ticking. She just hoped Nibi never found out, or that damn Hellcat would never let her hear the end of it. She shook her head, now wasn't the time to figure out what it was about this boy that affected her so. Go and catch something to eat Naruto-kun, afterwards begin your physical training. Yes, a king chan Saratobi slowly blew smoke from his pipe as he looked out at the village, the paperwork was done, his secretary had none left to bring him, he had no ninja bothering, and the council had been quiet since Naruto's birthday. Days like this, where he could just relax were rare, and he was taking full advantage of that fact by smoking his favorite pipe. Ah. This is life. Just as he had those thoughts the door slammed open and in walked Naruto Uzumaki, yelling out in a loud voice, Oh I. Ajisen. Looks like he spoke too soon. Ah, Naruto-kun, Saratobi smiled, even if the boy had ruined the peace and quiet he had been enjoying, the young blonde always brought a smile to his face. What can I do for you? You do know that it's not time for me to take you out to Raymond for another two days, right? Ever since Saratobi had found the little blonde on his own, hiding from the weather under several sheets of newspaper in an alley he had taken it upon himself to ensure Naruto got at least one good meal when he could. Saratobi often wished he could do more for the young bundle of energy, but unfortunately his job as Hokage often kept him too busy to do more than spend once a month with Naruto. Shaking the thoughts off he focused his attention on said blonde. 
That's okay, Naruto said as he sat down on the chair in front of the Hokage's desk, swinging his legs back and forth in a childish manner as they couldn't reach the floor. I'm actually here to ask for something else. Oh? Sarutobi raised an eyebrow in mild curiosity. And what do you need from me? Well, Naruto gave a sheepish grin and scratched the back of his head. I was wondering if I could use your library to look up cool ninja techniques. Ninja techniques? Saratobi looked both startled and amused, Naruto-kun, you don't start the academy for another eight months, you learn all the ninja techniques then. I know, I know, but I wanted to get a head start, said Naruto, that way I can show everyone how awesome I am. Saratobi chuckled a bit, the boy was enthusiastic at least. I apologize for Naruto-kun, but the Hokage library is restricted to only myself and those ninjas who have my permission to enter. You are not a ninja so there isn't much I could do. I can't even take a peek. Asked Naruto, with wide, innocent eyes that threatened to break Saratobi's will. I'm sorry, Saratobi said, doing his best not to look into the blonde's eyes. But it wouldn't be fair to the other students. However, if you really wish to get a head start, you could always check out some of the books they have at the library. I believe they have a few books on ninja basics there. They won't let me enter, Naruto whispered in a hurt tone, it sounded like someone had kicked his puppy and was enough to make Saratobi flinch. When the blonde looked again they were all watery and had tears leaking out of the corner of his eyes, the lady there kicked me out before I could even enter. She said demons don't deserve to learn. Saratobi felt his will crumble, even as his anger at hearing what someone told the young blonde skyrocketed. How could anyone say something like that to a child? Didn't they know how impressionable young children were at Naruto's age? If you tell a child he's a demon more times than he may believe, and if that happened Naruto would become the very thing this village despised and feared. It would be a self-fulfilling prophecy. I suppose it would be alright if I let you take a look, Saratobi admitted slowly. At least until I had a talk with the librarian, the way he talked made it clear that he would be doing anything but talking. He stood up from his chair and walked around the table, holding his hand out to Naruto who took it immediately. They walked out of the office and Saratobi stopped to look at his secretary. I want you to contact Ibiki, tell him he's to be at my office in one hour. Yes, Hokage-sama, the young brunette said, Saratobi had hired her for the simple fact that she was one of the few people who did not seem to hate Naruto, or at the very least, she hid it well and didn't let it interfere with her work. Come along Naruto-kun, Saratobi said as they began walking down the hall. Hit, that was some very nice acting back there, Akane said, impressed with how well he managed to create tears on cue. You even had me fooled for a second. Thanks to Akane-chan, Naruto said cheerfully, I aim to please. He and Saratobi reached the end of the hall and went down several flights of stairs, through another hall, and stopped in front of a set of large double doors. Saratobi placed his hand on a seal on the left door and began channeling his chakra into the seal. It glowed a light blue for a moment before there was a soft click and the door opened. Saruto led Naruto through the door and into the room. The Hokage library was not that large, not compared to the public library. That was because the Hokage library contained strictly ninja techniques, whereas the public one had a section for just about everything. Still it was very large, with nearly two dozen rows of shelves filled with books and scrolls, two floors, several chairs and a table for reading. Now Naruto, Saratobi started in a serious voice. There are a few stipulations to me letting you stay here, first, you can only read from the basic shinobi section, section 1. Weasel will be making sure that you do not read any of the scrolls and books in the other sections. Who's Weasel? Asked Naruto, tilting his head in curiosity. That would be me, said a voice behind Naruto. Ah. Naruto whirled around and found himself staring into someone wearing the traditional Anba uniform, which consisted of black and grey armor, metal arm guards and gloves, ninja sandals with spikes for traveling into mountainous regions, three ninja pouches on his back waist, and a signature spiral tattoo on his left shoulder. He had a porcelain mask in the likeness of a weasel and a standard black ninja to strap to his back. I apologize, I didn't mean to startle you, the masked ninja, who could only be Weasel stated. It was hard to tell with the mask muffling the voice and said voice being slightly monotone, but he sounded amused. Naruto huffed as he crossed his arms and gave the Weasel mask Anbu a petulant glare, just don't do it again. Saratobi chuckled and ruffled Naruto hair, now then, Weasel will make sure that you only read what I allow you. Also, be careful not to damage any of the scrolls you handle, most of these are originals and therefore delicate. I am putting a lot of trust in you Naruto-kun, don't let me down. Don't worry about Ajisen. Naruto grinned as he gave a thumbs up, unknowingly giving the nice guy pose. Yosh. My youth detector has gone off. Shouted a man with a bowl cut, large eyebrows and the most hideous green leotard like spandex anyone had ever laid eyes on. Everyone around this man suddenly jumped in startlement as he enthusiastically pumped a fist in the air. Whoever this youthful person is has inspired me. I must fan my own flames of youth by challenging my hip, eternal rival Kakashi. 
But that said the man took off, leaving nothing but a cloud of dust in his likeness behind. The people who watched him shivered in fear as a shout of Uuuv could be heard in the distance. Over it a memorial that was made to honor those of Konoha who died in battle and won the many training grounds of Konoha, Kakashi Haddock shivered. Why do I have this intense urge to kill spiky-headed blondes? Saratobi grimaced as he saw the pose Naruto had taken, he hoped that Mido Guy never got his hands on the impressionable child. The horrors that would come of such a meeting were too terrible to imagine. Then I will leave you to it, meanwhile, I am going to go speak with a subordinate of mind and have him talk to the librarian you were telling me about. He did his best to shake thoughts of a Naruto wearing green spandex with a bowl-shaped haircut and large eyebrows out of his mind. Okay. I'll just get started on learning awesome ninja powers, the next time you see me I'll be ready to take that hat. Naruto shouted enthusiastically. Tsuritobi chuckled, I'm sure you will. He said, not too concerned, after all, how much would a child like Naruto really learn in the few days it would take for him to straighten out the library. He nodded to Weasel who nodded back and left. The cane sighed, not quite what I had hoped, but at least he gave you access to the library. We should be able to learn more about ninja techniques than we can at the academy, even with the restrictions. Naruto-kun, go grab a book on shinobi basics. Asu. Naruto ran to the section Saratobi had pointed out and immediately began scanning the titles of the books and scrolls in that particular area. It was only then that Naruto realized they had another problem. Uh. Akane-chan. Yes. I uh. I can't. Akane blinked curiously as Naruto's voice was too soft for her to hear, like a whisper across the mindscape. What is Naruto-kun? She asked. I can't read. He mumbled, feeling ashamed of himself. What? I can't read. But didn't she stop herself from speaking any further and nearly kicked herself, of course, that hateful bitch of a matron that had kicked him out of the orphanage hadn't taught him how to read. Why she even thought that he might be able to despite this was beyond her, she knew that everyone hated Naruto enough that they would do all in their power to block him from learning. Knowledge is power after all, and they wouldn't want the demon to gain any of that. Ayubi felt a growl escape her throat as the desire to tear out the matron's throat nearly overwhelmed her. But she forced the emotion into the back of her mind, it wouldn't help right now. She needed to help Naruto. Naruto-kun, she said softly, interrupting the boy who had begun to softly cry at his lack of ability. I want you to allow me to take control of your body, I can memorize all of the scrolls here and manifest them in the mindscape, then I'll teach you to read. Okay. Okay, Naruto sniffed as he wiped his eyes, thank you. Don't mention it Akane smiled before she exerted her will through the seal, without Naruto's express permission what she was about to do would be impossible. The seal that held her was stronger than any she had ever seen, held together by the powers of the Shinigami, the avatar of death himself. Even with Naruto's permission this would be a tad difficult without alerting the Anbu to any change in Naruto's chakra. Slowly, she seeped her chakra through the seal and established hold of Naruto's own chakra, exerting more will over it to bring it under her control. Naruto, whose head had been bowed down, lifted it up to reveal red eyes with black slits. Grabbing the first scroll she saw Kane began to read over it, thanks to what she wished she could do things like read a lot faster than any human could, and she had a dedic memory, so she never forgot what she read. Going through the first book as quickly as possible she soon went on to the next. All the books she read only had the standard information in them, what a ninja was, basic skills in stealth, tracking, tie, nin, and chakra enhanced seals, along with many other subjects that academy students were expected to know. There were a few that she got, but they were fairly weak and wouldn't be as useful as what she had hoped to find. Other books held content she already knew herself, like Chakra, she had more knowledge on that subject than any scroll a human could write ever would. But others she didn't know and was quick to absorb the contents of those scrolls for later use. She didn't get as much as she had hoped out of the scrolls, but it was better than nothing. Over by the door Weasel watched as Naruto ran through the books faster than an Akamichi ate food with an amused chuckle. The kid was definitely interesting, though what he hoped to accomplish by looking through a bunch of books without reading their contents was beyond him. Later that night Naruto was back in Akane's laps within the seal. She had secured her hands firmly around his waist as she pulled him to her and set her hands on his lap. Okay Naruto-kun, Akane held out her hands and materialized a book within them. This one was not one of the ninja books, but a basic book with a human alphabet and some words and sentences on it. It was a book that held a compendium of knowledge that Akane had on the human language and would be what she used to teach the young blonde how to read with. We're going to start by learning the alphabet, now Japanese is an agglutinative language and a more timed language. It has a relatively small sound inventory and a lexically significant pitch accent system. It is distinguished by a complex system of honorifics with verb forms and particular vocabulary to indicate the relative status of the speaker, the listener, and persons mentioned in conversation. Japanese vowels are pure. Noticing the look on Naruto's face that let Akane know he had no clue what she was talking about, she decided to go a different route. 
Why don't we start with the alphabet? The days wore on and became weeks, and the weeks became months as Akain continued helping Naruto. Teaching him to read was not all that hard, he could already talk, so it was easier than teaching someone who was younger than him. All in all it only took two weeks within the seal before the young blonde was capable of reading fluently. Afterwards Akane had Naruto add in learning one of the she had found in the Hokage library with his normal routine. Sometimes it would take only a day to learn one of them, and sometimes it would take a month, however, he learned all the ones that she had to offer. All except one. Arg. Shouted Naruto as he looked at his half-dead clone, he couldn't understand it, why would he learn from each other, yet this one technique was giving him problems. You stupid bunshin. Work, damn you. He tried to make the clone again, and again, and again, but no matter how many times he tried, he always ended up with the same half-dead clone. Why can't I do this? Because you have too much chakra, supplied a cane who had been watching an amusement for a while before deciding to take pity on him. What? Too much chakra? Asked Naruto in a confused voice. Yep, remember what I told you about the more chakra you have being harder to control. Yeah, you said that when someone had more chakra it was harder for them to use, and if they didn't have enough control they would. That's it. I was overloading them, even using the smallest amount of chakra I possess is still too much for this technique. Excellent Naruto-kun, Kaiubi said, pleased to find that her host was finally retaining and even using the knowledge she had given him. Yes, you're overloading this, the problem is, even if you have perfect chakra control, there is no way for you to learn this particular technique, since the lowest amount of chakra you can emit would still be too much for you to handle. So what do I do? Asked Naruto, still feeling a little frustrated I don't want to just give up. And you won't, Kaiubi assured him, we just need to find another technique that's similar to this one, something that allows the same thing, maybe something even better than this technique. After all, this clone is just an illusion, so you can't do much with it. That would be awesome, but how are we going to find one that could replace the Bunshin? Asked Naruto. Ajisen won't let me into the Hokage library now that I can go into the public one, and I already read all of the books you memorized. We'll think of something, Kaiubi said, confident that something would come up to help them with this problem. Something always came up sooner or later, all they would need was patience. Why don't you head home now, she suggested. I suppose that would be for the best. Naruto channeled chakra into his legs and was soon hopping through the trees, making it out of the forest in only half an hour, despite the 10 mile difference. Naruto-kun, Kaiubi said as Naruto was walking through the now abandoned streets of Konoha, someone is following you. Naruto stopped and stiffened, prepared to run if someone was attempting to kill again. So far he had been able to outrun and hide from any and all the mobs that might have formed recently, since no one would expect him to know tree climbing, and he was sure he could outrun whoever was following him. But he didn't really want to run, he had been doing that all his short life, and he was sick of it. Whoever is stalking me, I suggest you show yourself before I shove my foot off in your ass. Naruto shouted. The cane sweat dropped, did you seriously just say something that stupid, really Naruto-kun? The kid may be getting better, but whoever this person was was using chakra, she could feel it, and that meant he was a ninja. Naruto stood no chance against a ninja right now. Naruto ignored her in favor of the figure who had just jumped down from the building. He had dark gray eyes, black hair that hung near his cheeks to frame his face, and kept the rest of it in a ponytail at the back. His clothes consisted of a black shirt with a high collar that somewhat covered the lower half of his face, it had a large red fan on the back, and black pants with a weapons pouch strapped to his back. The fact that this man had jumped from the roof told Naruto that he was a shinobi, making the blonde tense. He knew that he wouldn't stand a chance against a ninja, the whiskered blonde was now cursing himself for being so stupid, he had only just started his training a little while ago, and he was only five going on six years old. He had no chance in hell of defeating a trained ninja. Maybe he should have listened to a cane after all. Who the hell are you and what do you want? Asked Naruto with false bravado, preparing to run in case things got bad. I mean you no harm Naruto-san, the man said, and the five-year-old blonde blinked as he recognized the voice. Weasel-san? Asked Naruto uncertainty. I'm pleased to see you remember me, Weasel said, giving the blonde a small smile, it looked decidedly odd considering his voice had somewhat of a monotone. However, my real name is Itachi, so you may call me that when I am not on duty. Itachi? Naruto tried to get the name out before shrugging. So, what exactly do you want with me, Itachi-san? Why are you following me? I was just heading home after a mission and saw you coming out of the forest, Itachi said. I guess I became curious and followed you, again I apologize for startling you. Naruto slowly relaxed, after his last beating, he could tell when people wanted to harm him, in large part due to a cane pumping his eyes and nose with her yaki. The results of which gave him increased vision that allowed him to see in the dark and made his nose nearly ten times stronger than an Inuzuka's. He could literally sense the pheromones on people, and a cane had taught him to recognize them and what they meant. 
for the most part, there were some things she hadn't taught him yet, like that honey smell he had caught wind of when he passed a house where odd-sounding shouts were coming from. When he asked her about that she had just said I'll tell you when you are older and left his curiosity unsatisfied. In that case, is there something I can help you with? Asked Naruto, feeling better now that he could tell this man meant him no harm. Itachi shook his head, I was just heading back to my own home when I saw you and decided to make sure you got home safely. Naruto blinked for a few seconds before shrugging, well okay, thanks I guess. You're welcome, Naruto-san, Itachi said. Naruto looked at him for a few more seconds before he began his walk back to his apartment. Itachi watched as the young child of the two people he had respected the most in this world walked off, a thoughtful frown on his face. That whole conversation had been both surprising and interesting. Surprising because Naruto had been able to actually sense him, despite the fact that Itachi was one of the few Anbu whose stealth skills were good enough that only the best Inuzuka trackers or a Hayuga could find him. He hadn't been hiding or anything, but the fact that the blonde had good enough senses to find him was still impressive. And it was interesting because of how the young blonde had reacted when he showed himself. The way Naruto had tensed his muscles, a sign that he had been coiled and ready to act if Itachi had shown any sign of attacking. It was both depressing and impressive, depressing that a young child and the hero of Konoha had gained self-preservation abilities like that. Yet impressive as well, since while it was disheartening it showed just how powerful the young boy could become if he could get proper training that is. He might already be getting training from somewhere, Itachi mused, he was consciously channeling chakra into his legs. That he can access his chakra at such a young age. Itachi would have to watch Naruto more closely, maybe he would find some way to help him. He owed it to the boy's parents after all. Naruto-kun, come into the seal, I want to speak with you for a second, Akane said as Naruto finished his after-exercise stretches. Sure thing, Naruto said, shrugging off the odd request since she could talk to him without him entering the mindscape. Not that he would ever complain about being near the one person who had helped him more than the Hokage. He sat down under one of the trees and closed his eyes. He pictured himself entering the mindscape and willed it to happen. Opening his eyes again Naruto found himself standing just outside of the cage that held Akane. He looked at it for a moment with a frown before moving through the bars and walked over to where the red head was sitting. Akane chan greeted as he sat down next to her. Akane smiled at him, Naruto-kun, now that you are going to be starting the academy in a few months we need to talk about your persona. By what? Naruto asked, blinking in confusion. What was she talking about? Your persona, how you act in public, she said, I've been thinking about it for a while now. With how the population of Kanoha sees you, we need to hide your abilities and make sure they don't think you're a threat. Um. Okay, that makes sense actually, Naruto thought about what his red-haired demoness was telling him. So, how do you think I should act? He asked, because honestly he had no real talent in subterfuge. The cane smiled, well. I was thinking of the best way to make you seem harmless, as well as get back at a few of the villagers. Chapter 4. Academy Days PT. 1. It was early in the morning, the sun was rising, painting the sky in beautiful reds, yellows and oranges, and the people of Kanoha were currently gaping, as members of the Achiha police force were busy running around Kanoha, trying to pick up their undergarments, all of which had been hung around the many buildings of Kanoha and dyed bright pink. The sight of the Achiha police force, one of the most powerful clans in Kanoha, picking up bright pink underwear that had been hung from the buildings, their faces burning with shame and anger, was a sight that shocked all those who were watching. Many of the people, including the Red Eyes themselves, wondered who had the audacity to do this to one of the most powerful clans and the people in charge of the police force. Unbeknownst to all of them one six-year-old Naruto Yuzuamki was watching the scene unfold from a nearby building, hidden under a camouflage sheet and snickering. What do you think of my latest exploit Akane Chan? I must admit I'm impressed, Akane said, laughing within his mind. I've always hated that clan, they're so arrogant that, and she hated the way they treated Naruto, with his permission she had watched more of his memories. The Achiha clan had been one of his biggest detractors, and a lot of the abuse he had taken from the ninja forces had been Achiha. That had been more than enough to put them onto her shit list. Of course, there were more reasons she hated them, but she wasn't going to say anything about that to Naruto until she felt he was ready for that kind of information. Naruto smiled as he moved into a crouching position and jumped off the roof and into an alley. He threw off his camouflage and hid it in one of the many halls he had created within the village. Walking out of the alley he bumped into one of the many Achiha running around, collecting underwear. You. The Achiha shouted, gathering the attention of everyone else there as he pointed at Naruto. I bet this is your doing you little deep rat. I'm gonna make you suffer. And so the chase begins, Naruto thought as he laughed out loud and shouted, then you're going to have to catch me. With that he reached into his pocket and pulled out a small self-made smoke bomb that he threw on the ground, covering the entire area in smoke. Cough cough where did he go? I don't know. I can't find him in this stupid smoke. Damn him. When I get my hands on that brat. 
The smoke soon cleared and the group of Ichiha looked around, spotting Naruto as he turned a corner. They soon ran after him and Naruto laughed as he began giving them a merry chase around the village. Having memorized every single side street, back alley and sewer tunnel, Naruto knew more ways around Kanoha than anyone else and had no compunctions against using them to lead the Ichiha clan by the nose. Looking behind him he saw the red eyes chasing after him, their Sharingan active as they tried to use it to track him down. He grinned, turning his attention back to what was in front of him and quickly turned another corner. Several trash cans were standing off to the side and Naruto pulled out a small red stick with a wick on it. He felt a cane channeling her through his finger and grinned as the wick sparked and lit. He tossed a stick into one of the trash cans and turned another corner. Just then the Ichiha had turned the corner he had previously turned a few seconds ago and the trash cans exploded, sending food, gunk and other kinds of garbage flying all over the red-eyed clan members who had all been blown off their feet. Naruto cackled as he continued to run, he turned another corner and found more Ichiha that had stopped collecting their underwear at the sound of the explosion. They quickly spotted him and their faces turned to anger. Look there. It's him. The demon. That him. Running some more the blonde-haired troublemaker took several twists and turns as he pumped chakra through his legs to increase his speed. He pulled out more smoke bombs, along with some tear gas he had made from onions, garlic, and piss from the Inuzuka's dogs. He let them drop behind him and grinned when they exploded into the Chazing Ninja, causing them all to stop and cough as their lungs, eyes and nose burned with a terrible mixture of liquids. Naruto rounded another corner and into an alley before jumping on the roof. Going through several hand seals he disappeared in a puff of smoke, using the henge or transformation technique to transform into a young chunin with brown hair and steel gray eyes. After which he began moving away from the parts of Kanoha that had the Ichiha's dyed underwear. You know, pranking the red eyes is starting to get kind of boring. Do you think I should start finding other targets? Asked Naruto. Hmm, a cane tapped her chin and thought, it may prove useful to prank others, maybe you should begin pranking a clan like the Inuzukas or the Hayugas, so that you can practice hiding from people who are good trackers. It was unknown to everyone but Naruto and his inner demons, but the blonde didn't just use his pranks as a means of revenge. They actually had a three-part purpose, the first being to get back at those who had and still do wrong him, the second was to train in his stealth, evasion and espionage skills, and the third was to give himself the persona as a prankster and attention seeker, thus ensuring no one took him seriously and thought of him as a threat. So far, it has worked perfectly. Of course, just because you're going to select other targets doesn't mean you should stop pranking the arrogant bastards. We both know I would never stop pranking the arrogant pricks, Naruto grinned as he stopped building hopping. He looked around, seeing no one in sight, and figuring he was far enough from the most heavily populated centers of the village he dropped the henge, reverting back into his blonde-haired, blue-eyed form. He dropped down from the roof and began to casually walk through the section of the village he was in. They need someone like me to ensure that their heads don't get so big they no longer fit through a door. As he continued walking along, a shadow came up behind him and an emotionless voice spoke up, Hello, Naruto-kun. I demand that brat be punished for his transgressions. Tsuritobi held back a sigh as he stared at the man in front of him. Fugaku Ichiha was the head of the Ichiha clan and leader of the police force. He had short black hair and onyx eyes, with visible creases below them that were made more pronounced whenever he adopted a stern look like right now. He wore a simple kimono with grey pants which had the clan symbol on the back. The man was currently trying to demand that Naruto be punished for the prank that had just been played on his clan. Somehow, someone had snuck into the Ichiha compound and in the span of one night had taken and dyed all of their underwear pink, then strung them up on the buildings around Kanoha. It was just one of the many pranks that had been played on Fugaku's clan, along with several prominent business owners. Do you have any proof that Naruto is the one who played this prank? Asked Siratobi. Fugaku scowled, of course I did. He was there at the scene of the crime and ran away when my men tried to apprehend him. A lot of people were there at the scene of the crime, Saratobi pointed out, hiding his frayed patience behind a mask of calm. Fugaku had always hated Naruto for holding the Kaiubi. The Ichiha clan had been one of the clans that had suffered the most during the incident, losing nearly one third of their clan to the great demon. Because of that, even though Fugaku knew that Naruto was not the Kaiubi, he still blamed the boy for the fox's transgressions. Also, need I remind that your people had not even bothered to question him, simply blamed him for the prank, Siratobi had seen the little incident that had caused the chase through Kanoha and knew who was really at fault. And we all know how the Ichiha clan has treated him in the past, so it's no wonder here and when your men attempted to apprehend him and then chased after him. Besides, the old Hokage added when he saw the man's scowl increase, are you telling me that Naruto was good enough to somehow slip past all of the clan members you have guarding your compound? If possible the Ichiha clan leader's scowl increased as he found himself caught in the wily old man's trap. 
if he admitted that his clan was not good enough to capture one child, a child who was also wearing hideously bright orange clothes that were impossible to miss from sneaking in, his clan would end up being the laughing stock at the next meeting, even more so than they would be already for having this prank happen to them in the first place. No child could ever get past our guards, Fugaku ground out, knowing he had lost this battle. Then there is no way Naruto could have done it, Sirotobi replied, but rest assured I will do all in my power to find out who did this. Sending one more scowl at Sirotobi, Fugaku spun around and walked out of the door, slamming it on his way out. The sand aim sighed as he let himself lean back in his chair, one hand absently opening a drawer and pulling out his pipe and some tobacco. He placed the tobacco in the pipe and lit it with a small cane, fire release, jutsu, absently puffing on it as he thought of this new problem. The mass pranks had only started about eight months ago, around the same time Naruto had started the academy. Ever since then merchants, specific civilians and clans, had been hit with a string of pranks, though this recent one was the largest prank by far. He didn't really know who it was, and even though he, like many others, suspected Naruto since he was at every single incident, there was no actual proof that he had done it. Besides, how does a six-year-old child sneak into the Anbu HQ and paint their changing room neon green? Just then the door opened and in walked the troublemaker himself. Like always he was wearing an orange tracksuit with blue on the upper shoulders area, as well as up and down the front, a white swirl with a tassel on the left side, a red swirl on the back, a big white collar, orange pants, and blue sandals. Why the boy had decided to pick up such a hideous outfit was beyond the aging Hokage, it was the largest eyesore he had ever seen, almost as bad as Mido Guy's green spandex. Behind Naruto came his most trusted Anbu agent, Itachi Uchiha, who had an amused look in his eyes, clearly visible even behind his mask. Ah, Naruto-kun, I just had a conversation about you, Sirotobi said. Was it about how you're finally ready to give me that hat, Ajisen? Asked Naruto in a very loud, very obnoxious voice. No, I'm afraid not, Sirotobi puffed on his pipe. You see, there was a recent prank with the Uchiha clan recently. Ano sa, isn't that your family Itachi Nai? Asked Naruto, looking up at the weasel-masked Anbu agent. Yes, it is Naruto-kun, said Itachi, a smile hidden by his mask. So what happened to them? Asked Naruto. It seems someone snuck into the Ichiha clan compound, stole all their underwear, dyed it bright pink, and then strung it throughout Kanoha Sirotobi was suddenly interrupted by a shout of awesome. From Naruto. You wouldn't happen to know anything about this would you Naruto-kun? He finished. Eh? I saw all the pink underwear if that's what you're talking about, Naruto scratched the back of his head as his eyes took on a squint that made him look like a fox. But you have no clue who did it? Pressed Sirotobi. Of course I do. Shouted Naruto, raising a fist into the air and shaking it right before a dumb look crossed his face. Um. Where is Uchi? Uchi. Red-eyed compound again. Sirotobi pinched the bridge of his nose at the sheepish and stupid look on the blonde's face, never mind. You're supposed to be at the academy anyways, Itachi, see to it that he gets there. Of course, Hokage-sama, Itachi bowed before placing a hand on the young blonde's shoulder. Come along Naruto-kun, time to go to the academy. Aw, oh, but the academy is so boring. Whined Naruto as they made their way out, leaving Sirotobi to contemplate just who was pranking his village. I was most impressed with your prank this time, Itachi said as he and Naruto were walking towards the academy. He knew that the young blonde really was behind the pranks, but it was so funny watching the others run around trying to find out who did it that he had not said anything. It was very creative. Naruto grinned, thanks. I thought it was pretty masterful. I am also pleased that you did not touch mine or my Ka-sen's underwear, the normally stoic Anbu added with an amused look. Grinning sheepishly, Naruto scratched the back of his head, yeah, well. The raven-haired Anbu captain shook his head before stopping in front of the door that led to Naruto's classroom. Excuse me, Itachi said as he opened the door and had Naruto walk in, I found him wandering around town and felt that it would be prudent of me to escort him to his class. The person in charge of the class, a man with graying hair and green eyes, said, thank you, even as he gave Naruto a glare of malicious hatred. Itachi noticed the glare but did not do anything that would get him in trouble, instead making a mental note to report this guy to the Hokage as someone to watch out for. He gave a nod and left be a sunshine. Sit down. Boy, the man said, scowl still in place. You got it, Shinsei-sensei. Naruto shouted, he knew what the man had really wanted to say. Like many others Shinsei hated his guts because of a cane, no doubt the man wanted to call him a demon like the others, but was prevented from doing so, thanks to being in the academy with people who did not know of her being sealed into him. Naruto knew very well that there was a law that supposedly prevented people from telling their children or anyone else who didn't know about the sealing, though it didn't prevent them from telling the children to stay away from him. He walked over to an empty seat, plopping down and stretching out. The lesson soon began, and Naruto found himself bored as hell. 
All the man was talking about was how the Shah named Hokage founded the village, and Naruto had already read all about that. Man, I'm so bored, Naruto complained to Akane as Shinsei continued droning on. Well, we could always come up with a prank to lighten up the moment, Akane suggested. Maybe. Naruto looked around at all of the students, they were all two years older than him. Very few academy students ever entered at the age of six anymore, since they were no longer in a time of war, and the previous loss of Shinobi from the Kaiubi attack had been filled for the most part, the civilian council had made a new law that essentially cut the Shinobi Academy down by two years. Now most academy students didn't start until they turned eight. Uzumaki. Shinsei yelled, smirking at seeing him not paying attention, since you don't seem to like paying attention you can leave. What? But I am paying attention. Naruto shouted as he stood up and jutted his chin out with a stubborn look. Oh, then when did the first Hokage found the village? Uh. The day he founded the village of course. Naruto shouted, scratching the back of his head. Shinsei smirked as the class laughed at Naruto who was scowling. Obviously you're not paying attention, and until you do I will not have you in my class, he may not be able to be so blatantly unfair that he would draw the attention of the Hokage, but he was more than capable of doing something like this. Naruto scowled before walking out the door and slamming it shut. As soon as he passed the threshold for the academy he grinned, thank god, I really didn't want to be in there anymore. To the training ground. Asked Akane, grinning at her blonde container, even though he didn't know it. Naruto gave a smile that if the two could have seen each other, would have realized they were the exact same, of course. Ugh, I can't believe that jerk kicked me out again, Naruto thought to himself as he walked through the streets of Konoha. Are you complaining? Asked Akane, her voice belying her amusement. Of course not, Naruto said, scoffing a little. Honestly, how could I complain about getting out of that boring classroom, where all we learn about is that the Shadane could make wood out of the nothing, the Nidane could pull water out of the air, the Sandane could pull every in Kanoha out of his ass, and the Yandane could flash from one point to the next in less than a second. It's the most boring class I've ever been in. It's also the only class you've ever been in, she quipped. Whatever, I Naruto stopped talking and took a deep sniff of the air. There was a heavenly aroma coming from somewhere, what is that smell? It smells incredible. Boo boy, thought Akane as Naruto began to follow the scent, she knew what it was. Somehow, she wasn't surprised that it had caught his attention, she had honestly expected him to find it ages ago. Naruto soon found himself standing in front of a small stand. It didn't look like much, just a very small building with flaps on it that said Ichirakus, behind that the blonde could see a small bar with several stools and behind that, what looked like assorted cooking gear. Even though it didn't look like much, this was where the smell was coming from, and Naruto couldn't help but enter, his mouth watering slightly at the scent. As he stood at the entrance an old man walked in through a door in the back of the bar, stopping when he noticed Naruto standing there with a glazed expression. Well hello there. The old man said in a friendly voice, snapping the blonde out of his daze and making him blush as he realized that he hadn't even noticed the man come in. The old man saw it and chuckled, welcome to Ichirakus. What can I get for you? Naruto opened his mouth to speak, only to close it several times. He looked at the man cautiously and was surprised to find that he had no malicious aura or ill intent towards him. Um. The blonde scratched the back of his head as he relaxed slightly, though he was still prepared to run if necessary. I'm not sure, I just sort of followed my nose. And here you are, the old man finished with a chuckle, well, hop on the stool, and I'll give you a menu. Doing as Naruto hopped on the closest stool, where he began swinging his legs lightly since they were about two feet off the ground. The old man came over and passed him a menu, pausing when he noticed the whisker marks. Naruto saw him looking at them and tensed, an act which did not go unnoticed by the old Raymond chef owner, as he set the menu next to him and gave a smile. Just let me know what you want, and I'll have it cooked up in a jiff. Naruto gaped at him for a moment before blushing, speaking in a low voice he said, I I would like to try something, but I don't have any money. He moved to get up but received a shock when the old man placed a hand on his shoulder and pushed him back down. Then the first time will be in the house he said, a cheerful smile on his face. It would be a shame if I were to lose a customer just because he didn't have any money on him. Now, what will you have? Um. I don't know, maybe Naruto looked at the menu. Some Mizo. Mizo huh? Come and ride up. The old man turned his head and cupped his mouth as he shouted, Oi, am. Get in here, we have a customer. Okay. A voice came from the back before a young girl, who looked to be around 10 or 11 years old, with brown hair that was in a bun and brown eyes came in. She walked over to the two of them and looked at Naruto, blinking in idle curiosity, causing Naruto to tilt his head in confusion. Kawe. The squeal startled Naruto so much that he almost fell out of his seat and likely would have were it not for the fact that A.M. had somehow magically appeared next to him and was currently squeezing the life out of him. Oh you sang he's so cute. 
She gushed as Naruto tried to decide whether he should feel embarrassed by her words or petrified that this girl who he had met not more than a few seconds ago was choking him with her hug. He was thankful when she let go, at least for a few seconds, because she soon began to rub his whiskers. I've never seen such cute birthmarks, she said, running a finger over them. They were slightly bumpy, rather than smooth, almost like a scar. Against his will Naruto began to make a purring sound in the back of his throat. Of course, this was the wrong thing to do when around a young girl. Kawaii. Naruto suddenly found himself back to being squeezed to death and was now fearing for his life. He wondered how long he would survive without oxygen. You may want to let him go, the old man said, it looks like you're choking him. A.M. looked down to see Naruto, blue in the face, with swirls in his eyes. Oh. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to I mean I was just trying. The old man laughed as Naruto began to get his bearings back, how about you just help me make some Mizo? Mizo? Coming right up. A.M. said enthusiastically as she somehow peered back behind the bar. Watching her do that, Naruto was almost reminded of Yandame's ability to flash from one point to another. A few minutes later the food that the delicious smell was coming from was placed in front of him by A.M. Eat up. She said cheerfully. Naruto sniffed at the ramen, taking in its heavenly aroma before breaking apart a pair of chopsticks. Wrapping the noodles around them he took a bite, rolling the food around in his mouth before he froze. The ramen chef and his daughter tensed, wondering if he didn't like the ramen. This. This is delicious. Naruto shouted, right before he began to gorge himself on the bowl of ramen. The old man looked from the currently stuffing Naruto face to his daughter, A.M. Chan. I think we just found our number one customer. Okay Naruto-kun, I think you're ready to learn actual hand-to-hand -hand combat, Akane told her container as he finished exercising. The blonde academy student had gained a lot of physical prowess, for a six-year-old that is. But the extremely demanding workout, combined with his large chakra reserves and the very good amount of control he had over his chakra, Naruto could likely already beat any genin out there. Now, Tujutsu is simply a basic form that typically does not require chakra, but chakra may be used to enhance techniques. Tujutsu generally require no hand seals to perform and are much quicker to use than ninjutsu or. Tujutsu is simply put, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Tujutsu is something that everyone, including most demons use in combat, and there are many different styles. The style I will be teaching you is called Kitsunikan, Fox Fist, and is a style I myself came up with many years ago when I was under the command of Inari-sama, Fox God. The cane paused for a moment before continuing, now, the style I'm going to teach you actually takes the essence of a fox and imbues it into your fighting, meaning that it requires the use of a combination of feints and quick counterattacks to weaken vital areas. We use trickery every chance we get to deceive our opponents and create openings in their guard to exploit, much like a fox. To use this style requires a great amount of speed, flexibility, dexterity, constitution and endurance. Is that why you always make sure I exhaust myself to the point where I damn near pass out every time I train? Asked Naruto. The exercises that Akane often made him do were always extremely exhausting and often painful, several times he had been so tired that he had fallen asleep in the training field. Those were the few times he cursed the vixen in his head. Yes, this style is not made for humans. It requires more energy and ability than a regular human can produce, Akane hummed in thought. I had been debating on teaching you this style until you turned into a Hanyu, but I feel it would be better if you got a decent grasp on it sooner, rather than later. Head home and come into the seal so I can begin working on this style with you. Yes ma'am. Another year passed and Naruto continued to grow and improve. His nights in the seal were now spent working on his tojutsu, which Akane had shown him. For the first four months this had consisted of going through the katas that he was taught, his friend and mentor would correct him when his stances went wrong, often making him go through all of them again if he made a mistake. During that time she would always comment on the various attacks that could be done from each position, and the best way to counterattack when someone would make a specific move. When Akane had deemed him passable in the tojutsu katas she moved on to sparring. Because of his a, lack of a sparring partner, and b, Akane wanting to see him so she can correct his flaws, she had Naruto spar with her in the mindscape. Sparring being more like beating the holy hell out of Naruto and then telling him what he did wrong. Come on Naruto-kun, you have to do better than that. Akane shouted in a sing-song voice that she knew would bother him and make him angry enough to make mistakes. Naruto never liked to be looked down upon. Grrr. Naruto growled as he stood up, I'll show you. He came in hard, moving quite fast for someone who was only seven years old. However, that was nowhere near fast enough to catch her off guard. As Naruto moved and he aimed a claw swipe at Akane's midsection. This was met with a red head using a hand to subtly shift his attack away from her, while at the same time using her other hand to launch a fast strike that caught the blonde in the solar plexus. Naruto gasped and likely would have flown back several feet and landed on his back, but Akane had grabbed his left wrist and pulled him before he could get away. 
she spun around 180 degrees, taking Naruto with her before she let go, releasing the blonde and sending him flying several feet away, where he hit the ground and rolled along the ground before coming to a stop several feet away. You're not thinking clearly anymore, Akane admonished, you can't let yourself go off half-cocked and expect to win. Oftentimes it's not the stronger opponent who wins, but the one who thinks with the clearest head. Erg, right, Naruto winced as he sat up and rubbed his chest, sorry. Don't apologize, just get back up and start again, this time, with a calm mind. Naruto took a deep breath as he stood up, his legs felt a little wobbly, but he managed not to fall over. Looking up at his opponent he saw her standing there with the same smirk she had on every time they spared. Okay, here I go, he breathed, right before charging at her. He came in with several high-low claw strikes that were aimed at the vital points in the human body, septum, larynx, clavicle, solar plexus, floating ribs, radius bone, inner thigh and several other areas of weakness. When using this form of tojutsu, it was necessary to have intimate knowledge of the inner workings of the creature you were fighting. The cane had made Naruto study up on the human body by going to the library, which he had been able to use ever since the Hokage had the previous librarian who worked there arrested and a more malleable one had taken her place. The cane weaved through the strikes, lightly deflecting every attack that might have come close to hitting her. She was impressed with how good Naruto had become in just under a year, it showed just how determined and intelligent the blonde really was. She almost felt it was a shame that he had to hide it from everyone else. Oh well, their loss. Not bad Naruchan, a cane teased before lashing out with a soft edge strike to the throat. It was so fast that Naruto hadn't even seen the attack before he was on his knees, wheezing as he tried to take in a breath but couldn't due to having his throat temporarily closed from the strike. A minute later he was on his back again, in a slight daze, after his nose had a meeting with Akane's knee. I think that's enough for now, Akane said as she walked over to where he had landed after her strike. It's been about two hours non-stop fighting, you're improving well. Naruto blinked several times in an effort to get the stars out of his eyes, he sat up a few moments later and looked at Akane. How strong do you think I'll be when I graduate? He asked. It's hard to say, said Akane, sitting down as her tail spread out behind her. On pure power alone, you'll be able to beat any you ever run across, maybe even a cage, though you won't have the experience that they do. That was something she would need to help him with, sometime soon she would have to help him with his first kill. But that was for another time. And speaking of graduating, she paused and took a deep breath. I think you should fail your first two years. What? Naruto gave her a shocked wide-eyed look, why? Because we need people to believe that you're not a threat until I can change you, she said. If people saw what you were capable of right now, and if you graduated too soon, they would assume you were dangerous and it could get out of hand. Well how long will it be until you change me? I need my yaki to fully integrate into your chakra coils, so I would say about. Five years, a cane looked thoughtful for a moment and nodded, yes, five years should do it. So when I'm twelve then? Yes. Naruto thought about what she was saying, he really didn't want to wait two extra years to graduate. But. Fine, he said, I understand what you're saying. I'll wait. I'm sorry Naruto-kun, she told him, placing a hand on his left leg, but at least this way you'll also be with people your own age. You know that doesn't really matter to me, he told her as he grabbed her hand and began to play with her fingers, an odd habit he had never gotten out of when he was younger, and she used to tell him stories. You're the only person I care about. The cane felt herself blush, why does he always have to say the sweetest damn things? And so innocently too. She had never been in this situation before and had no clue why she was acting this way. Could I? Could it really be? She wondered, but quickly shook her head. He's just a kid, there's no way I could be in love with a seven-year-old boy. But if that were the case why was it that her heart would flutter every time he cuddled up to her when they were done training? Why was it that she couldn't get him off of her mind? Maybe. I do feel something, she admitted as she looked down at Naruto who was staring around her cell with a frown. But he's too young right now, well I don't really care about age he wouldn't even understand the concepts of a relationship for several more years. I'll wait and see what develops when he gets older, much older. Is something wrong with Naruto-kun? Asked Akane. Yeah. Naruto's frown continued as he looked over at her, I was just looking around the mindscape. I've been thinking about this for a while, and I don't like how bleak it is. Is there a way to change it? Akane paused and looked at him curiously, tilting her head. I don't know, very few beings can actually use powers that affect the mind, and even fewer can access their mindscape. Even most demons are incapable of accessing their mind. It's a very rare skill, the only reason you can do it is because I'm sealed inside of you. I see. Naruto thought for several moments as he looked around. Nodding to himself he closed his eyes and began to concentrate. The cane looked at Naruto oddly and opened her mouth to ask him what he was doing when she saw something that shocked her. From the point where Naruto was sitting, a ripple was spreading out, and when it left, only white could be seen. 
In only a few seconds, the knee-deep water, the cage, the dark craggy walls and the barely illuminated landscape was gone. In its place was nothing more than what could be considered a white space, where there was no difference between the floor, the walls or the ceiling, and the entire area just seemed to go on. A cane actually felt slightly queasy just looking at the white area that seemed to give no sense of direction. Another ripple soon spread out from Naruto, however this one left green in its place. Not just green a cane realized with shock, but grass. Lush looking green grass a few inches tall, it spread out from underneath Naruto and began to encompass the floor. Starting from a point above her, blue began to spread out along walls and ceiling. Where the walls and ceilings had previously been was a light blue sky, with a sprinkling of clouds and a bright yellow sun. Trees and other foliage soon began to sprout up from the ground, covering the area to create a forest. The entire process only took several minutes. Before Kane could marvel at what just happened a soft gasp of breath alerted her to Naruto, who was laying on his back looking exhausted. Sweat marred his bar and he was breathing heavily, as if he had just done one of the workout routines she had given him. Crawling over to the blonde, a cane sat back down and crossed her legs, bringing Naruto's head into her lap, where she began to play with his hair. You do know what you just did is impossible right? She said, grinning to hide the surprise she herself felt from seeing what had just transpired. No one without mind powers should be able to do what you did. Perhaps I have mind powers and you just don't know it, Naruto smiled as he sighed in content as a cane's fingers lightly raked over his scalp. Closing his eyes he leaned into the redhead's touch. No, she looked at in amusement, the only clan that received the powers of the mind are the Amanakas because of a service they gave to Kami several hundred years ago, and the Rikidu Senin who had done the gods a great justice and was rewarded with the Samsara eyes. And I don't have mind powers, so there is no way I could have passed them on to you. Perhaps I'm just awesome then. The cane laughed, perhaps you are. Her eyes softened a tad as she looked at him, you're exhausted, get some rest, I'll take care of you. Okay, Naruto said with a soft yawn, night. But night, a cane whispered as Naruto went out like a light. That entire night she watched him as he slept, gently running her hands through his hair. Chapter 5. Growing up, Saratobi looked at the young blonde who was like a grandson to him, giving him a sheepish and slightly ashamed look. Naruto-kun, he said exasperatedly, this is the second time you've failed. I'm not sure what to do anymore. It wasn't my fault, Dedebeo. Naruto shouted loudly enough that the windows rattled and Saratobi had to cover his ears. It was that stupid Kimiko. He hates me, he always sends me out of class. And he never lets me participate in any of the activities. He hates me. Naruto-kun, Saratobi said with a disappointed look, teachers go through several tests to ensure they do not show any favoritism or refusal to teach another student. Perhaps if you actually took your studies seriously and not skipped class so much, you wouldn't have failed. Naruto scratched his head for a moment before giving him a sheepish look. I'm sorry Ajison, I really did try. I just class is always so boring. I don't care when the whatever law for lumber was made. I want to learn to be a ninja. The look the aging Hokage gave Naruto was a look between exasperated and amused, Naruto-kun, if you want to be Hokage, then it is important to learn these things. A Hokage isn't just a fighter, he is a leader, and it is his job to make decisions that affect the entire village. He gave the sheepish looking blonde a serious stare, understand. Of course I do. Naruto shouted, I promise, next time, I'll pass for sure. Then you'll have no choice but to hand over that hat Ajison. I'm sure you will, Saratobi said with a humoring smile. He watched as the excitable blonde ran out of the door and sighed, wondering just what he was going to do with that child. So what should I do now I wonder. Naruto asked himself, it was summer and he had just failed the academy for the second time like a cane wanted him to. He was now 8 years old and would be placed with the kids his age next year. That meant he had an entire summer with nothing but training and pranks lined up. Actually, there's some place I would like you to go, a cane said, interrupting his musings. Before he could ask the obvious question, the demoness spoke again, going behind the Hokage monument, it should be somewhere around there. She had decided that he was old enough to learn of his heritage, she had been working with him for a long time now, and he had grown a lot. She was positive he was mature enough to handle it. Okay, Naruto said, turning around and beginning to head in the opposite direction. He wasn't really sure where he was going, but figured that a cane would tell him when he got there. The area behind the monument was mainly forest, with only a few small ponds dotting the area. It was uninhabited by any buildings or people. Naruto was curious about why that was, but didn't think about it for long. After nearly an hour of searching Naruto finally asked, okay, what is it I'm looking for? In a minute, keep going forward, we're almost there. Naruto sighed but did as told, walking forward for several more minutes. Stop. Halting, Naruto looked around to see what a cane thought was here. When he couldn't find anything he frowned, so what am I looking for? Can't you feel it? Asked a cane. Feel what? Reach out with your chakra and you'll see, she replied cryptically. 
Naruto did as told, summoning some chakra and sending it out in a pulse just like a cane had told him. When he did that the blonde saw an odd shimmer in the air, a wavy form similar to what one would find in the summer heat. What's that? Asked Naruto, curious since he had never seen something like that before. A, a cane answer Jinjutsu are techniques that are employed in the same fashion as ninjutsu, requiring chakra and hand seals. However, the primary difference between the two is that the effects are illusionary, instead of attacking the victim's body, like tajutsu or ninjutsu, techniques manipulate the flow of chakra in the victim's brain, thus causing a disruption in their senses. I know what they are, you know, Naruto said with a pout, you did explain them to me. Right, sorry, Akane said, looking a little sheepish even though Naruto could not see her. So you want me to dispel it? Yes, do you remember how? There are several ways to dispel A. The first is to cut off the flow of one's chakra and then release the chakra in a greater amount than the required, and the second is to cause physical pain to yourself to disrupt its flow. Very good Akane said, however, that would work for this one. This is an area that has likely been here for several years, at least eight. So how do I dispel it? You can't, you lack the finesse to dispel something like this, Akane said, smirking as she waited for him to get the answer. Naruto scowled, then why are we he stopped as the answer came to him, you can dispel it, can't you? Excellent job. Yes, I can dispel it. Well I've already given you permission to take control when you feel the need, so do your thing. Naruto's eyes soon shifted from blue to red with black slits, looking around a cane spoke in a very soft language that Naruto didn't understand. A few moments later there was an almost gentle and undetectable pulse of Yaoki, before the air around began to shimmer. A few feet away a decent-sized two-story house appeared in front of them, wavering in front of them like a ghost before it became solid. Where are we? Asked Naruto, what is this place? Go in and you'll find out. Naruto frowned, a cane was being really cryptic today. Normally, she would just come right out and tell him what was going on. He decided to think about that later and just go in to get his answers. As he began to walk towards the house he examined it in more detail, it was a fairly nice looking house, made of a combination of brick and wood, right in front of it was what looked like it had at one point been a flower garden of some kind, but it overgrown with weeds and other forms of flora. Aside from that, the house was very nice. Hey Akane chan how did you know this house was here? Asked Naruto as that particular thought occurred, she seemed to know her way around Kanoha pretty well, considering she had been more busy destroying the village than observing it. You don't think the day I attacked was the only other time I've ever been to Kanoha do you? Asked Akane, sounding amused. Naruto frowned, so you've been in Kanoha before. How come no one ever saw you? They did, they just never noticed who I was. As you've obviously seen I don't always look like a giant nine-tailed fox. Naruto blinked in surprise at that, before remembering she was likely in her human form when visiting. So when were the other times you had come to Kanoha? Actually, I was here before Kanoha was ever built, she told Naruto, shocking the blonde. I, along with the eight other Biju were sent here by Kami to complete a task, when we accomplished that task, Kami gave us our own lands to look after. Being the strongest of the nine and a being of fire, I was given Hai no Kuni, the nation with the largest amount of land, to look after. It was our job to protect and act as the guardian of the lands we had been given, and we did so for nearly a thousand years. The one you know as the Shadam Hokage, had actually come to me to ask for permission to settle on this land. I was there at Kanoha's founding. Wow, Naruto's mental voice held an odd tone to it, causing a cane to snicker. The blonde frowned a moment later, wait, so why do people think the Biju are nothing more than monsters? The cane was silent for a moment, then she sighed as she thought of how best to explain this particular piece of history. Times change Naruto-kun, she said softly, deciding to be upfront with her knowledge. People change, over the years humans began to fear the power of us Biju, they tried to capture and subdue us out of that fear. I remember hearing about Ichibi no Shikaku, one-tailed tanuki, getting sealed in a tea kettle, and Nibi no Nekamata, two-tailed cat, getting sealed into a shrine. One by one all of the Bijuu became sealed away because our powers were so feared. All but me. Of course, you can only seal a Bijuu into an object up to the Yanbi, a cane could almost feel Naruto's amazement at her story and would have smiled had the story not depressed her. When the Gobi was sealed humans soon began to realize that they could use the power of the Bijuu as weapons. It was actually the Rakubi no Raijuu, six-tailed weasel, getting sealed into a human, and that human using its power to destroy a neighboring village that caused what you call the First Great Shinobi War. Whoa. Naruto muttered, stunned at hearing the true reason for the First War. It was much different than what they were taught at the academy. It was much cooler too, in his opinion anyway. Anyways, I'll tell you some more later, for now, you need to go inside the house. Standing in front of the door Naruto looked at the doorknob with a frown, there were several weird squiggly lines on the knob that reminded the blonde of the seal on his stomach. The cane noticed what he was looking at and made to reassure him, don't worry about those seals Naruto-kun, place your hand on the doorknob and it should open. 
Okay, he reached out with a hand and grasped the doorknob. However, the moment he did Naruto began to feel weaker, it was with a start that he realized the door was sucking out his chakra. He tried to pull his hand off, only to find that it was somehow stuck. Placing his other hand on his wrist and a foot on the door, he tried to pry it off to no success. Calm down Naruto-kun, Akin said, trying to keep the blonde from hurting himself, it's just taking the amount of chakra you need to open the door. As she said this the door stopped pulling on Naruto's chakra and there was a soft click signifying the door was unlocked. Naruto stared at it wearily before, with some prodding along from Akane, he opened the door. The first room he stepped into looked like some kind of living room. The area was carpeted with thick rich looking carpet. On the farthest side away from him was a fireplace, with a glass coffee table next to it and several couches around it. There were a few pictures of a man with spiked golden blonde hair that looked very similar to his own and a beautiful red-haired woman hanging along the walls. Despite no fire going and no one having lived in here, which was obvious from the several layers of dust that covered the furniture, it gave off a very homely feel. The Kane Chan, whose house are we in? Asked Naruto as he walked around the room and looked at all of the pictures. Each one held either the golden-haired man or the red-haired woman, some had the man standing with what Naruto could recognize as a squad of genin, a boy with spiky silver hair, another boy with spiky black hair and goggles, and a young girl with triangle markings on her cheeks. They were pictures of the man with another man, who had long, spiky white hair and was wearing red kabuki clothes. There were pictures of the redhead standing with a squad of Anbu who all had their masks off, or having her with her own squad of what looked like genin, even if the little black-haired child looked far too young to be a genin, and pictures of the man and the woman wrapped around each other. Naruto didn't know why, but he felt like he should know these two. The cane sighed as she sensed his thoughts, Naruto-kun, why don't you go up to the second floor, enter the last door on the right, and then enter the mindscape. Naruto raised an eyebrow, a part of him just wanted her to answer his questions. Why did he feel like he should know those people in the pictures? Why did he feel like he had finally come home when entering this house, despite having never been here before? And why did Akane seem to know where to go in here? However, he knew her well enough to know that until he did what she told him to, Akane would not budge. He followed her instruction, walking through the door in front of him and into a hallway. He turned left, since that was the side with the staircase and walked towards it, and then up the stairs, absently taking note that there seemed to be a basement, since the stairs led down as well as up. When he reached the second floor he looked around and found himself in another hallway. He walked through the hall and stopped at the last door on the right. A sudden feeling of trepidation came over him. What would he find on the other side of this door? Why did he get the feeling that he was standing on the threshold of some life-changing moment? These were questions that he had no answer to. Naruto-kun. For some reason Akane's soft alto voice made him relax, the feeling of trepidation was still there. But it was much more manageable. Yes. Are you alright? I'm fine, Naruto took a deep breath, blowing it out he opened the door and stepped through. He had not been sure what he would find on the other side, but what he did was certainly not what he expected. The walls were painted a soft orange with blue strips, all around the room were large, stuffed toys, and in the center of the room was a cradle. Naruto knew this was a nursery for a newborn. For whatever reason the side of this room caused unshed tears to gather at the corner of the blonde's eyes. What is this place? Naruto asked Akane, why have you brought me here? This was going to be a room, Naruto-kun, Akane said softly. Naruto's eyes widened, W what? Come into the seal, all will be explained. Within the seal Naruto found Akane sitting over by the lake he had created, her knees were drawn up to her chest, arms wrapped around her legs and her head resting on her knees. When she saw Naruto she moved into a cross-legged position as he sat in front of her. She sighed as she saw the look he was giving her, it was a slightly confused look of trepidation, like he knew she was keeping something from him, and all the trust he had placed in her had been misplaced. It was a look she had never wanted to see on the blonde and hoped to never see again. I promise to tell you everything I know, all I ask is that you don't talk until I'm finished. Okay. The young blonde before her gave a sharp nod of assent. Now, where to begin? I suppose I should start by saying that I had been living in Kanoha for six months before I attacked, or I guess it would be more accurate to say, was forced to attack. She saw Naruto open his mouth to ask a question and held up a hand, all will be explained later, I promise. When the young blonde closed his mouth she continued, every decade I would head out of my home, a secret home I had built many centuries ago, that no one other than myself can even reach, much less enter. I would travel around Hai no Kuni and gather information on what has been going on in my land, as is my job as its guardian. Kanoha had been my last stop, mainly because it is this village where most of the important information and happenings come from. When I got here, I had done my usual routine, going into bars, which are always a prime source of information no matter the era, charming men with my beauty, in order to find out if anything important has happened, and exploring the town, just so I could mingle with the people and make sure I knew the general atmosphere. 
Well here however, something interesting happened, a cane took a deep breath before plunging in, I met your mother and father. Naruto gaped at the woman in front of him, she had met his parents. As an orphan, Naruto had always wondered about who his parents were. The matron had told him that they had left him because they didn't want a demon for a son, the old Hokage had told him that he didn't know who his parents had been, even though Naruto could tell the man was lying. It had been the reason he had stopped asking about them, he hadn't wanted to listen to one of the only two people who cared for him lie. Yet here was a cane, saying she knew who his parents were. Why hadn't she told him? Why did she wait until now to inform him about his parents? I had actually met them when I was wandering the town, she continued on, unaware of Naruto's thoughts. Some pervert with white hair had attempted to make a pass at me, and after I had finished beating him into the ground I was confronted with your mother, stars in her eyes, telling me how cool I was. The cane favored him with a soft smile, your mother's name was Kashina Yuzumaki, she was a kanoichi from the now destroyed Yuzushi Agakur, which is located on an island just a few miles off of Mizu no Kuni. Like all Yuzumaki members she had bright red hair and purple eyes, and the fiercest temper you would ever see. I remember talking with her and telling her that I was actually a trader looking to establish a shop here. She introduced me to Minato Namikaze, the Yandame Hokage. And your father. It was at these words that Naruto began breathing heavily. And my father? Is it Yandame? Asked Naruto in a state of shock. The Yandame Hokage had always been a mixed subject for him, on one hand, the man was considered the most powerful shinobi since the time of the Rikidu Senen, even a cane respected him for his battle prowess. On the other hand, he was the man who had sealed a cane inside of him, the reason he had no family or friends, it was his fault that he had been abused, neglected, and beaten since the day he was born. And now, a cane was telling him that this man was his father. Yes, a cane said sadly, he was your father. Your mother was actually pregnant with you when I was doing my negotiations with Yandame. She sighed, Minato Namikaze was a man unlike any other, calm, collected and so highly intelligent that I sometimes felt dumb in his presence. However, he had one glaring weakness, which was also his most incredible strength. His trust in others, it was this trust that made him decide to seal me into you when I went on a rampage. I see. It was all he could think of to say. Never in a million years would he have suspected something like this. Of course, now that he thought about it what she was telling him made sense. Like just why out of all the possible children that could have been chosen to hold a cane, he was the one picked. What better person to hold such power than one's own son? There was also Naruto's looks, he had always noticed the similarities between himself and the Yandame. In fact he was surprised that he hadn't recognized the man in the pictures downstairs, granted he had been more focused on the house itself and wondering why the place felt familiar, but he should have recognized the man. Ever since he had first seen the picture of the man in the Hokage's office, he had seen the similarities, but he had written it off as a coincidence. After all, who would be willing to do something like seal a powerful demon inside of your own family? He grit his teeth as he felt tears leaking out of the corners of his eyes, doing his best to hold the flood of tears that threatened to overwhelm him. He had never cried before, not since the beating he had received that sent him to a cane, no matter how bad things had gotten he had refused to shed tears, and he would not do so now. Just as these thoughts came to mind, he found himself wrapped up in a delicate hug as a cane let his head rest on her bosom. It's okay to cry, Narito-kun, she whispered softly while a hand began to gently run through his hair, messaging his scalp. Naruto felt a tear run down his cheek, then a sob racked his body, finally, the dam holding up his emotions broke. His body heaved with earth-shattering sobs as he remembered all the times he had ever been abused, all the times he had been neglected and isolated at the orphanage, every single beating and insult he had received. Throughout it all, a cane held him, whispering words in his ears. Just let it all out Naruto-kun, she said, letting him cling to her tightly, everything will be alright. The amount of time Naruto cried was interminable, time meant next to nothing while within the seal. Eventually, his tears ceased and his body stopped shaking. He slumped against a cane, whose only response was to hold him tighter. Why didn't you tell me before now? He asked, his voice cracked and emotional from all he had learned. Would it have done any good? A cane asked in a soft voice. Would it have changed anything? I wanted to make sure you were mature enough to realize what it meant to be the son of two such famous people. What do you mean? Asked Naruto, accepting her explanation at face value, his previous anger at her forgotten. She had never lied to him, and he had never asked her if she knew his parents, so in a way it was his fault too. Naruto, Minato Namikaze was famous because he had killed nearly 1,000 ninja in a single battle, thanks to his Horatian, Akane said. Not only was he the most feared man in the world, he was widely hated by Iwa, who felt he was the reason they lost the war. If people knew I was his son they'd try to kill me, wouldn't they? Said Naruto. Yes, and we already have to deal with the fools here, Akane jokes, trying to lighten the situation. Having to deal with both internal and external threats would not be easy. 
Naruto chuckled, but it came out sounding more like a sob as he buried his face deeper into Akane's chest. Thank you, Akane-chan, for not keeping this from me, he said softly. Akane smiled as she kissed his hair, you're welcome. The next morning Naruto woke up to find himself still in the room that had been set up for him. On Akane's suggestion, Naruto began exploring the house. The first two floors weren't much, the first floor held a kitchen dining room, the living room he had entered from, and an office. The second floor was just filled with bedrooms, three guest rooms, the one baby room, and the master bedroom. They were all well furnished with nice, albeit, out-of-date and dusty furniture. It was the basement, however, that drew Naruto's attention. The entire basement was, in a word, gigantic. Larger than the house that sat on top of it, the basement consisted of three floors. The first floor contained a dojo, the room was just a large flat mat with a large mirror on the far wall. All along the walls, ceiling and floor were those odd-looking lines. Those are seals Naruto-kun, Akane told him as he stared, that's one of the things we'll be learning about here. Naruto nodded as he explored the next two floors down. The second basement level was an armory, it was filled with racks on racks of weapons, many of which he didn't recognize, but Akane pointed several out to him. That sickle with a metal chain and iron weight at the end is called a kusurigama, the long staff is called a bow staff, oh, and those little dagger-like weapons are called jud. What about those ones in the case? Asked Naruto, referring to the tri-pronged kunai in the glass case. They were bigger than the average kunai, with a wooden handle that the blonde noticed had more of those seals on it. They were mounted in a glass case that was hung on the wall at the far end, there were nearly a hundred as far as Naruto could count. Those were the special weapons that your father designed his most prized with, Akane said. I can't tell you much about it because frankly, I don't understand the mechanics behind it, but once you get more knowledge on how it works, I'm sure you'll be able to recreate them. Now, there's one more floor for you to look at. This one is the most important and where we'll be getting our information for you'll be learning. The last floor was a library, easily twice the size of the Hokage library, with nearly 100 shelves filled with all kinds of books, scrolls, schematics for exotic-looking weapons and maps. The library was divided into several categories, non-shinobi-related material in one section, tojutsu, jinjutsu, ninjutsu, fuinjutsu and kinjutsu, all had their own sections as well. Each section was further divided by subsections, going by rank E, D, C, B, and S. Go into the ninjutsu section Naruto-kun, Akane instructed, there's in here that I think would be a great boon for you. Which is that? Asked Naruto as he began scrolling through the ninjutsu section of the library. I believe I remember your mother calling it, Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. After learning the Cage Bunshin Naruto's training began to skyrocket as he used it to its fullest effect. The reason for this was just because of what they did. The Cage Bunshin no Jutsu could create any number of copies of the user capable of cohabitating with their surroundings, performing, and engaging in battle. They dispersed in a puff of smoke when sufficiently damaged or at the user's discretion. When clones are created, the user's chakra is evenly distributed among them, making it easy for the user to quickly expand all their chakra. The best part about this was that any knowledge a clone gained during its existence was transferred to the user when it dispersed. For normal people this wouldn't mean much, but for some who had even more chakra than the current Hokage, it was the perfect training. Every morning Naruto would make upwards of 100 clones, a feat he could do thanks to his near-perfect chakra control, harnessed from three and a half years of ridiculous training, and a cane letting him use her yaki to reinforce the clones. He would divide them into three groups, an elemental manipulation group, a group, and a chakra control group for his ever-increasing reserves. This chakra control was more a matter of maintaining control as his chakra continued to increase. Having perfected many of the exercises Akane had given him, even the ones that demons did for their yaki, he had no real need to gain more. The only control exercises he couldn't do were the ones that required what the blonde jokingly referred to as bijuu amounts of chakra, meaning up to five tails worth of chakra. He was progressing slowly, though thanks to his innate talent in the subject it was faster than other people twice his age. Right now he couldn't do more than make basic storage scrolls and exploding tags, but it was progress and he had only started last month. He had yet to truly touch on any ninjutsu beyond some of the more basic ones, mainly because most ninjutsu seemed to be elemental in nature. Because of this, Akane had him get some chakra paper to learn what his affinity was. He stared at the torn, burnt and crumpled pieces of paper on the ground. The reaction he had gotten was not expected, having literally shredded itself to pieces before several pieces burst into flames and the other half wrinkled. So, fire, wind and lightning then? Asked Naruto unsurely. Yes, Akane said, also staring at the paper, though she had more glee than shock. It looks like you have three elements, strong ones too. I would suspect your main element is wind, since it was the one that showed up on the paper first, your father was a wind element, so it's not surprising. The fire you got from me, being a being of fire and all that. And the lightning. Your mother, though it is surprising since her main element was water. 
Akeem shrugged, but she did have a small lightning affinity as well. The first element they trained in was wind, being Naruto's main element. The first step had been to split a leaf using his chakra, it was a little difficult, but thanks to his clones, he had managed it within the month. The key, Naruto had learned, was to imagine your chakra as two sharp edges grinding against each other. It was after he had accomplished this that Akane spoke of her plan to give Naruto some experience as a ninja. Naruto-kun, I think we're done for the day. Head on home and get into the seal. I take it you have something important to tell me? Akane only ever asked him to come into the seal if she had something important to talk to him about. Her simple yes confirmed his thoughts. All right. Naruto shouted, getting the attention of his cage bunshin. It's time to head out, begin dispelling yourselves in groups of five every five minutes. He had learned from experience that if he had them dispel all at once it would knock him out cold from an overload of information. When there are only three of your left, place all of the scrolls back into the house. Asu. The clone saluted and began dispelling. In the meantime Naruto made his way back to his apartment, having discussed with Akane the benefits of keeping appearances by living in his apartment, as opposed to the Namaka's household. Entering his apartment Naruto took a quick shower before laying down on his bed and entering the seal. So what did you want to talk to me about Akane-chan? Akane-chan? Naruto frowned as he looked around and saw that the red head wasn't there. Frowning, he began to walk around in an effort to search for her. As he was walking through the forest, a sound caught his attention. He stopped and listened for a moment, straining his ears to hear the noise, he soon discovered that it was singing. Well, more like humming, since there were no words to the song. He listened for a moment, thinking it was easily the most beautiful sound he had ever heard when he realized that the only two people in the seal were him and a cane. I didn't know a cane could sing so well, he mumbled to himself, then again, I've always thought she had a beautiful voice. He shook his head and ran towards the clearing where he heard her say, hey Akane chan you said you wanted to. I wanted to. Wanted. Naruto tailed off and felt his eyes widen to epic proportions as he saw a sight that most men, and possibly many women, would die for. Akane was currently bathing in one of the lakes that he had made within his mindscape, this one had a large waterfall, which she was currently standing next to. Completely naked. Her light tan skin was glistening in the light as droplets of water ran down her perfect, unblemished and tantalizing skin, running over every curve and contour of her gorgeous body, which was far too perfect to be human. She currently had her back slightly turned to Naruto, presenting him with a three-quarters view, just enough for the swell of her right breast to be in perfect sight of him, and the water where she was standing only reached to a little higher than mid-thigh, allowing her perfectly tight ass to be seen for all, or at least, to be seen for Naruto. Her nine tails that were sticking out of her back where the tailbone was were also cleaning her, rubbing against different parts of her body and adding a sense of erotica to the scene. Her eyes were currently closed as she continued to hum, lifting her hands and rubbing some water on them, so she didn't notice the blonde who was currently gawking at her. Naruto, who had yet to understand the mechanics behind what makes males and females different, beyond the obvious differences in shape, was being given a prime view of what a perfect woman was today. Having no idea about the birds and the bees, and still being too young to really understand the sexuality and sensuality of what he was seeing, he was unable to cope with the sight of a nude cane. Because of this, Naruto's mind shut down, his eyes glazed over, and he blacked out while somehow remaining in an upright position. Finished with her bath a cane sighed in relief, ever since Naruto had created this mindscape things had been much easier for her, it helped greatly that she could not only take some time to wash herself while being surrounded by nature, but that she could also feel the grass when she walked on it, or the water she was currently bathing in. It wasn't quite as nice as being in the real world, but it was good enough that she would be eternally grateful to Naruto for making this for her. Maybe I should give him a special thanks, she thought with a giggle, right before she sighed. If only he weren't so young. Turning around she opened her eyes and blinked in surprise as she saw Naruto, eyes completely glazed over and mouth ajar, standing not but a few feet from the lake. She blushed a bit as she realized that she had taken too long, obviously she should have taken a bath quicker, rather than luxuriate in the water. She felt embarrassed at being seen by the eight-year-old boy. However that soon gave way to her slightly mischievous side as she stalked up to him and gently swaying her hips as she stood not but a foot in front of him. Like would you see Naruto come? She asked, modulating her voice in a way that would send any man into an orgasm or die from the most intense nosebleed ever. She frowned when she got no response and looked to see Naruto, eyes still glazed over, it was only now that she was up close that she could see he wasn't looking at her so much as through her. Naruto, she said, leaning down so she could look into his eyes. Are you okay? Hey Naruto. When she got no response a cane poked him in the forehead and watched in shock as he simply fell over. Huh? I guess his mind simply wasn't ready to see me like this. She sighed, then again he is still a little boy. Still this is going to put a bit of a damper on my plans, and now I'm going to have to teach him about sex. 
Dandling some yaki into the air around her, she created a standard red kimono with a slit that ran up the side. She picked up Naruto, who by now had gone limp and sat herself down against a tree and then placed Naruto's head on her lap. She began to play with his hair as she waited for the young boy to wake up, absently wondering how he would react when he did. She didn't have to wait long as Naruto's eyes soon fluttered a bit before blinking the light out of them. Welcome back to the land of the living Naruto-kun, Akane gave him a foxy grin, did you enjoy the view? View? Naruto slurred, still slightly out of it. It was then that he was inundated with images of Akane bathing. He shot up off of her faster than Minato Namikas ever could, his face burning red with embarrassment as he bowed to her, I'm so, so sorry Akane chan I had no idea you were I mean I knew you were here since you live here, but I didn't you know that I was it was just, it's okay Naruto-kun, she said, halting his stuttered attempts at an apology. I'm not mad, this was my fault, I called you into the sea and took too long with my bath. I should have realized the time. Oh oh, well. Naruto trailed off, unsure what to say. Akane sighed and patted the spot beside her, why don't you sit down? It's a little early, but it would be best to get this lesson out of the way now that you've seen me in such a compromising position. Erm? What conversation is that? Asked Naruto, still embarrassed about what had happened. Akane took a deep breath before she began explaining everything she knew about sex, sexual reproduction, romance between a man and woman, and the differences between the two genders. Having lived for a thousand years, Akane knew a lot about sex, even though she herself was actually a virgin. The entire conversation took up several hours, and by the time she was done Naruto couldn't even look at her without his face, turning a shade of red that put Akane's hair color to shame. She sighed, realizing her chance at getting Naruto his first kill, would have to wait for now. There was no way he could deal with combat while in this situation, why don't you head on out of the seal and get some sleep? We'll continue training tomorrow, okay? All right, Naruto stuttered, disappearing from the seal as quick as he could. It was the first time he felt the need to get away from a cane, and the redeed couldn't help but sigh as she wondered what their relationship would be like now. I guess I'll just have to find out later, she mumbled as she decided to get some rest herself. Another month passed and since that night where Naruto learned far more about women and sex than anyone his age ever should, things had been tense between him and a cane since then. The young blonde still barely found himself capable of even looking the young, looking woman in the eye without blushing. Ever since that night he had had several vivid dreams filled with a cane in various situations like the one he had seen her naked, only he had also been involved. Dreams of an older version of himself and a cane doing acts that he was unprepared to do himself. Even worse, Naruto had found himself discreetly looking at the women of Konoha whenever he walked through the village. It took a concerted effort on his part to keep himself from looking, and even then, it usually failed, and he found himself comparing these women to the one that currently resided in his mind. He was starting to wonder if there may be something wrong with him, he had yet to even reach puberty, and here he was staring at and comparing women's looks. The cane wasn't helping the situation either, sometimes she was just as bad as Naruto, unable to look him in the eye or even speak to him. At other times she was extremely playful, teasing him beyond all reason with comments laced in innuendo, or even the occasional time where she would bend over and present him with a perfect view of her tight derriere her ample cleavage. Naruto wasn't sure what to do, his body was unable to respond to these sensual acts, but his mind was far more developed than his body. The fact that was actually proven true during one of the few times Naruto and Akane actually had a peaceful moment where they didn't feel awkward around each other. Flashback. Naruto had just finished getting his ass kicked by Akane, lasting nearly two hours against the vixen in their spar. It was something he had noticed that she did, the redhead never let a spar go past two hours. She would fight just well enough to be slightly better than Naruto, then when the two-hour mark was up, she would end it quicker than Naruto could say Kaiubi. Good job, your improvement is astounding, Akane said in genuine admiration. Naruto just groaned as he pushed himself off the ground, wondering what hit him. It will feel different when you fight in your real body, since sparring here in this seal only helps you learn the stances. You will need to begin practicing your katas outside of the seal in order to ensure that your movements are ingrained in your muscle memory. Right, Naruto said, standing up and wobbling over to a lake. He looked at his body to see his clothes in ruins while he was covered in sweat and bruises. He absently wondered how everything that happened in the seal could feel so real, despite this being nothing more than a representation of his mind. Shrugging the thoughts off Naruto knelt down and began to wash his face off, splashing the water onto his face and rubbing vigorously. As he was doing that Naruto got a good look at his reflection on the water's surface. A cane chan he said with a small frown. Yes. Asked a cane, walking over to him. How come I look older in my reflection than I do in real life? His reflection in the water looked older than he did. He would have to say he looked around 11 years old rather than his 8 years of age. He had never gotten to see himself in the sea before, but he knew that when he looked in the mirrors at his apartment, he didn't look like this. 
Oh, right, sorry I forgot to mention that this would happen. When Naruto looked up at her, Akane continued to explain, as I said before, this area we are currently residing in is called your mindscape, it is a mixture between a representation of the seal and your mind, which is my theory on why you can change it. The body you possess within this mindscape is not your real body, it is a representation of yourself. She stopped talking as she saw Naruto frown and thought, knowing he would get it, he was a lot smarter than most people gave him credit for. So. I look older, because my mind is older than my body. Something like that yes, she said, though that's simplifying things. You are a lot more intelligent and mature than any of the other kids your age. I suspect that the more you learn and experience, the older your mental image gets. After all, age is more about life experiences than the number of years lived. That makes sense, Naruto said, looking back into the reflection of the lake with a thoughtful look on his face. Flashback ends. Naruto-kun, Akane said as Naruto finished his last Tejutsu Kata. They had decided that he would work on his Tejutsu outside of the seal as well as inside, so while his clones were working on whatever task he had given them, he was working on ingraining his fighting style into muscle memory. Yes, Akane chan asked Naruto, it had taken the entire month for him to start calling her that again, and even now, after all this time, he still blushed when he said her name. Thankfully Akane couldn't see it since she was inside the seal and could only see what he saw. I believe it's time we begin working on the task I had been about to assign to you. Before the incident. Naruto blushed at remembering what she was talking about, what is it? He heard the redhead take a deep breath within his mind, Naruto, I believe it's time you got your first kill. Chapter 6. First kill. W what? Naruto asked, shock evident in his voice. You want me to kill someone? He knew as a shinobi he would eventually have to kill, if not in an assassination then in self-defense at least. But he had not expected to kill until after he became a shinobi. Naruto-kun, you're going to be a shinobi, she said as gently as possible there was no way to truly sugarcoat this. As a shinobi, your village will eventually call upon you to kill. Unfortunately, there is no true way to prepare you to take another person's life, except for doing the deed yourself. B but why do you want me to kill now? Truth be told, the thought of killing someone else terrified him. Because I think it would be better if you were to get this out of the way now, rather than wait until you're on an important mission. Most humans freeze up during their first kill, and that can easily get you and your team killed. So you want me to kill someone in a controlled environment? Asked Naruto, trying to understand what she wanted. As controlled as possible at least Akane said with a shrug. This way, if necessary, I can take control of your body if you freeze up and go somewhere safe. I see your point, he said at last. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath, this was something he knew he would deal with eventually. Okay, how will we do this? We'll leave tonight. It was later in the night and Naruto was getting dressed in an outfit that no one in the village would ever suspect he had. Basic ninja gear similar to that of the Anbu, sturdy black cargo pants, a black sleeveless shirt, two black armbands, black shinobi sandals, a black face mask that covered half his face from the nose down and all of his neck, black gloves and matte black shin and wrist guards. He had gotten them two months ago by using a cane's chakra to shape shift, a demonic ability to literally transform into someone else, to turn into a different person and buy them from on the higher quality shinobi stores. There were two kunai holsters strapped to his thighs, one on the left and another on the right. On the back was another holster, only this one was holding a basic ceiling scroll. Strapped across his back was a ninja too, a short sword with a straight blade and squirt tsuba, it was the standard ninja sword that most anbu used. He had grabbed it from his parents' house since he felt it may prove useful. Page bunch and no jutsu, Naruto muttered as he put his fingers into a ram sign. A single clone phased into existence, without a puff of smoke to show it had been created. It was a testament to how well Naruto could control his vast reserves of chakra. Ready Naruto-kun? Asked Akane. Naruto placed his hands on the clone's shoulder, ready. He felt Akane begin to pour her into the clone to reinforce it. The pair had learned early on that if they did this, not only would the clone last longer, but it could actually take a few hits before being dispersed. It had proven incredibly useful for sparring. I've given it about one tail's worth, so it should last for a month give or take a few days Akane said. It shouldn't take that long for you to find a bandit camp of some kind, they are usually scattered all throughout Hai no Kuni. Right, I guess it's time to get going then. Naruto made his way outside and closed the door, then took to the roofs where he began to jump towards the north gate. When he got there, he saw two guarding the gates. He wondered what the best way to get past them would be. He had to be unnoticed, it wouldn't do for the Hokage to be alerted that he was leaving the village. Despite being mass-hated, he was still a jinch cricky, and the Hokage and his ninja knew that he acted like a large deterrent. Something along the lines of fuck with us and we let our demon loose on you. Or something like that. It only took a moment for him to come up with a plan, using his perfect chakra control to create a cage bunshin without any extra chakra being expelled to alert the 
Already knowing the plan the clone leapt down to the street and used a standard henge to turn into a crimson-furred fox. Normally he would have used a cane's shape-shifting abilities, but since they were only deemed it a waste as they were unlikely to be able to tell when someone was using a henge. That was mostly a skill. The clone revealed itself to the, who the moment they looked at it, got angry looks on their faces, and began to chase the fox who yipped and ran away. Idiots, Naruto shook his head at the display of stupidity and hatred they had shown as he dropped down from the building. He channeled a minuscule amount of chakra to his feet in order to cushion his fall and ensure that he dropped to the ground silently. It was times like these he was thankful for a cane grinding him on his chakra control as he made his way into the alley and looked out. There was no one around him, sending a mild pulse of chakra out in an expanded radius of 50 feet, he determined that there were no ninja in the area either. Naruto put on a burst of speed as he ran through the north gate, which stayed open all night in case a squad of Anbu or any of the elite ninja came in late from a mission during the night. Naruto looked around as he sped along the road, checking his surroundings for only a moment before sending chakra to his legs. He jumped into the trees over to his left and began hopping from tree branch to tree branch. He had to admit, as he hopped through the trees, that there was something exhilarating about being outside of the village for the first time. It didn't look all that different from being in a village, with the exception that there were no buildings around him now, but it was more of the feeling of being outside of the only place he had ever known. The sudden freedom that came with knowing he could do whatever he wanted and go wherever he wanted that got him excited. Try not to get caught up in the excitement of Naruto-kun, a king chided. He, sorry about that, Naruto said, feeling a little sheepish. I'm just so excited to finally be out of the village, even if it's only for a little while. That's okay, it's good that you're excited, truth be told she was glad that despite all that happened to him in the past and Naruto's growing maturity, that he could still act like an excited child. Just remember that you're actually here for a reason. Now, I think we're far enough away from Kanoha. Head ground side and stop for now. Naruto didn't question her as he dropped to the ground and waited for more instructions. Sit down, Akane said. Doing as told, Naruto felt the familiar red energy that was Akane's yaki coming from the seal in his stomach. What are you doing? He couldn't help but ask, his curiosity getting the better of him. I'm sensing, she said. Before he could ask what she meant, Akane asked a question of her own. Have you ever wondered why I am the strongest of the nine biju? Well, not really no, Naruto shrugged his shoulders as he saw the red engulf his entire frame. It was fascinating to watch as he saw the yaki form into the outline of a fox, complete with ears on the top of his head and a swishing fox tail behind it. The energy looked almost alive. That's probably for the best a cane used, I doubt you would have figured it out. The reason I am the most powerful of the nine is actually very simple in its complexity. Unlike the other biju, who rely on their own reserves, my yaki comes from nature itself. Nature itself. What do you mean, like you draw energy from nature or something? The demoness's statement was slightly confusing to Naruto, who had never heard of something like this. Precisely. All life exudes energy, from the lowest plant to the highest life form on this earth, even humans are constantly expelling this energy. This energy is called natural energy, and I have the ability to gather it into myself and use that energy to fill my own reserves of yaki, which on their own are far larger than any other biju in existence anyways. This gives me unlimited power. The cane paused for a moment before continuing, because of this I also have several innate abilities that no other biju has. I am so in tune with the natural energy of the world that I can sense everything around me and differentiate just what it is I'm sensing. Humans exude a much different energy from plants and even other animals. Or I suppose a more accurate thing to say would be that they exude more energy than other animals. So you're trying to sense something using this ability? Asked Naruto. He was rather in awe of Akane's talent, being able to sense everything in your presence would be very useful and was far more impressive than what he had dubbed the chakra sonar. Which was very limited in its capacity to detect people and objects around him. I'm trying to find the nearest town. Hai no Kuni is filled with human settlements and bandits often like to set up their camp near the smaller civilian population centers, less chances of the authorities catching them that way. I see. Naruto said before remaining silent and letting Akane do her work. He simply sat there and watched as the red yaki moved and writhed with a life of its own. It was an hour later that Akane spoke up, I found one. Which way? North by northeast. Naruto stood up and was about to begin traveling in that direction when Akane stopped him. We've done enough travel for today's Naruto-kun, I want you to set up camp and get some rest. You can begin moving out tomorrow morning. Right, Naruto said, feeling slightly embarrassed at being corrected on something as basic as this. He reached into the holster behind him and pulled out a scroll, unraveling it on the ground before he channeled some chakra into it. The scroll had several basic amenities, a sleeping bag and several detection seal tags that were used by the elite of the village during solo missions. 
he created several cage bunch and then gave each of them a tag, making them move 50 feet away from the camp in an 8-point circle, where they placed the tags and activated them. Naruto felt the seal they were connected to activate on his arm, a sign that they were working, and would alert him if anyone breached them. Now that he was feeling safe Naruto crawled into his sleeping back and drifted into a light sleep. It was around 12 o'clock the next day when Naruto arrived at the small town Akane had sensed. Small being something of an understatement when you compared this settlement with a village such as Konoha. The entire village held only a few dozen houses, an inn and three stores that looked like a grocery store, a clothing store and a small eatery. Altogether the place was very quaint. Before entering the town Naruto had used a standard henge to turn himself into an 18-year-old civilian male with short brown and steel gray eyes. The last thing he needed was for someone to wonder what an 8-year-old child was doing running around in shinobi clothing with a sword on his back. Head into the inn, Akane instructed as Naruto was looking around the town, that's usually a prime source of information in small towns like this. You'll want to rent a room, we don't know how long we'll be here, and it would look suspicious if you spent all day around the inn for several days without renting a room out. Acha, Naruto replied and did as told. Entering the inn the current brown-haired Naruto looked around to see that it was about as quaint on the inside as the town was on the outside. Right in front of the door was a front desk where a homely-looking woman with a kind of friendly smile that would put just about anyone at ease was standing. Off to the left was a staircase that likely led to the rooms, and on the other side was a bar with several tables, where a cute girl, who judging from her looks, was the daughter of the woman at the front desk, was serving the few people who were sitting around at the tables. Hello, can I help you? Asked the woman as Naruto walked up to the desk. Yes, I would like to rent a room for a few nights, Naruto said. I'm not sure how long I'll be staying, but it will be at least two or three days at most. Very well, two nights will cost 100, all meals, except breakfast cost extra, she told him. Naruto reached into his pocket and pulled out his wallet. He was thankful that his parents had left quite a bit of money in their bedroom, nearly 10,000, since he knew that he would be unable to even pay this much, thanks to the civilians of Kanoha if they hand. He handed the money over and the woman smiled as she gave him a set of keys, thank you sir. Your room would be the first door on the right. Please enjoy your stay. Thank you, Naruto smiled at the woman, reveling in the feeling of someone actually smiling at him. It was the first time anyone other than a cane or the old Hokage had done such a thing. Walking upstairs Naruto placed the key in the door she had specified, opened it, and walked in. The room wasn't that big, even though it was a tad bigger than his own bedroom in his apartment. But it had a nice cozy feel to it, with a soft-looking bed, a nightstand next to it, a dresser on the other side and a small armor on the other side of the room. There wasn't much else other than a window that overlooked the town and a small door to his left that no doubt led to a restroom, but Naruto didn't need much. Dropping his hinge, Naruto unstrapped his sword, took it off and placed it on his bed, before stripping off the rest of his clothes and heading over to the door to his left. His suspicions about the room behind the door being a bathroom were confirmed when he opened it and walked in, it contained a toilet, small sink and a small shower. Turning on the water Naruto stepped into the shower, just standing in the water as it began to slowly heat up. After luxuriating in the hot water, something he never got in Kanoha thanks to the old crone who owned the apartment he lived in, cutting off his heating and cleaning himself off he went back into his room and put his clothes back on. So how should I begin? Asked Naruto as he sat down on his bed. Start by going down to the bar and getting something to eat, Akane suggested. Keep your ears open, people normally tend to talk without realizing that others might be listening in. We'll do this, along with exploring a few miles outside of town each day, and if we have no luck we'll go to another town. Naruto nodded in understanding as he stood up and walked out of the room and down into the bar. Back in Kanoha clone Naruto watched with a grin as several people ran out of an expensive-looking restaurant. This particular establishment was owned by a man called Okinawa Novato, a wealthy man and one of the few people who rivaled the chain of Akamichi-owned restaurants and barbecue. He also happened to be one of the people who Naruto had found out was particularly spiteful towards him thanks to some snooping around after being kicked out of this particular restaurant. The night before Naruto had mapped the place out and determined which sower it was connected to, then he had used a special seal that when activated, would create the most horrific stench imaginable. On top of that, he had found a way to create another smell that would attract a large amount of cockroaches and placed both seals on a time delay. All he had to do after that was find a nice place to sit back and watch the fireworks. That'll serve that fat slob not to mess with Naruto Uzumaki, Naruto said with a snicker. Is that so? Asked an amused voice from behind. Naruto turned around to see his watcher, Itachi Achiha, dressed in his anbu garb standing next to him on the tree branch with his arms crossed. Hey Itachi Nai-san, the blonde grinned as he rubbed the back of his head sheepishly, to Ajisen then. Itachi shook his head, and Naruto could tell from knowing the Achiha better than most that he was amused, what are we going to do with you? 
it was several days later that Naruto ended up leaving the small town, having not found any evidence of bandits being in the area. Apparently, the place was simply so insignificant and had nothing of real value that bandits simply never bothered with it. Naruto, who was now dressed as a middle-aged man with graying hair and a beard, spent several more days traveling to the next village, this one being quite a bit bigger than the one he had been in previously. It still wasn't quite as large as Konoha, but from what Naruto knew of the maps he had studied the only places that were of a similar size was the capital of Hai no Kuni and a gambling town with a large castle called Tenzakugai. When he got to the town Naruto found one of the many inns that littered it and decided to explore the area, that way he could get a feel for the town, as well as have some fun exploring a place he had never been to before. The town was actually fairly nice, with actual cobblestone streets, rather than dirt roads, and littered with people talking and shopping, the place was definitely more lively than the previous town he had been in. Naruto walked around as he looked at all of the shops, stands and people that milled about. He tried some of the local cuisine, fried calamari on a stick with some kind of spicy dipping sauce. It was pretty good and he enjoyed munching on it before deciding to head back to his inn. He sat down in one of the booths, waiting for the slightly harried looking waitress to come over to him so he could order some food. Hey, did you hear? There's been another attack. Naruto's ears perked up as he heard the whispered conversation behind him, channeling some chakra to his ears he listened in. There's been another one. Was it one of the merchant caravans that came in? Yeah, I heard they got attacked, barely made it out alive. Not only that, but it appears one of the men's eldest daughters was kidnapped. That's why you never take your family when you travel or you are a higher ninja. The King Chan. Naruto said as he ignored the rest of the conversation. The King, who had been listening in as well, already knew what he was going to ask and said, there are two ways to proceed. The first is to find this caravan and get information out of them, the second is to just ask around town and see what you can find. What's the best option? I would ask around town, a cane said after several moments to think about it. Finding the caravan could prove difficult given the number of inns and shops in the city, and you're likely to find information on them anyways. If you find out where they're staying first you can go to them, but if not I would just gather what information you can about the bandits themselves. Going on that sound advice Naruto began to search for information. He used several transformations, turning into different people, so that no one would know who he was or suspect that there was one person looking for a group of bandits. He didn't find out as much as he would like, but he did get a general direction of where all of the raids had taken place. He also found out the little fact that these raids were happening because the town, while large, wasn't large enough to bother stationing a samurai post, and because the raids only happened to passing caravans and travelers, no one had sent a mission request to Konoha. Naruto waited until it was late at night before going out, he was out of his hinge and had climbed out of the window, using chakra to stick to the wall as he ran onto the roof. Heading south the young blonde shinobi in training jumped across the rooftops and made his way into the forest. Once he got there he knew that the hard part had come, he only had a general direction of where all the attacks had taken place, the south road that led to one of the more populated cities. But he had no clue exactly where the base was located. When he found the road Naruto created a dozen cage bunshin and sent them in several directions with orders to disperse as soon as they found the bandit camp. It took half an hour before one of his clones dispelled, and another 15 minutes before Naruto was able to look through the memory to memorize where the clone had gone. Once his destination was known and mapped out he set off. It didn't take that long to find the camp, he could easily spot it in the dark, thanks to the fire they had going. Obviously they had been doing this for so long without repercussion that they felt safe having a fire going at night. That or they were just stupid and had gotten lucky so far. There were currently four people in front of the fire, ugly, dirty and if his enhanced sense of smell was anything to go by, unwashed thugs that were currently laughing and drinking. Naruto couldn't see how many others there were and quickly made another cage bunchin and put it into a mouse that he sent into the camp. He was going to wait until he had received enough information to launch an attack and take out the base when something happened that made his blood turn cold. The loud voice, gruff and obviously male screamed before that same voice shouted, you stupid bitch. Then another scream, this time female, sounded out before there was the sound of something hitting the floor or some solid object, and then all went silent. Aw oh geez one of the men said as he heard the scream. I hope the boss didn't kill her. Yeah, I would like to have a go at the pretty little thing. Hearing these words and the other bandits stating their agreements Naruto's blood began to boil. How dare these people act so callously towards human life. Wanting to teach these men a lesson and make sure the woman he heard was alright, the blonde swooped down from the tree branch to begin his attack. He appeared behind one of the bandits by the fire. His sword was out before conscious thought, there was a flash of light, and Naruto watched as the head of the bandit he had gotten behind rolled along the floor while the body squirted blood out of its neck and dropped. Naruto froze, shock permeated his face that was only seen by the widening of his eyes. What the hell? 
one of the bandits shouted. He killed Kane. Naruto, still wide-eyed, looked up to see the rest of the bandits by the fire descending on him. It was only thanks to his sparring with a cane that Naruto reacted, dodging a slice from one of the swords, deflecting another one on pure instinct alone. As the last weapon, a hammer, came at him Naruto jumped over the person there and pulled a shuriken out of his pouch. Flicking his wrist like he did when practicing and sending the weapon sailing into the back of the man's head. The other men seemed to freeze at this, and Naruto capitulated on that, coming in hard and piercing one of the men through the stomach. Before that man had the chance to topple over, the young blonde had pulled his sword out and blocked the slice from the only man left. Naruto could see the look of fear in the man's eyes at seeing how easily the blonde had killed his comrades. In less time than it took the bandit to blink, Naruto had locked their swords together, pulled out a kunai and threw it into the man's throat. Naruto watched as the man clawed at his throat, blood leaking down as a gurgle escaped his lips. He fell to the ground, twitching several times before he laid still. I killed them, Naruto thought to himself, his eyes just as wide now as they had been the entire battle. He dropped his sword due to the shock he felt, I killed them all. It was so easy. The cane realized that Naruto was going into shock and quickly tried to bring him out of it, Naruto-kun. You don't have time for this right now, there is one more left. The cane, I killed them. It was like stepping on ants. It was so easy. Damn it. A cane said as she tried to pull Naruto's mind back in. Naruto-kun, none of this is your fault, these people were evil. They, now this is odd, a voice spoke up behind Naruto, causing the blonde to turn his head as he spied a large man with a thick build and a bald head. I had wondered what that noise was and looked at what I found. A little ninja. The man looked at Naruto and snorted, well it's a little soon, but I have to thank you for killing them for me. Those men were beginning to get on my nerves, always asking for more, more, more. As a reward, I'll kill you quickly. This guy. He didn't care that his comrades were killed, Naruto thought in shock as the large man raised a very big axe they didn't even matter to him. What kind of man doesn't care for the people who work with him? This man. He's a monster. Naruto watched as the axe descended against him in slow motion, his entire body tensed, and he felt a deep willing of some primal power in the pit of his stomach. As if watching from the eyes of another person, Naruto saw his body crouch low to the ground. His hands entered a position that looked like they were gripping something, even though there was nothing there, and he swung his arms. Only his hands were not as empty as they seemed. Blue Chakra began to coalesce in his hand, so thick it looked solid, it crackled and sizzled, and as the blonde swing came closer to the man it formed a blade that sliced through the large bandit's abdomen. The large man lurched, blood pouring out of his mouth, and Naruto had to jump away, as the top half of the man's body fell away from the bottom, showing he had been split cleanly in two. It only took a minute of staring before Naruto fell down onto his hands and knees, throwing up what was left of his dinner. For several minutes Naruto continued vomiting his food until there was nothing left, then there was another five minutes of dry heaving as his body tried to purge itself of something that wasn't there. Hey Akane. I'm here Naruto-kun, Akane's voice chimed softly in his head. She could hear the distress in his voice and knew that now was not the time for him to wallow in guilt. You need to keep it together right now Naruto, check the tents and make sure there isn't anything of value and see if that girl who we heard is alive or dead. Then you need to destroy the bodies, cremation is the best way, and I'll help you with that. I know it's hard Naruto, but you can't let it get to you right now. Alright, Naruto stood up, though it took several seconds before he could move because his legs were shaking. When he could finally move the young blonde went up to the tent where the large man had come out of and almost began dry heaving again at the sight that greeted him. There, lying on the table was likely the merchant's daughter. She was dead, that much was obvious from the fact that she was not breathing or moving. She was also completely naked, spread eagle on the table with bruises and slash marks covering her body, as well as a growing pool of blood under her head that was beginning to slowly drip off the side of the table. Having learned the birds and bees from a cane he knew enough to know that the girl had just been raped, the comb leaking out of her was a testament to that. Seeing and knowing this was almost enough to make him sick again, but he did his best to keep himself from throwing up. Naruto took a tentative step forward, he wanted to look away from the sight, but for some reason he found himself unable to do so. The girl, who couldn't be older than 16, had light brown hair that looked fairly long and soft green eyes. She was obviously very pretty and likely the reason the bandits had taken her. Naruto felt tears begin to well in his eyes, no one deserves this, especially not someone so innocent. I agree, in all truth the cane was pissed. There were few things in this world that she detested above all else, people who use others for their own gain, people who refuse to do anything for themselves, arrogance, whiners and rapists, not particularly in that order. Naruto, make some clones and have them search the tents for anything of value, we also need to take care of the bodies and give this girl a proper burial. Okay, somehow, someway Naruto found the will to do as told. 
he made five cage bunchons, one that began to check this tent for anything of value, two that went over to the other two tents, one that began to pile the bodies of the dead bandits together, and the last one that Naruto made to find a place to dig a grave. Naruto himself walked over to the table and gently placed hand over the girl's face, closing her eyes, he looked around for a moment before laying eyes on the bed sheets. He ripped the sheets and spread them out on the ground, after which he gently lifted up the girl and laid her down on it. He was about to straighten her limbs when he frowned. He didn't want her to be buried like this, with blood leaking from her wounds and the comb of that monster running down her legs. Looking around, the blonde found a rag, grabbed it and used a small suetin, water release, to make it wet. It didn't take that long to dress her wounds and clean her up, then he straightened her limbs, making her look as dignified as possible, before wrapping the sheets around her form. Lifting the girl back up he walked outside and found a spot to set her, while he went to work on the other tasks that needed to be done. All of the loot that the bandits had stolen was put in a pile that Naruto sorted through, there was some money, which Naruto put in his wallet, since he had no way of knowing who it belonged to, several goods like paintings and metalwork that he sealed into scrolls, until he could decide what to do with them. The object that stood out the most was a small necklace, it was locked, and when opened the inside, it showed a picture of the girl who had just been killed with what could only be her family, a man with dark brown hair, a woman who looked like an older version of the girl, and a little boy was holding the girl's hand. He quickly sucked up his tears and closed the locket, turning it over where he saw the name Carla written on it. He had a feeling that was the name of the girl. Naruto pocketed the necklace, and once all of the loot was sealed, he had a cane use her kitsune by, a powerful fox fire that the demoness had created to cremate the remains of the bandits. After that the clones began to dismantle the camp, it was standard ninja procedure to leave no trace of what happened. Meanwhile the other clone that had been digging the grave had dispelled, letting the blonde know it was done. He picked the girl up again and moved over to the grave. It was small, about 5 feet 6 inches long, 1 foot wide and 2 feet deep. Naruto knelt down and gently placed her in the grave, where he then began to cover it up by hand. It took several hours, by the time he was done the sun was beginning to rise, and his feelings had been numbed. Naruto-kun, a cane said in a soft voice, grabbing the young boy's attention. When you go back to your room, come into the seal. K. Okay. As soon as Naruto re-entered his room he sat on the bed and entered the seal. When he opened his eyes a cane was already standing before him, she didn't say anything, just opened her arms. Arms which Naruto ran into as he began to sob, nothing was said between the two, as the immortal demoness held onto her container. She sat down, taking Naruto with her as she held his head to her chest. She didn't care about how much time they spent like that, or that he was beginning to soak her kimono with his tears, all that mattered was Naruto needed her. Is it wrong that I'm pleased those men are gone? Asked Naruto, his voice a haggard whisper as his tears finally dried up. No, it's not, a cane said in a comforting voice. Those men were horrible, some of the vilest kind of people alive. They killed other people, innocent people for their own gain, raped and killed an innocent young girl, and I can assure you that this is not the first time they had done so. It's only right to be glad men like that are no longer in this world. I feel like a monster, Naruto whispered, like I committed some horrible sin. I was looking at my hands when I came into the room, and it was like I could see the blood on them. You're not a monster, Akane assured him, running her hand through his hair in an attempt to soothe his soul. You're a young man who just killed several corrupt evil men who needed to be brought to justice. Had you not killed them, those men would have continued to strike at passing travelers, they would have found, raped and killed more young women. Because of you, they can no longer do that, and those women, who may have been killed and raped because of them are safe. The young boy, who, through experience and trial by fire, could no longer truly be considered a child, paused and looked up at the woman who was currently holding him. It hurts, knowing I've taken a life, even ones like those bandits. And yet at the same time, I'm glad they're dead. Does that make sense? Of course it does, the fact that it hurts shows that you have a good heart, that you can feel pain by killing, even when the people you kill are evil, says that you're a good person. She brought Naruto's head back and rested her own head on top of his, it's only when you no longer feel that pain that you become a monster. When you feel nothing for those you kill that you will be better off putting up your sword. So I'm not a monster? Asked Naruto in a hopeful voice. No, you're not, a cane lifted his head up very slightly and planted a longer kiss on his forehead. Naruto looked at her for several seconds before resting his head against her again. Can I stay with you tonight? The cane smiled as she said, you can always stay with me, if that's what you want. For the first time since Naruto had killed those bandits in the clearing, a small smile came to his face as he fell asleep, still being held in the arms of the woman who he knew would always be there for him. The next morning Naruto woke up, feeling better, he was a little numb, and the pain of killing and the girl's death still hurt. But thanks to a cane he didn't feel as bad as before. As he looked around the room his eyes caught a glint of light near his side. Looking down he saw the blade that had formed in his hand last night lying next to him. He frowned as he picked up the sword and examined it. 
The sword was a, a Japanese long sword that had a 27-inch blade. The middle ridge of the blade, or the shinogi, was near the center of the blade and had a narrow profile, otherwise known as shinobi hakushi. The point was done in the kasaki style, with a curved profile and smooth three-dimensional curvature across the surface towards the edge. The blade was a dark black that seemed to suck in all light, while the edge was pure silver. At the bottom of the blade, near the tsuba was a depiction of a golden wolf howling. The cross guard had four prongs bent out to form the shape of the manji, kanji for full. The grip was covered in black crisscrossing lace with gold flecks. Finishing the sword off was a short length of chain with a broken link at the end that dangled from the base of the hilt. The entire blade was unlike anything he had ever seen, and he couldn't help but wonder where he got it. We'll figure that out when we get home, Akane said, interrupting his musings. Maybe there will be some knowledge of this in the section of your library. For now though, we should see if that caravan is still here, so you can return that locket you found and let the girl's family know that her death has been avenged. Right. Naruto got up and managed to take a quick shower before going downstairs for breakfast or lunch, since it was midday by now. He spent the next hour or so doing what he had done the last time that he had looked for information when he had been trying to find the bandit camp. It didn't take that long for Naruto to find out that the caravan that had been attacked two days before he had gotten there was currently staying at a hotel called Tyatroite, Tired Trout, and were selling the wares they had managed to escape with at a shop called Jurai Kair, traditional pawn. Figuring he would have the best chance of finding them would be at the store Naruto, in his middle-aged man henge, entered the small shop. He didn't pay much attention to the interior, beyond noticing the knickknacks that were on the shelves in no real form of order or fashion, letting him know the place was a pawn shop. There was only one person there, and it wasn't any of the people he was looking for. It was an old man with shock white hair done in a top knot haircut, he had squinted eyes and a long beard and mustache. Seeing as he was the only one around, Naruto walked up to him, excuse me, um? Yes. Can I help you find something young man? Asked the aging man. Not exactly, but you can help me find someone, Naruto said as he gave the old man a description of the people he had seen in the locket. I had heard that they were selling their wares here, the blonde finished as the old man stroked his beard in thought. Hmm. I think I remember seeing them yesterday, the old man said slowly, yes, that's right. They came yesterday and sold me some of the items they have. I don't know where they are now though. Damn, Naruto thought, hopefully they're still at their hotel. Thank you for your help, Naruto said with a bow. If the old man replied the blonde didn't hear it, since Naruto was out of the door less than a second later. He made his way down the street and walked inside the Tyatruite, stepping up to the front desk where a pretty woman in her early twenties was standing. Excuse me, I'm looking for a man in his mid-forties with dark brown hair and grey eyes. He would be with a woman with brown hair and brown eyes and a little boy. The woman manning the desk looked at him for a second before tapping her chin and thought, you know, I think I remember those people you're talking about. I'm pretty sure they left some time this morning. She opened a small book on the desk and flipped through it. Yep, they checked out this morning. Naruto resisted the urge to swear, even while he bowed and thanked the woman for her time. What are you going to do now? Asked Akane as the blonde left the hotel. There's nothing I can do, Naruto said with a frown. If they left this morning then that means they have a four to six hour head start on me, even if I use cage bunch and I don't know if I'll find them. He reached into his pocket and pulled out the locket, looking at it for a minute before sighing. I'll hold on to this and give it to them if I ever manage to find them during my travels or after I become a shinobi. That's probably a good idea, you need to get back to Kanoha anyways. Which is why we're heading back now, which way is Kanoha? Southeast. Right, off we go then. Another month had passed and summer was only days from ending. During that time Naruto's determination grew and with the help of a cane, he doubled the amount of cage bunshin he could summon for his training. His training was going well, Naruto had around 50 clones all working on it. He had one of them read for half an hour and then dispel, giving the other clones the knowledge on the next step or whatever seal the clone was reading about so they could work. Another clone would take the place of the previous clone, and the process would soon repeat himself. He was still only in the basic stages of learning Fuinjutsu, but Akane told him that he was very much a prodigy and would likely be better than the most prominent seal master in a few years' time. His elemental training, while not progressing like his skills, was still going strong. Because Naruto was keeping his training a secret, he was unable to do the next step in wind manipulation, cutting a waterfall in half with his chakra. However, he had decided to learn the first step for his fire manipulation training, blowing out a stream of fire through his mouth. So far he could only blow out puffs of fire, but he was sure that he would complete it within the next week. He had around 100 clones working on this. The jutsu was going the same as usual, because he had to learn to jutsu on his own for the most part, he wasn't learning it as fast as his other practices. A cane helped when she could, but there was only so much they could do in his mindscape. They had found a small way around that, partially at least. 
by having Naruto spar against Iyaki enhanced cage bunshin and having more clones surrounding them when they fought. Afterwards, all the clones would dispel, and Naruto and Akane could review the spar through the memories of his clones, allowing them to pick out his flaws and correct them. Another form of training Naruto had added to his sparing regime was. The blonde had had his clones search his mom and dad's library for any information they could find on a good style and the Uzumaki clan in general. Their search turned up two things, a scroll of a style known as Issei no Ryuken, Dragon's Cry Sword style. It was a style that had been made specifically by the Uzumaki clan, which at one point had been one of the most feared clans within the elemental nations. It was the reason the clan had been destroyed, the Uzumaki clan had been so feared for their prowess with a blade that Karigakur, village hidden in the mist, Kamagakur, village hidden in the clouds, and Awakakur, village hidden in the rocks, had made a combined effort to wipe them out during the Third Great War. The three great nations had attacked the Uzumaki village, Yuzushi Agakur no Sado, the village hidden in the whirlpools, and wiped them out. Even then, it had taken two months for the Uzumaki clan to be defeated, and the combined forces of the three great nations, which had outnumbered the small clan ten to one, had been reduced by half. The Issei no Ryuken sword style was one that was created specifically with the Uzumaki clan in mind. It was a style that was said to bring out the essence of the dragon, a legendary creature that was said to be one of the most powerful mythical beasts in existence during combat. The style was a combination of speed and ferocious power, and the scroll stated that one who had mastered this style was able to cut through boulders and the strongest steel with relative ease. The style had been created by the Uzumaki clan in order to work with their bloodline. The bloodline was called Hitakage no Yeba, Soul Blade, and was technically considered a chakra-based bloodline. This was because the sword that every Uzumaki used was one specifically made from their chakra. Each sort of an Uzumaki clan member was unique and vastly different from any other. Naruto had found some of his mother's notes and knew that her blade had been a traditional ninja too, but could be absorbed into her body, where she would then shoot chakra chains from her back. No two Uzumaki blades were alike, and each blade held their own special abilities, their own powers, making the Uzumaki clan's bloodline one of the most coveted bloodlines in the world. That was why the style the Uzumaki clan had created had no sword dances, it relied on basic movement and stances, the true power came from the physical prowess required to use the style. The Uzumaki clan members trained their bodies extensively to move at speeds no normal human, even a jonin level ninja, was capable of accomplishing, something their bodies were uniquely suited for to complement their bloodline. For many hours of meditation Naruto had discovered that his blade was called Haikajikami, Wolf of Light and Shadows, and was a blade of contradictions. The black that his blade was made of represented the hardships, the darkness, that was in his life. Yet the edge of the blade was a bright silver and seemed to glow with light, representing his will to not give in to the darkness. The secret techniques that the blade held, all of which were known as Yuzumaki Hijutsu Kenjutsu, Yuzumaki Secret Sword techniques, were Heighten, Light Release, and Yamaton, Dark Release, and allowed him to wield light and darkness-based chakra techniques, something that Akane had told him was unheard of, as those two techniques were supposed to belong to the gods Kami and Yami respectively. Right now Naruto could not use any of the techniques for his sword, even with the knowledge of how to use them his body was unable to handle the strain of doing so. It would likely take several years of training before he could use any of Haikajikami's techniques. Keep going Naruto-kun, you only have one more hour of this, and then you can take a break Akane said as Naruto continued his training while standing upside down on the ceiling. Currently, Naruto was practicing with a Bakken, a wooden sword that was roughly the same length as his sword. Along the length of the wooden blade was a long string of seals that increased the blade's weight so that he could train the speed at which he swung his sword. His shirt was off, having long since been discarded, showing off not only the muscles he had gained from three years of intense physical training, muscles that no child his age should have, but also the many seals that adorned his body. Along his arms, back, chest, stomach and legs were what looked like black chains. This was a seal that he had found in his father's personal notes on sealing called Tiku Fuyan, resistant seals. The seals were designed to increase the resistance of body movement by constantly constricting all of the muscles found in the human body and forcing them to contract against each other. This forced a person using the seals to constantly strain against their own muscles in order to move, increasing both the strength and speed of the user's movement. The amount of resistance from the seal was relative to the amount of chakra used, though the seal only had 100 levels. It was an extremely dangerous seal to use, Minato's notes had said that it should only be used one hour a day. Thankfully, Naruto had a cane and thus, the debilitating effects of using the seal were negated, allowing him to use it as long as he wanted. Currently Naruto was at level 10, when he had first started using the seal it had been relatively easy, the first few levels felt a little like he was underwater. 
At first the blonde had wanted to just increase the seal to a level that was actually difficult to move in, but a cane had told him not to, saying that it was better to have completely mastered each level, that way his tail and form wouldn't become sloppy. After all, there was no use training to be faster and stronger if you lost all sense of coordination while in combat. The way Kane had him use the seal was that he would work on perfecting each kata for his tie and forms while the seal was active, performing them at the same speed he could without the seals while maintaining perfect form. Then he would rework his form without the seals to make sure he could fight without the seals, restricting his movements perfectly. Only after that would he move to the next level. It was highly effective and thanks to a cane it was made doubly so, allowing him to train twice as much in half the time. Despite feeling the strain of every single one of his muscles contracting against each other and the sweat that was soaking his body, Naruto kept his breathing perfectly even and controlled as he moved through his katas. He didn't even acknowledge Akane's words as he focused completely on his movements, ingraining them into his very being. Okay, that's enough for today Naruto-kun, Akane said, go back to your apartment and get cleaned up. Then come into the seal, I have something I want to teach you. Naruto moved out of his stance and into an upright position. He held a hand over a small circle in the center of his solar plexus, where all of the chains of his seal met. Channeling his chakra into the seal, the ring glowed a bright blue for a moment before fading, likewise the chains faded and disappeared, making it impossible to know they were even there. Alright, he said as he stopped channeling chakra to his feet and dropped to the floor below, flipping halfway and cushioning his fall with chakra. Right next to him a cage bunshin phased into existence and dispelled itself the next second, letting the clones that were in the dojo practicing elemental manipulation and, and the other clones that were in the library reading, know that it was time to dispel. Meanwhile, Naruto closed his eyes and concentrated light blue chakra surrounded him before his form rippled, and in his place stood a shorter orange-clad version of himself. Time to head home he said as he moved towards the door. After getting washed, Naruto found himself in the sea. A cane was already waiting for him, a small fanged smirk adorning her face. What's up, a cane chan, he said, sitting down next to her. The cane smirk grew bigger. I've been thinking about our situation and how going to school will hamper the amount of time you have to train. Therefore, I am going to teach you a powerful clone technique that is only known to myself. Naruto raised both eyebrows, then an excited grin made its way onto his face. Have I ever told you I love you? He asked. Despite herself a cane blushed, she knew the words were said jokingly, but she couldn't help but think that maybe he really did feel something for her. After all, they had gotten very close in the past few years, especially recently with everything that happened to the blonde. Damn it. Stop thinking about this. She scolded herself, even if something happens he's too young right now. I need to be patient. Taking a deep breath to calm her raging mind and admittedly perverted thoughts of her and an older Naruto, a cane gave him her own teasing grin. I would hope you love me after all we've been through together and all of the situations we've been in, she said, emphasizing the word situation. Now it was Naruto's turn to blush as he thought of how the vixen before him would tease him with her body. It was tough because even though his mind was far older than his physical body, he still hadn't hit puberty yet and didn't get the typical teenage response, despite his mind giving him erotic images. S so, what was it you wanted to teach me? He coughed, trying to get back on track. The cane grinned at her victory, it is a very powerful clone technique, as I said. With this. For lack of a better word, you will be able to make a clone that will not only contain one third of your chakra, but will not dispel in a single or even multiple hits. It will have all of your abilities and act just like you, in fact, the only difference between this clone and you is that it cannot regain lost chakra and will dispel when its chakra is gone. So you're saying you can give me a clone that not only acts like me, but can also take a massive beating? Asked Naruto, getting a nod. Why didn't you tell me about this sooner? Because the requirement to use this, aside from a massive amount of chakra, is two gallons worth of blood, a cane said with a shrug. Oh oh, Naruto said, looking a little pale. He shook his head and gained a determined look, so what is this clone? The cane gave him a fang grin, I call it Chishio Bunshin, blood clone. Chapter 7. Academy Days PT. 2. It was the start of a new year at the Shinobi Academy. Naruto, clad in his orange monstrosity and with a large grin on his whiskered face, ignored the glares and scowls sent his way as he ran towards the academy. When he got to the room with the number of his classroom on it, he slammed the door open and walked in. Several of the other students who were already inside looked over to see who had made such a loud entrance, several of those people became blinded by the bright orange jumpsuit the blonde was wearing, and more than a few wondered if Naruto was in color blind. Why else would he wear such a hideous bright color? Naruto ignored all of this as he kept his grin on, walking towards an empty seat in the back where he could observe the class. He sat down and spent the rest of the time keeping his idiot grin facade up while discreetly looking at any and all of the noteworthy students in the classroom. Out of all 26 students besides himself, Naruto saw seven that stood out the most. 
seated over the front left-hand corner of the room with a bored look on his face was a kid that could pass off as a younger Itachi. He had raven black hair that was spiked at the back and oddly enough, reminded the blonde of a duck's ass. He was wearing white shorts, blue shinobi sandals and a blue Uchiha style shirt with his clan crest on the back. Currently, he was looking out of the window while all of the girls in the class gave him a dreamy stare. Must be Sasuke, Itachi Nai san's younger brother, Naruto thought, remembering a few times Itachi had told him about his brother when he took Naruto out for Raymon. In the middle row on the right were two more that caught his attention. A tall kid with fairly long jet black hair tied in a spiky ponytail, narrow brown eyes that had a lazy half-lidded expression to them. His attire was rather plain, consisting of a green-lined mesh t-shirt under a short-sleeved grey jacket with green edges, adorned on both the sleeves and the back with a circle with a line through it, brown pants, and blue sandals. Definitely a Nara, Naruto frowned in thought as he brought up the information he knew about the Nara clan. If I had to guess, I'd say it's the son of the current clan head Shikaku, if he's anything like the notes on Shikaku that my old man left, then he'll be the purest definition of lazy genius. I remember them, a cane piped in, even when they had first joined Konoha, that clan was the laziest bunch of people I had ever seen. They make the Sanbi appear hard work, and that damn turtle is the laziest son of a bitch I ever knew. Naruto snorted in laughter at her comment, causing several people to look at him. He ignored them and continued his observations. Next to the Nara was what could only be an Akamichi. The kid was very large, a necessity for the Akamichi due to their clan techniques, and had brown hair and swirl marks on his cheeks. He wore brown shorts, a rather long white scarf, a short sleeve green jacket over a white shirt with a kanji for food SS Shoku, on it, ringy rings, and his legs and forearms were wrapped in bandages. If Nara is the son of Shikaku, I'll go out on a limb and say that this kid is the heir for the Akamichi clan. A little ways away from the two clan heirs was a girl that caught his attention. The girl's most noticeable trait in her appearance were her blue eyes and her long blonde hair, which was currently cut shoulder length and had two short bangs framing her face. Her attire consisted of a short purple vest-like shirt with a raised collar, a skirt that was cut off on the sides, and bandages on her stomach and legs. She also wore purple and white elbow warmers with this. She was obviously a member of the Amanak clan, the only other people in Kanoha with blonde hair and blue eyes like himself. He had to wonder about why someone who was only 8 years old would wear clothing that revealed so much skin. It's not like she has anything to show off, thought Naruto, his mind straying to a cane. Before a blush could make its way to his face he continued his surveillance of the room. Several seats from Naruto himself was a brown-haired kid who had a wild appearance to him, giving him some traits that were akin to an animal. He had messy brown hair, sharp black eyes with vertical slit-like pupils, pronounced canine teeth, and nails that looked slightly clawed. He also had the distinct red fang markings of the Inuzuka clan on his cheeks. Tsum's kid, Naruto decided with certainty, remembering the few times he had seen the woman around the village. She was one of the few people that was actually nice to him. His attire consisted of dark grayish pants reaching to his calves and a gray hooded fur-lined coat. On top of his head sat a small white puppy that only confirmed the boy's Inuzuka heritage in Naruto's mind. Another to catch his attention was a girl with dark blue hair, fair skin and white eyes, with a tinge of lavender. The eyes were completely pupilless, meaning she belonged to the Hyuga clan, one of the most prominent clans in Konoha, and the rivals of the Ichiha clan. Her hair was in a heim cut style, with shin length strands framing her face. She wore a cream colored hooded jacket with a fire symbol on the upper right and left sleeves and fur around the cuffs and hem, with navy blue pants. Naruto was kind of amused to see that the girl looked completely intimidated by everyone around her, as evidenced by how she seemed to be trying to hide in her jacket. That, or she was just attempting to do her best impression of a turtle. The last person to really catch his attention was the boy sitting right next to him. This kid had dark bushy brown hair, pale skin, and seemed to be the tallest kid in class, besides himself when he was out of his transformation. His clothing consisted of dark sunglasses and a sea green jacket with a high upturned collar and a hood that was currently brought up to hide most of himself from the class. Naruto heard a light buzzing coming from him and assumed he was an Aburum, a clan that utilized bugs to fight. The only other person that caught his attention was a girl with bright pink hair and an abnormally large forehead. Cause I mean really, what kind of shinobi had pink hair? The door opened and two people walked in, the two instructors Naruto assumed. The first was a man with brown hair that was kept in a ponytail, dark eyes and a scar across the bridge of his nose. He was wearing the standard Konoha shinobi outfit complete with forehead protector, sandals and flak jacket. The other was a man with white, shoulder-length hair and a bandana-style forehead protector and the standard Konoha shinobi outfit. All right class settled down, the brown-haired man said. The class seemed to quiet down, eagerly awaiting their introduction into the shinobi world. My name is Aruka Yamino, and this is my assistant Mizuki. Mizuki seemed to scowl slightly at the man's words, but only Naruto caught it. 
I would like to welcome all of you to the start of your first year in the Shinobi Academy. Each one of you is here because they wish to serve and protect Konoha as a ninja, and we will do our best to ensure that you all become the best ninja you can be. Many of the students seem to smile at this. Now, when I call your name I want you to come up to the front and introduce yourself by telling us what your reasons are for being a shinobi. Aburam, Shino. One by one the students were called, Naruto ignored all but eight of them. The seven clan heirs, all of whom were from the most prominent bloodline clans of Konoha, and the pink-haired girl who he felt might prove useful in keeping with appearances. It seems like this is going to be an interesting class with so many prominent clan members in it, Naruto thought to himself. Dot Uzumaki. Naruto. Naruto looked up and saw the look of hatred on both Mizuki's face and the look of distaste on Aruka's. This is going to be a long four years, the blonde figured as he walked down to the front. My name is Naruto Uzumaki. The blonde shouted with his wide grin, and I'm going to become the greatest Hokage so that people will look up to me and respect me. Dadabeo. This proclamation was met with several minutes of stunned silence before the entire class started laughing uproariously. Yep, definitely a long four years, Naruto held in a sigh as he went back up to his seat, I wonder how the boss is doing. Hey Naruto-kun. Akane said as Naruto continued going through the katas of the Kitsune Ken to Jutsu style. Two years filled with long hours of practice had ensured that Naruto now had the movements down by muscle memory, all he had to do now was work out the kinks and improve his physical fitness. Yeah? Asked Naruto with a grunt as he flew through a particular fast kata, where he struck his imaginary opponent with lightning-fast knife-edge jabs to where the floating ribs would be located. Moving back out he jumped in the air and spun around and did a heel kick that would have hit his now disabled opponent in the neck. Landing back on the ground he continued his katas. I was thinking, with how much traveling you're going to be doing it may be a good idea to find a way to earn money. I was thinking about that too, 10,000 yen is quite a bit of money, but it won't last forever. Naruto paused as he made several kicking combinations, switching from his left to his right foot, all the while spinning on the balls of whichever foot he was standing on at that given moment. I was thinking of selling my seals, not only do I have a lot of seal designs, but most of the seals that I found at the ninja stores were complete crap. The cane listened with no small amount of amusement as Naruto went on a rant about the terrible quality of the seal paper, ink and the seals themselves. The paper they use is completely shoddy, what with all the creases the paper has, not to mention the poor quality of it. The ink has absolutely no special properties and tends to fade within a year, and don't even get me started on the seals themselves, it's like a fucking child drew them. The redhead decided not to mention that technically, Naruto was considered a child. Instead just listening to him talk about something he obviously held a passion for, even if she had no clue what he was talking about. I have nothing against you selling your seals, that can actually be a pretty lucrative business, since very few people can make them. A cane paused, of course, you should keep all of your more powerful seals to yourself, that way they don't get into the hands of someone who may be inclined to use them against you. Also, we'll need to find a way to protect your seals, so no one else can copy them before we sell your customized ones. That's why I'm going to start hiding my seals into specific designs, like the Uzumaki clan symbol, Naruto told her. It was common practice for a seal master to hide his seals within something, like the Shaiki Fujin, dead demon consuming seal, on his stomach that was in the design of the Uzumaki clan symbol. That's a good idea, I would suggest making some more clones to get to work on that right now, so you can begin making money soon. Having already been thinking along the same lines as the vixen, Naruto created 50 more clones with orders to begin finding a way to disguise his seals. Half an hour later Naruto ended his Tejutsu Kata and walked over to where he had set down his towel, picking it up and wiping the sweat off his body. Alright, on the ceiling, it's time for your training. Naruto sighed as he grabbed his bakken and did as told, it was going to be a long night. Alright class. Naruka called out that he finished his lecture on the Shadame Hokage, a boring lecture on the man's Mokuten, wood release, and how he founded the village, at least it was boring in Naruto's opinion. I want all of you to head outside to the training logs with Mizuki, it's time to begin target practice. The class all scrambled out of their seats excitedly, Naruto included as they ran outside. They met Mizuki who looked at all of them, scowling at Naruto before he began giving instructions on what to do. When I call your name I want you to take these kunai and throw them at the training post, he said, looking down at his clipboard, Aburam, Shino. One by one they all went up, most did terribly, very few kids hit the log, most of their throws going wide though there were a few lucky hits. The ones who did good were the clan heirs, well most of them. Shino, Kiba and Sasuke all did well enough, with Shino getting 9 out of 10, Kiba getting 7 out of 10 and Sasuke getting all 10, even deciding to show off by throwing them all at once, much to the excitement of his fangirls. Ino, Choji, Hinata and Shikamaru, however, did not do as well. 
Ino got 3 out of 10, not only was her aim completely off, but her throws were weak, Choji got 5 out of 10, which wasn't bad, and he had strength behind his throws, but lacked accuracy, Hinata's hand was shaking so hard that she only managed to get 2 out of 10, and left with her head in her jacket to hide her embarrassment, and Shikamaru didn't even try, claiming it was too troublesome, and ended up getting a 0 out of 10. Uzumaki Naruto. Mizuki said, and only Naruto caught the light growl in his voice, it made the blonde wonder why this man hated him so much. Hey. Hey Sakura-chan. Watch how awesome I am. Naruto shouted to the pink-haired girl, Sakura Hurano, a girl who was wearing a red kippa dress with white circular designs, with or without sleeves, tight dark green shorts. After the first two months of the new year, Naruto had decided to use this girl to keep up with appearances, acting like he had a crush on her. Shut up Naruto no baka. Sakura shouted as her face turned the same color as her hair. She shook her fist at him in a violent manner, something she always did when he was not close enough to hit. The girl was one of Sasuke's biggest fangirls, along with Ino Yamanaka, who Naruto felt was a disappointment to her clan, due to how she seemed more concerned with Sasuke than being a better ninja. Because the pink-haired girl was a civilian and extremely violent, she was the perfect cover for Naruto's idiot persona. Naruto walked up to where Mizuki was and took the kunai from him, absently noting that they were so dull even if he hit the target they were unlikely to stick unless he used chakra to strengthen his throws. Not that it mattered since he wasn't trying to hit the targets. Pretending to take careful aim with each kunai the blonde orange clad genin missed each one. Everyone around him laughed and began to make fun of him since even the civilian children got at least one. Naruto pretended to get angry at how all the kids were laughing and moved back into the crowd. The class soon went back inside where Aruka began another lecture. Naruto sighed, Kami, I hate the boss. I wish you were here instead of me. The months passed by in a blur for Naruto as he continued his training, increasing the number of clones he could make from 200 to 300. Once again this increase in Cage Bunshin also produced a remarkable increase in the amount he learned. He was very proud of his accomplishments and couldn't wait until the day that he could show everyone how truly powerful he was. He had also finally finished working on his seal designs, having decided to hide them within a symbol he had made himself. The symbol was essentially the Uzumaki clan symbol, except that it was done in a way that looked like the swirl was made of a fox tail. The tail was subtle enough that people would likely never realize what kind of animal it was, even if they bothered to actually look at the seal when they used it. Now, all he had to do was find a store that he could sell his seals from. A young man who looked to be around 18 years old with spiky red hair that had two jaw-length bangs framing his face and a spiky fringe that covered his forehead was walking down one of the many streets of Kanoha. He had dark purple eyes, a rarity in any country and was fairly tall, standing at 6 foot 5 and had an athletic build that spoke of long hours of training. He was wearing what looked like Ronin Samurai clothing, a traditional dark blue kimono with a pair of black Hakama-style pants underneath. His footwear consisted of Tabi socks and Waraji sandals. He was very handsome, with a chiseled face that held a roguish charm to it. In fact, if one were to look at his general face shape and hairstyle, they would almost assume he was the Yandame Hokage, were it not for the red hair and purple eyes. The smile he wore made several of the women near him swoon, causing the men around him to scowl. Not that he was paying any attention to the people around him. The young man was too busy spending time looking at all of the stores, trying to find a good store to sell his wares to notice the drooling looks the women were giving him or the scathing scowls the men were sending. Let's see Kinsei's Hoisoi Haiki, Kinsei's fine weapons, nope. Shinobi Chuu, Shinobi Central, a bunch of assholes that I ain't helping, the young man sighed. Geez, there doesn't seem to be any shinobi stores around here that I want to sell my seals to. Oh, what's this? He had stopped in front of a nondescript building, with the only decoration being a kunai and the title's Higurashi's weapon shop on top of the entrance. Curious, the young man entered the shop. Looking around the first thing the young man noticed was that the place was easily a shinobi's wet dream, lined all around the walls and on several stands in the store were some of the most beautiful and well-crafted weapons he had ever seen. Everything from axes and lances to ninja twos, he even saw a few broadswords that were said to have been imported from the east many years ago during the second great ninja war. The place was obviously a store that took their job to supply ninja with the proper tools seriously. Can I help you? The red-haired young man was soon staring at a bull of man large and built like a brick shit house. The man had muscles on every part of his body that the redhead could see, he even had muscles on his muscles. He had dark, spiky brown hair and brown eyes and was wearing an off-white shirt, brown pants and a pair of brown boots. Maybe, the young redhead said with an easy-going grin. I was actually here because I saw your store and was hoping that the two of us may be able to enter a partnership for mutual benefit, oh? The large man said with interest. The redhead nodded, this is a beautiful store, and I've noticed that all of the weapons you have are top quality, as well as your shinobi clothing and armor. 
However, I was wondering if you sold seals. And if so, how good they are. You make seals? Asked the large man, sounding both curious and interested. The redhead smirked, yep, I've been traveling the elemental nations learning what I can about the art of ninjutsu. I've been hoping to find a place to sell my seals, but very few stores here seem to really know good quality when they see it. There are a lot of stores that sell cheap equipment, the large man agreed. A moment later he stuck out his hand, Kazuki Higurashi. The redhead took the offered hand in a firm handshake and smiled, Arashi Kazama. Kazuki nodded, I take it you have your seals with you? Arashi nodded, then followed me to the back, showed me what you have, and if I like your stuff, then we can cut a deal. Kazuki-san, I like the way you think. It was nearly two hours later that Arashi left the Higurashi weapons shop, both him and Kazuki being satisfied with the deal they had cut. The large weapons store owner had been very impressed with the quality of Arashi's seals, which as far as he could tell were near flawless. It took a while, but in the end they had both settled on an agreement each could work with. Arashi would supply Kazuki's store with all of the standard seals, and any new seals he came up with would go exclusively to the Higurashi weapons store. In return, Kazuki had offered the man the better end of the bargain, giving Arashi a 60% cut of the profit on all the seals sold. It had originally been 50-50, but after Arashi mentioned that he was also using his own custom-made paper and ink, both of which were costly to make, the man had given him the better offer, knowing that if the redeed went to another store, it may decrease his own sales. As he closed and locked the door to the hotel that he had rented out, Arashi gave a loud yawn while stretching his hands above his head. Long day. Arashi snorted at the voice before a ripple spread across his skin, his hair went from red to gold, his eyes from purple to blue, he shrunk down to a height of 4 feet 6 inches, and his clothing changed to all black shinobi clothing. It was definitely different than a standard day, that's for sure, Naruto said as he looked around the nice hotel room. He moved towards the kitchen where he began looking into the fridge to see if there was anything good to eat, not finding much he sighed, and decided he would use his Arashi persona and go out and get something to eat a little later. For now, he would just go into the seal and spend some time with a cane. We must strike now, Hiruzen. Stated an old frail looking man, who had one hand holding onto a cane. He had black shaggy hair, and his right eye was kept bandaged. He had an X-shaped scar on his chin, a scar that had been given to him during his youth. He wore a white shirt, with a brown robe over top of it covering from his feet to just over his right shoulder. The robe conceals his right arm which was bandaged and covered with three big golden braces. Here is in Saratobi gave an exasperated sigh at his old friend, Danzo. We can still work on negotiations with them. Why are you so adamant about killing members of our own village when all this can be avoided without the need for senseless bloodshed? Danzo nearly scowled at the man he had once called friend, ever since Saratobi became the Hokage he had become jealous of the man who he felt was too weak to be a good Hokage, clinging to the ideals of peace that the show and Nidame Hokages had also clung to. He couldn't help but think that if he were Hokage, none of the problems they had now would be an issue. Known as an old war hawk Danzo was an extremist who preferred to directly eliminate threats through assassination and execution, rather than diplomacy and negotiation. He possessed a fanatical adherence to the ideals of a shinobi, believing they must sacrifice absolutely everything for the village. You've been talking with them for nearly four months now Saratobi, he said, resisting the urge to scowl as he had to keep his reputation of being emotionless up. How long will it take you to realize that Yugaku is not interested in talking? For the past four months the Ichiha clan had been behaving suspiciously, their shinobi were acting weary and secretive. In fact, ever since the Kaiubi attack things with the Ichiha clan had been tense, most people remembered that Madara Ichiha had tried to use the Kaiubi as a weapon, summoning the beast and attempting to use his eyes to control it when he had battled Hashirama Senju, the Shadam Hokage. No one really knew how the battle went, only that Hashirima had won, but later died from his lingering injuries after the Second Shinobi War had started. However, many people remember the tales of Madara summoning the Kaiubi, and people wondered if he could summon it, perhaps the rest of the Ichiha clan could as well, making the people weary and suspicious of them. Since the attack nearly nine years ago things had been getting progressively worse, it had even gotten to the point where Suratobi had his most trusted Anbu, young Itachi, spy on his own family. What the child prodigy had found was disturbing. Hiruzen, I know you dislike bloodshed, especially in our own village, Kaharu, an old lady who had her hair pulled back in a twin bun, locked by a traditional Japanese hairpin with two pearls dangling off the side and tassels that were added at the end. She wore a simple long kimono, closed by an obi, a jacket, and a dash over it. She had squinting eyes that were barely open at any point in time. However, the Ichiha clan is planning a coup, do you really think you can negotiate with them when they're so far along in their plans? Despite or perhaps because of her old age, Kaharu was a very assertive and strong-willed woman. She held on to the belief that the group is more important than any of its individual members, which often clashed with the third Hokage's view. 
Being much more militant than the Hokage she served under, the old woman tended to lean more towards Danzen's way of thinking. Surely even you can see that trying to settle this with peaceful negotiation is impossible, said the final member of their little group. Hamura was an aging man with grey hair, a beard, glasses as well as a constant frown that he always seemed to wear, even in his youth. He also had a strong jawline and facial structure he managed to retain even in his old age. As a member of the Kanoha Council, he wore similar garb to those that Hiruzen would when acting in his capacity as Hokage. Amura was an authoritarian and always had the village's best interests in mind. Like Kaharu, he was more militant than the Hokage he served under, and as such often leaned more toward Danzen's point of view. Saratobi sighed as he was triple teamed, he was unsure what to do, he disliked having to shed blood, especially the blood from members of his own village. Yet at the same time, he knew that they were nearly out of options. Okage-sama, I am willing to accomplish this task. All heads turned to Itachi Uchiha, who had been patiently standing off to the side, having been the one who had just given them this information. Itachi, can you really be thinking of doing something like this? Of killing your own clan? Asked Saratobi, shock permeating his features. Itachi closed his eyes and a small look of pain swept his features as he remembered the third great ninja war. He remembered the countless lives that had been lost due to all of the pointless bloodshed, ever since he had seen war firsthand, the young Ichiha had become a staunch pacifist and supporter of the Sandame's beliefs. However, he knew that if avoiding bloodshed was not possible, then the best way to save the innocent was squash any form of violence as brutally and efficiently as possible. Opening his eyes he looked at his Hokage, I believe this may be the only way to avoid even more bloodshed. If the Ichiha clan succeeds in attempting this coup deaded, win or lose, Kanoha will be weakened, and the other hidden villages will descend upon us like a plague of locusts. You have a point, Hiruzen gave a tired sigh, it was times like these that he truly felt his age. Itachi Ichiha, I am giving you the mission of exterminating the Ichiha clan before they can plan their coup deaded. You are to carry this out immediately. I, Hokage-sama. Itachi said with a bow before disappearing in a swirl of leaves. Itachi would do as ordered, but he had one stop to make before then. Naruto Uzumaki was woken by a loud knock on his door, grumbling he got out of bed and made his way into the living room, transforming into his chibi look as walked. Opening the door he blinked the sleep out of his eyes as he saw Itachi standing in front of him, Naruto could immediately tell something was wrong. Are you alright Itachi Nai-san? Asked Naruto, adopting an expression of concern. Yes, I am fine Naruto-kun, Itachi said with a smile that didn't quite reach his eyes, do you mind if I come in? Not at all, Naruto moved out of the way so Itachi could enter his apartment. The two of them moved into the kitchen living room, Itachi sat down on the couch while Naruto sat down on the chair. So why are you visiting me so late at night? Itachi didn't answer right away, instead taking a moment to look around the room. He had been in Naruto's apartment several times now, and it never ceased to both amaze and annoy him that the blonde who had become like a brother similar to Sasuke was given such a terrible, run-down dump. It was the one thing he hated about Konoha that they would treat their hero with such disrespect. Shaking his thoughts off he looked over at Naruto, circumstances are going to be forcing me to leave the village soon. He saw the blonde tilt his head at the cryptic remark, thankfully the blonde knew better than to interrupt. Therefore, before I leave, I wanted to give you something, and I would like to make a request of you. Um? Okay, Naruto replied, wondering if he should ask Itachi why he was going to leave. First, from the front left pocket of his flak jacket, Itachi pulled a scroll from inside and tossed it over to Naruto. That scroll contains the knowledge of every I have ever learned, there are over 500 in there. The raven-haired soon-to-be traitor smirked at the boy's jaw-dropped expression, I know you are stronger than you let on Naruto-kun. The mere fact that you can abate every Anbu officer who chases after you for hours on end tells me you have more talent than you show. He, Naruto scratched the back of his head as a sheepish smile came to his face, I guess it was stupid to think I could fool you. Does anyone else know? No, Itachi shook his head, even the Hokage doesn't seem to know that you are much more than you appear. You are very good at hiding yourself in plain sight when you don't want people to see you. Thank you, Naruto said, looking at the scroll with excitement, who knew what secrets this scroll contained. What was your request? As I said before I will be leaving the village soon, and I fear that Sasuke will be in trouble, Itachi started, you know my little brother right? Yeah, my class, arrogant attitude, black eyes, black hair in the shape of a duck's ass, Naruto said absently. I know him, the blonde looked over at Itachi, you want me to befriend him or something. You know I already tried that, right? Itachi winced as he remembered the days he made the suggestion that Sasuke might be a good friend for Naruto. His little brother had simply stated that their father had said the whiskered blonde was nothing but a monster and that he could not be trusted, going even further to state that a clanless orphan like Naruto wasn't worth befriending. 
I do apologize for that, I was hoping he would not follow in our father's foot footsteps, Itachi could understand Sasuke's attitude since he wanted to prove himself to their father. But he had hoped that his little brother's desire wouldn't cause him to blindly follow their father. That's okay, I guess, Naruto said with an indifferent shrug of his shoulders, I've gotten used to being hated by now. He got another wince from the raven-haired Anbu. Do you know why I hate Itachi Nai-san? Itachi paused before really thinking about what he should say, he had no desire to lie to the young blonde who had already suffered so much. Yet at the same time he could not disobey a direct order from the Hokage. I am sorry Naruto-kun, while I do know why you are hated, I am afraid that I can't tell you. Hant. Or won't. Naruto already knew why he was hated of course, but wanted to test Itachi, since he was the only person who treated Naruto like a human besides Akane chan the Ichirakus and Siratobi. That, and he had to keep up appearances, Itachi may know he was stronger than he let on, but even he didn't know how strong or that the Kaiubi was helping him. And, Itachi said, there is. There is a law put in place, any who speak of the reason you are hated besides yourself or the Hokage are to be sentenced to instant death. That lot of good that did, thought Naruto as he remembered all of the beatings he had in the past. He had seen every single one of the people he remembered beating him the next day, as if they had done nothing wrong. I suppose there's nothing to it then, deciding to move on he asked, so what was it that you wanted me to do? I want you to keep an eye on Sasuke, Itachi said, I fear that thanks to our father, he will walk the path of our ancestor, and when I am gone, there will be no one around to make sure he does not fall to darkness. Well, I don't know if I can keep him from falling, Naruto said, but quickly added, however, I will do my best to keep him in the village. That's all I can ask, Itachi said, standing up. I hope that someday we can meet again Amado. Later. Itachi Nai-san, Naruto said as Itachi blurred out of existence. What do you think? Something is going to happen tonight, Akane said, knowing what he was talking about, I can feel it. I believe something bad is going to happen, and going by what Itachi is saying, it's going to happen to the Ichiha clan. Good riddance, thought Akane, being careful to keep her feelings from entering the seal. She had never liked the Ichiha clan, after Madara had tried to turn her into a slave. She hadn't put up with that of course, and was the real reason that Madara was dead. She could tell you from personal experience that cooked Ichiha did not taste like chicken. Do you think we should see what's up? No. Shouted a cane, before in a quieter voice saying, trust me, whatever is going to happen is happening because of forces beyond you. And you don't want to be around when whatever happens happens, people may try to link you to whatever went on, and that would not be good. Yeah, I guess you're right, he said slowly. Of course I am, now come into the seal. We'll find out what happened to the Ichiha clan tomorrow. Like Akane had said, Naruto discovered what happened to the Ichiha clan that early that morning as he was traveling on his way to school. Did you hear? They say the Ichiha clan was massacred last night. I wonder if it was the demon. That's what I thought too, but apparently it was one of their own. Yeah, Itachi Ichiha, the Anbu prodigy. Naruto continuously channeled chakra into his ears as he listened to every conversation on his way to the academy. Itachi Ichiha had killed the entire Ichiha clan in one night, minus his little brother Sasuke. Naruto now knew what his brother figure meant when he said Sasuke might stray down the path of his ancestor. The boy might very well become a liability to the villager emotionally unbalanced, if even half of the stories of the torture Sasuke went through were real. Class that entire day was a subdued affair as news of the Ichiha's destruction spread, Naruto noticed that Sasuke was not in class and couldn't help but wonder what happened to him. Out of all the things I could have imagined Itachi doing, I never thought he would destroy his own clan, Naruto thought absently. He likely had a good reason for it, Itachi had been the one Ichiha that Akane had respected, the one she had ever seen, that had not given in to the darkness of his cursed eyes. What reason could he possibly have for killing off his clan? Asked Naruto incredulously. He may not have liked the Ichiha clan, hell. He hated that clan. But to just kill them off was wrong. Perhaps they were going up against the Hokage. I know you don't like killing Naruto-kun, but the Ichiha clan is a clan full of traitors, they would betray you in a heartbeat if it granted them power. Naruto frowned, you sound as if you have personal experience with them. Oh I do, Akane muttered darkly, Madara theme tried to use me in his battle with Ashadame at the Valley of the End. Idiot thought he could use his eyes to control me, laugh, but I showed that bastard that I am not to be reckoned with. Wait, 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 are you telling me that you were at the battle between Madara and the Ashadame? Akane snorted, the Ashadame only battled for like an hour, when Madara realized he was losing, he somehow managed to summon me, and then he tried to take control of me. Even to this day Akane still didn't know how that man had managed to summon her, she assumed it was some kind of space-time ninjutsu, but since she didn't know a whole lot about human techniques she had never been sure. I was the one who killed him. Iruka-sensei would die if he learned that the Shadame didn't kill Madara, Naruto thought jokingly. 
meh, I told him to only mention me in passing, by that time people had forgotten the truth about us Bijuu, and many only wanted to use us for weapons. That, or they feared us for our power. I guess. Naruto was silent for a moment before curiosity got the better of him and he asked, so you know Madara well. Knew, I knew him. Decently, Akane said. I didn't know much about the man personally, I had only met him a few times when he came to try and convince me to side with him against Konoha. However, I do know his clan very well. Really? Yes, after all, I'm the one who created the Ichiha clan. Naruto was so shocked by her words that he fell off his chair in surprise. Getting up he rubbed the back of his head sheepishly as he caught the attention of several of his classmates, most just snorted and ignored him, or laughed at him however, since his reputation as a prankster and idiot was already well known it didn't bother him. You created the Ichiha clan? Asked Naruto once he had gotten back in his seat and managed to move through his shock. Yes, Akane said, seeing no reason to hide it. It was around 1000 years ago that I gave the first Ichiha his Sharingan eyes, it was during one of the many wars that myself and the other Biju found themselves in. This war however, was far different from the one you know of as Shinobi Wars. Naruto found himself fascinated by the story and had to ask, what made this war so different? Because this war was not human against human, this war was a battle of demons versus humans. Naruto was shocked by her answer, but kept quiet while she talked. At the time demons were much more plentiful, and the portals to the underworld were not closed like they are today, myself, along with the other Biju, led the war against the demons who had threatened our lands. Wait, aren't you and the other Biju demons as well? Asked Naruto, why side with humans? We may be demons Naruto-kun, but we are far different than the average demon. There was a prolonged pause before the demoness's voice was heard again, my kind were created by the gods themselves, each one took on an aspect of our master, the one who created us. I was created by Inari-sama, the god of foxes, therefore my demon form is that of a fox, and I am gifted with a cunning intelligence and love of pranks. The nine of us were sent down here by Kami, who gave us the job of protecting her creations. Demons are generally formed from the souls of the damned whose hate burned so strongly they took on the form of monsters. They are not created by Kami or any of the other gods. We were different and it was those differences and our duty to protect Kami's creations, namely humans, that made us join the humans in battle. However, we could not triumph alone, and though we had a large number of humans at our beck and call who fought alongside us, we were steadily being pushed back by the sheer numbers of our enemies. We realized that without more power the humans would never win, and we couldn't use our demon forms for fear of hurting those who served under us. It was decided then that we would choose champions for our cause, we would grant humans we felt were worthy with some form of power that would give them an edge in battle, this is actually how the first bloodlines were formed. I myself created the Sharingan and gave it to a man who would go on to found the Achiha clan. Wow. So then, why do you hate the Achiha clan so much? You mean aside from the fact that Madara tried to use me for his own purposes? Asked Akane, getting a small blush of embarrassment from Naruto. I dislike the clan because of what it had become. The Achiha clan of today is arrogant and have a sick sense of superiority, believing that they are Kami's gift to man and are the only ones fit for the right to rule. It makes me sick just thinking about how corrupt they have become. Aside from that. Akane's voice became far softer and held a regretful tint to it. I know from your memories that it was members of the Achiha clan who hurt you the most during your childhood. It's okay, Akane chan Naruto said, knowing she felt guilty for what they did. I don't blame you and truthfully, I couldn't care less about what happened in the past. In fact, I would thank the people who hurt me because it brought you to me. Akane blushed a pretty shade of pink and was very grateful that Naruto was not in the seal with her to see it. She mumbled a thank you just as Aruka and Mizuki entered the door and the lesson began. The years soon came and went, Naruto continued to play the fool in front of everyone. After what had been dubbed the Ichiha massacre, things seemed to get even worse than before for the blind, he no longer let the Anbu catch him as he played his pranks and had taken to using a different room in the abandoned apartment complex that he lived in because the attacks on him became more frequent. Sasuke had become even worse since that day, before he was just extremely arrogant and always loved to show off. However, ever since Itachi massacred his own clan, the raven-haired academy student became dark, greedy and emo. He refused to talk to anybody, and the few who tried were either ignored outright or verbally abused by the last loyal Ichiha, as the Kanoha population had dubbed him. It didn't help that the civilians and Kanoha council started sucking up to the broody revenge-driven boy, many likely only doing so in the hopes that they could convince Sasuke to marry their daughters in order to gain more power through being part of a clan. Naruto was unsure if that was the main reason for the increase in the Sasuke fan club or if the girls in his class thought they could heal his wounded soul, but Naruto had overheard several of the civilian council members who had daughters in his class to try and convince them to gain favor with the Ichiha. As for Naruto. Give me a few tenjutsu. Naruto sped through several hand seals, ending on the horse seal. 
He took in a deep breath before spitting out a compact ball of wind. The wind ball shot forward at high speed, striking one of the many training dummies in the training field they were using. Like all the blondes used, a cane made him do this one silently. The cane jutsu. His hands nothing more than a blur, the blonde ran through the gauntlet as he ran through the seals for what he wanted to do. Taking in a deep breath Naruto blew out a large fire dragon that roared out in what sounded like rage, before it charged one of the training dummies, it hit the dummy and exploded, leaving nothing more than ash in its wake. He had continued his training, pushing himself past the limits that normal humans could go in an effort to get stronger. This year, he had gone on a total of 100 bandit raids and had actually been forced to fight two C-ranked missing nin, who Naruto had discovered had a bounty in Kanoha's bingo book. He had even managed to get the bounties from the two ninja, using his alias as Arashi Kazama wandering swordsman with a talent for seals without anyone in Kanoha being the wiser. Even the Sandame, who had actually given Arashi the money for his first bounty, had been unable to tell that it was him. Of course, unlike the Henge, Naruto's transformation was actually a genuine transformation, not an illusion, and because of that not even a like the Byakugan or the Sharingan could see through it. The only people who could even tell something was off when he used it were demons and Jinchuriki who had full control over their demons. Otherwise, it was like looking at a regular person. And speaking of his alias, the seals that he had been making and selling had become an amazing source of income. In order to keep his cover Naruto would make Rashi while out of the village, then have him come in through the north gate, where he was forced to fill in several forms stating his name, age, and reason for visiting. Afterwards, he had his business persona leave, then come back six months later, in order to see how much he had made thanks to the seals he had given Kazuki. Apparently they had been so popular that the man had run out of the seals he had been given about three months after Red had left. Naruto had made a total of 50,000 yen from his first sales. Since then, Naruto made sure that Arashi visited every two months to bring in more seals and had given Kazuki several of his older custom seals. Now Naruto had not only a steady income but made more money in one month than most people did in a year. The rate in Jutsu. His fingers moved in perfect synchronization as he continued to train his. When he finished, Naruto slammed his hands into the ground and a large bolt of lightning tore through the landscape as it made its way towards the last training dummy on the field. It struck old, shooting sparks everywhere as the dummy disintegrated. That's enough training, Akane said, letting Naruto finally slump to the ground from having done four hours of nothing more than shooting. Even someone who had more chakra than the current Hokage, launching so many non-stop within such a short period of time, while having 400 clones working on creating seals and whatever else he decided to have them do elsewhere was exhausting. You're going to need to buy some new training dummies. Naruto snorted, well they are kind of fried. All 200 of them were completely destroyed. I'll send a cage bunch in to buy some tomorrow. That's fine, we're done here for now, Akane said, get cleaned up and come into the seal. Okay. Naruto kipped back up to his feet and stretched out. He looked around for a moment at the training ground he was now using. His custom, training ground. Using his Arashi alias Naruto, had bought out the apartment complex he was living in, buying it from an aging man who was eager to be rid of the place, since no one wanted to live near the demon. With no one else living there Naruto had taken one of the rooms on the first floor as his own, letting his Chishio Bunshin use it to keep up appearances. Naruto's entire apartment room was more along the lines of a mansion-sized flat. There were several different sections to the apartment, the training room, the bedroom, the bathroom, living room, kitchen, swimming pool, and the library study. Unlike most apartments however, this one had no real walls that separated one section of the house from another, only a staircase that led to where the bed and bathroom was separated from the rest of the house. The section Naruto had just left was the training room, only called that for lack of a better word, since no other words could not really apply, and that was what he used it for. It was basically just a large expanse of gravel and grass, with one section that held a lot of trees and another that held several bodies of shallow water, the deepest only going about five feet down. It was the largest section of his house, and it was here that Naruto practiced his nin, tai and. The kitchen was just that, a kitchen with stainless steel tops and brand new appliances. Having learned to eat healthy thanks to a cane, the whiskered blonde had gained a fondness for cooking and thus, spared no expense as he bought himself all of the newest appliances. Likewise, the living room was more or less a large carpeted space with several leather sofas and couches, a coffee table, and several potted plants to give the room something extra. There wasn't much to the place, and Naruto rarely ever spent time there. His swimming pool was more akin to a lake with a waterfall. It was about 60 square feet and had a large waterfall much like the one in his mindscape. The water was continuously being recycled as it went up to the fall-through pipes where the water was superheated into steam and purified before coming down the waterfall as fresh spring water. There was a bridge that ran over the waterfall, and it was there that Naruto managed to complete the second step of wind nature manipulation training. 
his library, which was essentially the Namika's library that he had just transported from his father's house, consisted of several large bookcases filled with a near 1,000 scrolls and books that Minato and Kishina had gathered when they were alive. It was near the back of his flat, opposite the training ground, and had a large redwood desk, so it could double as a study. The last section of the flat was the bedroom and bathroom, which were only separated by a very thin wall for modesty, as if he really needed it, since no one came here. The bedroom held a large king-size bed with soft crimson-colored sheets and several large pillows, a large walk-in closet, the one thing that was actually in an enclosed space, a dresser, nightstand and lamp post, while the bathroom had a large jacuzzi-style tub with two shower heads on either side a toilet and a sink. The entire apartment room had taken several months to build, not just because Naruto had to have a cane cast a powerful kitsune illusion that she had woven over the building to make people think it wasn't the apartment complex belonging to the Kaiubi brat, that way they wouldn't get suspicious when several dozen clones of himself in various changes came in to work on the building. Another reason was because of the seals that went into expanding the interior of his room. During his study in seals Naruto had begun to modify seals in order to suit his purpose at an early stage in his education. One of the seals he created was the expansion seal, taking the concept of the sealing scroll, which created a pocket dimension within a piece of paper, and pushing that concept several steps further by creating a pocket space within another space. The apartment that Naruto was currently living in had a total of 12 of these expansion seals, located around the four corners of the first and second floor, and then again in the new corners of the expanded space of the first floor, making the entire flat large enough to hold a decent-sized mansion. Finishing up his shower, Naruto spent the rest of the night in the sea, spending time with a woman who had done more for him than any other being alive. With summer coming up she had decided to take it easy on him and give him a rest, telling him more stories of her past and some of the battles she had been in before the Biju were feared. Chapter 8. Summer Challenges It was midday in Kanoha when two people bearing the forehead protector of Kurigakur no Sato entered the village. That in itself likely would have been considered odd, considering the rumors about the civil war currently happening in Kiri, but it was how much the two contrasted that ended up catching more attention. The person up front was a woman, she looked to be in her mid-twenties and had a slender build. She had ankle-length auburn hair styled into a herringbone pattern at the back, a top knot tied with a dark blue band and with four bangs at the front. Two bangs were short, with one covering her right eye, and two were long, crossing each other on her chest, just below her chin. Her eyes were light green. She was dressed in a long-sleeved dark blue dress that fell down just below the knees. It was closed at the front with a zip and was kept open on the front right side from the waist down. The dress only covered up to the upper part of her arms and the underside of her breasts. Underneath, she was wearing a mesh shirt that covered more of her upper body than her dress but stopped just short of covering her shoulders and still left a sizable amount of cleavage. She also wore shorts in the same color as her dress and, underneath those, mesh leggings that reached down over her knees. Around her waist, she had on a belt with a pouch attached to the back on the left. Polishing off her ensemble were a pair of high-heeled sandals and shin guards that reached up over her knees. She also wore dark blue polish on her fingers and toes and had on dark blue lipstick. The woman was what many men would consider the epitome of beauty and gave off a cheerful demeanor, which was further enhanced by her beautiful and cheerful smile. Despite this, she carried herself with a grace that could only come from years of being a shinobi and held herself like an experienced leader. The person beside the woman was a man who had short tufty blue hair and dark eyes. He also had pointed, shark-like teeth. He was wearing square, black-rimmed glasses connected to what appeared to be headphones, a blue pin-striped shirt and camouflage patterned pants. He also had on his forehead protector on the front of his holster which he used to carry a large double-hilted sword. The sword itself is wrapped in bandages, leaving only the double hilt visible. He also had shuriken holsters strapped onto each of his legs. However, it wasn't the difference in gender nor clothes that gave these two such a stark contrast. Where the woman appeared to be confident and held all the qualities that signified a leader, the man seemed to be shy and held himself in a way that showed a distinct lack of confidence. It was this difference that truly distinguished the two. Yes, sign here please. The voice caught the attention of the two Kiri ninja, and they turned to see a pair of, both staring at the auburn-haired woman with glazed over, drilling expressions. The one who had managed to actually speak was holding a clipboard that was at the moment slipping from his grasp, and he had been holding a pen, but that had long since fallen to the ground. The woman sighed as her bodyguard grabbed the pen and signed the two of them in, she had long since grown used to such treatment, even with the war in her country, she had not escaped some lewd glances. Thankfully, they only came from her enemies, since her own shinobi knew what happened to those who looked at her with such lust-filled eyes. She only wished that she were not on a diplomatic mission here, so she could melt the men who couldn't stop stripping her in their minds. Not have a good stay. The dumbfounded voice of the only caused her to snort as she made her way into the village of Kanoha. 
Taking a look around as she walked, the auburn-haired woman found the village itself was rather beautiful. Trees seemed to litter the entire village, giving its namesake as the village hidden in the leaves, a very literal translation. From where she was walking she could easily see the Hokage Monument, a mountain that held the faces of the four leaders of the village past and present, overlooking the entire village. People of all ages were milling about, playing and talking and just having a good time. The entire village gave off a peaceful aura that one would not have expected from one of the five great shinobi nations, much less the one that was called the strongest. In all honesty she wished her own village was this peaceful. Now if only she could get rid of all the men giving her lecher stares, then it would be perfect. Diturumi Asama, the blue-haired man asked as they walked through the village, as shouldn't we get a place to rest? No, the woman said, I wish to schedule an appointment with the Hokage first. They were already coming up on their destination. The Hokage residence was a large mansion that was located close to both the Ninja Academy and Hokage Monument. It was also the largest building in Konoha, towering over all other buildings. They entered through the front door and after asking a stuttering and blushing for directions, took the stairs all the way up to the top floor, where the Hokage's office was located. Walking up to the front desk the auburn-haired beauty coughed to get the female who was manning the desk's attention. The woman looked up and gave her a jealous glare, can I help you? I was hoping that I could schedule an appointment to see the Hokage, the auburn-haired woman said with a pleasant smile. Hold on one moment, the woman walked towards the door and opened it, there was some muffled talking before the woman came back and said, Hokage-sama is available right now. Thank you, she said with a cheerful smile, even as she was thinking about what a bitch the lady was. It wasn't her fault she was prettier than the other woman was. Entering the room she took a moment to get her bearings, even as she walked up to the desk where Hiruzen Saratobi, the Sandame Hokage and the man who had been hailed as the professor, was sitting. She knew not to underestimate the man just because he was old, this was the man who had led a village through two great shinobi wars and was still strong enough to continue leading, even after having been retired once. Being very respectful she gave the Hokage a curtsy, doing her best not to let her bust jiggle too much, since the old man's eyes seemed to have latched onto it, especially if the light blush on the man's face was anything to go by. Perverted old man, she thought, even as she said, it's a pleasure to meet you Hokage Dono, my name is Mei Terumi. A pleasure to meet you Mei-san, Saratobi said with a congenial smile, making a concerted effort to take his eyes from her bust. My secretary said you wish to discuss something with me. Yes, Mei replied. Saratobi nodded, normally I would make some small talk, but considering what I have heard of your homeland, I don't believe you wish for that. No, Mei agreed, taking a deep breath before plunging in. I have come to request your aid. My people are currently suffering under the yoke of oppression from the Yande Mizukage, Yugura, and the many bloodline clans Karigakur holds are nearing extinction. As a nation who covets their own bloodlines I'm sure you can appreciate the situation we're in. There was a long pause as Saratobi took on a deep look of contemplation before speaking, I can certainly sympathize with your people. However, due to the Kaiubi attack eight years ago we are still recovering, as of now, I don't have the necessary forces to both protect my village and aid you in the war. I am sorry. Oh, it's alright, May replied, keeping her smile up even as she felt disappointment settling in. She had hoped to gain some support from the bloodline-loving village, but it seemed she was wasting her time. Just as she was about to turn around and leave the door burst open, and in walked what, to her, was the most amusing sight she had ever seen. A young boy of about nine years old, with sun-kissed blonde hair, bright blue eyes, a cherub-like face that made him look slightly like a chibi and the cutest whisker-like birthmark she had ever seen on his cheeks. Though his clothes left something to be desired. His outfit consisted of an orange tracksuit with blue on the upper shoulders area, as well as up and down the front, a white swirl with a tassel on the left side, a red swirl on the back, a big white collar, orange pants, blue sandals and a pair of goggles resting on his forehead. Honestly, what a child was doing in such a horrendous outfit was beyond her. Boy are you ready to give me that hat now? The whiskered blonde shouted as he stalked into the room, the secretary looking sheepish as she stood in the doorway. I'm so sorry Hokage-sama, she apologized, I tried to tell him you were in a meeting, but it's perfectly alright, Saratobi placated, I know very well how hard it is to get him not to do something when he's determined. Don't worry, I'll deal with him, the secretary nodded and left. The aging man looked at the grinning blonde, did you know it's rude to interrupt the Hokage when he's in an important meeting with Naruto-kun? Naruto blinked for a few minutes before he rubbed the back of his head and grinned sheepishly, he, sorry Ajison. He trailed off and eyed Mei, then turned back to the Hokage and asked, hey who's the pretty lady? You're not perving on her are you? What? No, I am not. Perving on her. Saratobi said with a scowl and a light blush. Mei actually found herself enjoying the odd and amusing new dynamic the young blonde added to the conversation. Yeah, whatever, you pervy old man, Naruto said. 
Anyways, I'm making this really cool, and it's gonna be so strong that it'll totally beat you, then you'll have to give me that hat and make me Hokage. Yes, yes, but until you create that and you manage to beat me, I'm gonna have to ask that you get out of the room until my meeting is concluded, Saratobi said in a patient voice that told Mei he had done this many times before. Aw. Oh. Do I have to? Asked Naruto with a whine in his voice. Yes, you have to, Saratobi said. Fine, suddenly the blonde was pointing a shaking finger at the Hokage, but be prepared to lose that hat the next time I see you. With that said the blonde stalked back out of the room, not even paying attention to Mei or her bodyguard as he slammed the door shut. I'm terribly sorry about him, Saratobi apologized to Mei. He's an orphan of the Kaiubi attack and has become something of a prankster who enjoys disregarding the rules. That's alright, Mei said with a dainty shrug, our business was more or less concluded. In fact, since we got an answer I think we'll find a hotel to stay the night and leave first thing tomorrow morning. Very well, Saratobi said, again, I apologize for not being able to help you. May withheld a disappointed sigh, I'm sure. Crouched down on a building several dozen feet away from the Hokage residence, Naruto watched as the auburn-haired beauty and the blue-haired man with the sword left hand made their way into the city. So what do you think, Akane-chan? Um. This is definitely an opportunity that we can use to gain some experience. Akane tapped her chin and thought as she looked at the pair through Naruto's eyes. Have a cage bunch and tail them so you know where they're going to stay. We don't want to appear just as they leave from their meeting with the Hokage or it'll draw attention. True, and if I'm going to be fighting in a war I'll need to remake my Chishio Bunshin because I have no clue how long I'll be gone. His thoughts in place a clone phased in existence to his left, transforming into a nondescript female and dropping into the alley they were next to. Meanwhile Naruto made his way to his apartment complex. Walking up to his door Naruto placed his hands in a small circle that held a set of seals, which immediately became visible when he channeled some chakra to them. The seals looked similar to his resistance seals, two small circles with an outward pattern that looked like chains. As he began channeling more chakra the chains began to slither and coil around the circle, getting smaller and smaller until they fit within the twin circles perfectly. Opening the door Naruto stepped into his room. The first thing Naruto did was create his Chishio Bunshin, for the last year he had been draining his blood several times a week in order to have a stock ready for when he needed to make his unique form of Bunshin. Grabbing a two-gallon bucket of blood from a hidden pocket space located in a cupboard in his kitchen, Naruto carried it to the training ground where he set it down. Ready? Asked Akane. All set, Naruto replied as he placed his hands in the thick red liquid and began to focus. While both him and Akane began channeling their respective energies, the whiskered blonde was also picturing himself in his mind's eye. Unlike humans, all of Akane's special abilities were based on intent, there were no hand signs, no shouting out the name of your, just imagining what you wanted to happen and applying your chakra, or in Akane's case, Yaoki. The blood within the bucket began to bubble, climbing into the air slowly. It looked like a person sticking their hand out of the red liquid. More and more soon came out, the bucket was knocked over as the blood took shape outside of it. Two legs soon formed, then some feet, two arms and hands followed along with the fingers, toes and the head. The head formed a mouth, a nose and a set of eyes, along with mimicking Naruto's spiky hair. However, it was still blood. Soon enough that began to change, starting from the feet it began to gain skin. It curled up the figure at a slow pace, and as it reached the chest, the skin branched off in three different directions, the arms and head. Finally the jutsu was finished and in front of Naruto stood an exact replica of him. You know what to do? Asked Naruto. Of course, don't worry boss, I got it all covered, Chishio Naruto said with a smirk. Alright then, since it's summer you get free reign, try to cause as much trouble as you can. Tishio Naruto's smirk widened, don't worry, I will. Mate Rumi sighed as she finished allowing herself the small luxury of taking a long, hot bath. Now wrapped around in a simple bath robe, the young auburn-haired beauty found herself sitting on the couch, sipping some of warm tea. I can't believe I wasted a month-long trip to come here, she muttered as she remembered the meeting she had with the Hokage, even now she felt disappointed, not just in Hiruzen for not helping her, but in herself for thinking he would. Ao did try to warn me this might happen, I hope he and the others are alright. Just then a knock sounded at the door. Mei blinked as she stood up and cautiously walked over, who is it? Someone who's heard about your plight and wants to help, a voice sounded from behind the door, making her blink, both at the sound of the voice and the words spoken. May opened the door to see a handsome male with red hair and purple eyes wearing a dark blue kimono, black hakama and tabi socks while standing in the hallway. The man too seemed to be looking at her, though May was surprised when no blush came to his face. Now there's something you don't see every day, he commented lightly. This woman was quite easily one of the most beautiful he had ever seen, but compared to Akane's unearthly beauty, she was just above average. May looked down and realized she had not changed into her clothes. She found herself blushing rather heavily before she muttered, could you excuse me for a second? 
and shut the door. Getting dressed in her normal clothes, May opened the door again. Now what was it you were saying? I was saying that I had heard about your problems in Kiri and how you were looking for help, the redhead commented, his eyes staying on hers. I have a strong dislike towards those who hold an unreasonable hate for others just because they are different and decided to offer my services to you. I see, May's eyes narrowed, and how did you find out about my request for aid? I have incredible hearing and you were muttering to yourself, he shrugged lightly, something about disappointing old monkeys. Did I really say that? Asked May with a blush. You did. Ozing May looked at the male before her some more, aside from his extremely handsome good looks, there wasn't much about him that stood out. I hope you don't take offense to me asking, but what can you offer me that would make me want your help? Now came the tricky part, Naruto and Akane had been unsure of just how much information they should give away in order to sell him as someone worth having. In the end, they had agreed that there was one thing they could show that might make her agree. Holding out his hand Naruto summoned his blade, allowing May to see the black Dido that was unique to him alone. Itakaj no Yeba, May breathed, her eyes as wide as they could go, even if you could only see one of them. She stared at the haired male who had a small smirk plastered on his face, Yurin Yuzumaki. Hiturumi Sama, are you sure these guys gonna show up? Asked a blue haired swordsman as he stood at the north gate next to his beautiful leader. Of course I am Chijuro, May replied with a calm voice, I told him to be here at 8, we still have 10 minutes left. Just be patient. Not wanting to countermand his leader's beliefs, Chijuro opted to remain silent. May was right anyways, not even 10 minutes later the man she had spoken of could be seen walking towards them. May san, the man greeted with a smile, I hope you had a pleasant night. It was nice, May replied, Kanoha is a rather peaceful village. She paused and raised an eyebrow, I hope you are all ready to go, Arashi san. Of course, Arashi replied with a chuckle, I finished my business a few days ago, I was more or less just lazing around before I started on my travels again. Then we should head out, May said, and together, the three of them walked out of the north gate. It wasn't long after that they had taken to the trees, traveling along the shortest route to reach the small port town that May and Shijuro had arrived from. The time spent traveling was quiet, Arashi used it to speak with his inner demon. Akane chan, have you ever been to Mizu no Kuni? Once or twice, Biju rarely ever traveled away from the nations they were given to watch over. Akane paused, however, I did travel a bit when I began hearing of the other Biju getting captured and sealed. I visited Mizu no Kuni during my travels then. While Arashi was talking to his inner vixen, Mei and Chijuro were keeping an eye on the young man. Mei in particular was curious about him, while Chijuro was interested in seeing the Yuzumaki bloodline up close. The group of three traveled for five hours, stopping when the sun began to set. Okay, now that we're far out of Kanoha, Mei turned her eyes to Arashi, why don't you tell me how you really found out about my request? The way she said those words let the redeemed know that she was not asking him. I should have figured my excuse would seem flimsy, Arashi chuckled a bit as he rubbed the back of his head. Unfortunately, I can't tell you precisely how I heard about your visit to the Sandane, at May's scowl he added, but I can tell you that not much goes through that village without me hearing about it. May raised an eyebrow, from the way he spoke it sounded like he had a spy network in Kanoha, or something that ran along those lines. She wondered for a moment how it was that he could have a network that was extensive enough to slip into the Hokage's room unnoticed. Meanwhile Chijuro looked at Arashi in suspicion, Titurumi sama how do we know we can trust him? You can't, Arashi said, answering the blue-haired swordsman's question for May. All you can do is either accept my words as the truth when I say I want to help you, or you don't, it's as simple as that. However, you two are ninja, trust isn't really something you dole out without good reason. So I wouldn't expect you to trust me until I can prove myself to you. I'll trust you, for now, May said, however, if you give me any reason to suspect treachery, you will be dealt with understood? She asked, in a sickeningly sweet voice that sent shivers down Naruto's spine. You know, I actually kind of like her. You would, Naruto resisted a scowl as he turned a smile on Mei, I understand perfectly. The trip through Hai no Kuni took one week total, it would have taken less time, but they had run afoul of a group of bandits that had been stupid enough to make comments about how they were going to ride the pretty little redhead until she was all used up, resulting in Naruto laying witness to the most brutal slaughters he had ever seen. Tijuro, while lacking in any kind of confidence, seemed to grow a pair when he heard May insulted and had used his sword, Hiramekure. It had been interesting to see the sword in action, the Hiramekure had two holes in the upper end of the blade that were capable of shooting out chakra, which Tijuro seemed capable of manipulating to form weapons, such as a hammer. The only problem he had was that the weapon seemed to tire him out easily. However, while Tijuro's weapons and skills were impressive, what had really held Naruto's interest was May's ability. She was very observant while in battle and could pick up on slight discrepancies in other person's personality, had a very strong tojutsu style, which Naruto had lain witness to when she kicked a man straight through a tree. 
she wasn't like Sanadi, a student of the Sandame Hokage, who was said to be capable of crushing boulders with a finger flick, but she was definitely powerful. But it was her natural manipulation that had really piqued Naruto's interest. Mei was capable of using the earth, fire, and water natures, and had two Kekei Jinkei, a bloodline trait similar to the Uzumaki's, only hers was elemental based. The first, by fusing earth and fire elements, allowed her to use Yoten, Lava Release, Ninjutsu, which made her capable of feats such as spitting out lava that could melt almost anything in its path. The great amount of steam generated after the lava strikes also managed to serve as an effective smokescreen, allowing her to attack again while the enemy was distracted. During the battle she had used this ability to great effect, Naruto had almost felt pity for the man whose ball she had melted off. The second, by fusing water and fire elements, allowed her to use Futen, oil release, ninjutsu, which granted her the ability to release a corrosive mist that was capable of burning away anything it touches. After the battle she had told him that she had the ability to alter the potency and acidity of the mist created by her Futen techniques, and she was apparently not affected by the mist herself. They made it to a small port town and had booked passage that would take them to Mizu no Kuni, land of water, the nation where Kurigakur was located. Arashi closed his eyes and smiled as he felt the breeze blowing against his face, he took a deep breath as the smell of the ocean filled his senses. It was an invigorating experience for someone who loved to try new things. Having only started traveling last year he had never been out to sea before, it was definitely an experience worth returning to at some point in time. May had said that it would take two weeks to reach Mizu no Kuni's shores and another week to get to the rebel encampment. Given that he was likely to be integrated into the war very soon, the redhead felt it would be wise to enjoy what peace he had left. You could enjoy some of that peace here in the sea with me, a cane suggested with a smile that went unseen. I was thinking we could make a beach, and I could even do some suntanning, topless. Arashi felt his face heat up at her comment as the image of a topless a cane came to his mind. Can you please, please not say things like that when I'm in public? What's wrong with Naruto-kun? I thought you would like the images that provoked. I do no wait I don't know wait, it just that. He was cut off by a cane's giggle, oh my, you're so fun Naruto-kun. Arashi scowled as the woman's laughter faded, he was so glad this body was only real in its looks. If his transformation had made his body the same as any other 18-year-old, then he would have needed a cold shower right about now. A very cold shower. Enjoying the weather. Turning his head, Arashi saw Mei walking up behind him with the same cheerful smile on her face that she always had. He quickly shoved Akane's words into the back of his mind, lest he begin stripping the auburn-haired beauty in front of him with his eyes. More like the experience, Arashi said as he turned back to look out at the ocean. I've never traveled by sea before, it's surprisingly soothing. The weather is nice too though, he added at the end. May smiled as she changed the subject, it will only be a few more days before we reach the port of Fuwa to Kaiko, floating harbor, then we'll be in Mizu no Kuni. Mizu no Kuni was one of the five great shinobi nations and contained the hidden village of Kurigakur. It was compassed of many islands, with each having its own unique traditions. During their travel towards the port in Kanoha, Arashi had May tell him what she knew of Mizu no Kuni's geology. What kind of situation can we expect to find once we get there? Asked Arashi. I don't know, May sighed, I left my people in capable hands, but during a war, even the smallest amount of time can change the tides, causing the balance of power to shift from one side to the other. For all I know the war could already be over and we could be walking to either our deaths or our victory. That sounds a little extreme, Arashi said with a small frown. Maybe, but that's what things are like in a war. May looked at him for a few seconds longer before saying, anyways, make sure you're ready to leave by the time we reach port. As soon as we're on dry land, we'll be in enemy territory. Arashi watched her walk away. Turning back to look out at the sea he muttered, Lady, I'm always ready. The port town the three of them got off at had definitely seen better days, the ships that would normally be bustling in and out of the port were almost non-existent, with there only being one or two ships in the dock. Most of the buildings were run down and had rust staining many different areas, making it obvious they either did not have the resources or the people to maintain appearances. As they walked further into the port city, Arashi could see a lot of people that appeared to be homeless. Many of them were sitting off to the sides of the street, begging for money or food, while others were hidden in back alleys and side streets. What was worse was that Arashi could see whole families who were homeless, little children who were even more malnourished than he had been when trying to scrounge a living in the streets of Kanoha. The place was definitely bleak, if this was how things were looking under the current Mizukage's rule, then he could see why people like Mei were fighting. They slowly worked their way through the city, being careful not to attract attention. Arashi saw several ninja wearing Kurigakur forehead protectors jumping from the roofs. The place was teeming with ninja that were loyal to the Mizukage, now he understood what Mei meant when she said enemy territory. No matter where he looked there was an enemy somewhere in his sight. 
when they reached the edge of the city Arashi spotted a middle-aged man wearing an eye patch over his right eye. He was wearing a talisman in each ear with the kanji for a humble form of to hear, SHM, UK -E -T -A -M -A -W -R -U, written on them twice on each side. He also had on a striped shirt and pants with seemingly the same pattern, with a green robe over them. His blue hair was pointed up in a single spike that looked slightly slanted. Over all that he wore a bluish-green kimono and a striped undershirt. Ow, May said with a smile, it is good to see you are well, but why are you the one picking us up? I thought Kira was going to be coming. I felt it would be best if I came personally, the man known as our replied. I see, though her smile remained in place Arashi could sense attention to the woman that had not been there before. It was enough to put him on guard, well I'm glad to see you taking things so seriously, I feel much safer in your hands. May and Shijiro shared a meaningful look, one that Arashi caught easily. Things remained tense as they moved out of the city and into the surrounding swampy woodlands. However, before they moved too far Mei and Shijiro attacked Ao, who managed to jump out of the way just in time to keep himself from getting killed. Who are you? Shouted Mei as she glared at the man who Naruto figured was an impostor. Ao would have never abandoned his post when I gave explicit instructions to hold the fort. Tell me who you are. Who I am doesn't matter, the man said, his voice sounding different, gruffer, than before. Because you're going to die, a dozen Kiri ninja appeared from the surrounding trees. Mei Terumi, we've been waiting a long time to kill you, with you gone the bloodline rebels won't have anyone to look up to. How did they find out about us? Asked Mei, wondering how they knew she had left Kiri and when they would get there. Mei-san, can you do a Sashauha, what a shockwave? Asked Arashi. Of course, said Mei, she would have scoffed at the question were the situation not so serious. Then do so. Mei blinked at the commanding note in the red-haired man's voice, had this been a normal situation she would have questioned why he was ordering her around. As it was she found herself performing the hand seals at near blinding speed. One of Mei's greatest strengths had always been her hand seal speed, which was faster than most ninja could ever hope to keep up with in their life. Tsushauha, what a release. Water shockwave. Because Mizu no Kuni was nothing more than a string of islands, water was an extremely abundant resource. The area that Naruto, Mei and Shijiro were standing had several rivers and streams that connected to the sea. So when Mei called out to her, water from every direction surged towards them, creating a large vortex. Before anything else could happen Naruto slammed his hands on the ground. Large cracks appeared around him and the rebel leader and her bodyguard, right before several gouts of flame burst up from the cracks. The fire hit the vortex of water, creating a thick mist that was impossible for anyone to see through. What the hell? Damn it, I can't see. Who cares? Just launch yours at their last location. Voices shouted from all around them, and Mei was trying to figure out what Arashi was doing and what she herself should be doing. The situation was soon taken out of her hands as she felt herself being scooped up into a pair of arms almost faster than she could react, her instincts almost led her to lash out at whoever had grabbed her. She flicked one of the kunai that she kept secured in her sleeves and was about to stab the person carrying her when she looked and noticed it was Arashi. What are you doing? She asked, both curious and slightly peeved about him carrying her. The boss is taking care of the bad guys at the moment, he didn't want you and Chijiro to get in the way. The boss? Yeah, I'm just a clone. Oh. For some reason the knowledge that she was being carried by a clone surprised her. The clone stopped at a tree branch a little ways away and set her down. Where's Shijuro? Asked Mei, worried about her bodyguard and friend. Over there, Arashi's clone pointed to a tree two feet away where Chijuro was standing next to another clone. Just then screams came in through the mist and Mei couldn't help but wonder what was going on within the thick white smoke screen. Moving as far away as he could be while still remaining in the mist, Arashi waited until the third cage bunshin he had made dispelled, letting him know both Mei and Shijiro were out of the mist. That meant he could get to work. Calling forth Haikage no Akamki, Arashi closed his eyes and began to sense out his opponents. He felt a light breeze coming from the left of him and acted quickly, running towards the source of the breeze and slicing his sword in a vertical slash. He easily felt as well as heard his blade slicing through flesh and bone, which was soon followed by a scream that turned into a strangled gurgle, then a thud as the man fell to the floor. Dead. Did you hear that? It came from over there. Arashi followed the voices with his ears to pinpoint the exact location, when he found the two that spoke he made liberal use of the sunshine to move behind one of them. A flash of his blade and the shinobi the red-haired swordsman was standing behind was killed, literally chopped in half at the waist as the top half of his body went flying. A loud thud and a shriek let him know that several bodies had hit another ninja, a kinoichi by the sound feminine tone. Or maybe a man who screamed like a girl. Either way he assumed it was a woman, that complicated things a little. He appeared right in front of the ninja who screamed, definitely a girl now that he saw her and reversed the grip of his blade, smacking the kinoichi in the temple and knocking her unconscious. 
It may seem sexist, but ever since he began raiding bandit camps and saving the occasional woman from rape and worse, he had promised himself that he would never kill a woman unless it was a clear-cut case of kill or be killed. And he didn't feel it had gotten to that point yet. Out of instinct alone, Arashi ducked and rolled forward, his enhanced senses picking up a swish of a blade where he had previously been. Sucking in a deep breath, he blew out a compressed ball of wind and was rewarded with a shout of pain. Whoever had been hit would be dead, no matter where they got hit. He had gotten his futon. Rankton, wind release. Drilling air bullet to the point where he could compress to the size of a baseball. While it was much smaller and didn't have as much mass, it was also much more powerful and would blow a hole through anything it hit. Sending a pulse of chakra to act as a sonar, Arashi could tell there were eight more ninja around him and they were currently trying to get out of the mist. He quickly set himself into a stronger stance, feet spread at a 45-degree angle from each other, shoulder distance apart with his knees bent. His sword was in a two-handed grip and held near his face with the blade pointing up. Sending out another pulse he memorized the location of each enemy ninja. Uzumaki Hijutsu. Yamaton. Cage Shinton, Uzumaki Secret Technique. Dark Release. Shadow Extension. The words were barely whispered as Arashi spun around in a circle. Were the mist not still acting as an effective smokescreen, the enemy ninja would have seen Arashi's blade become covered in shadows that shot out in a long 25-foot extension. As it was they did not see and therefore could do nothing as it cut into them. Hearing eight separate thuds, Arashi knew he had won. He released a burst of wind chakra that dispersed the misty smokescreen. Mei watched as the mist dispelled and was shocked to see Arashi, whole and single without a scratch on him, and all of the ninja sent after them on the ground, mostly dead. Was that Muin Satsujin Jutsu, silent killing technique? Asked Mei as the red-haired swordsman jumped to her position. The what? Asked Arashi confusingly, he had never heard of that particular style. It's a style used for silent assassinations, Mei explained, one of the former members of the Kiri Shinobigatan and Ananan Shu, Zabuza Mamoichi was a master of this style. Well I know of Zabuza I've never heard of silent killing, Arashi shrugged, anyways, we need to leave. Those ninja I just beat were far too weak to be an ambush squad, they couldn't have been higher than Chunin. They were likely only here to slow us down. So then we'd better get out of here fast, Mei muttered. Chijuro. We're moving out. She shouted down to Chijuro who was still on the ground. The blue-haired shinobi looked up and nodded. Let's go. The three of them took, Chijuro jumping into the trees to follow them as they sped towards the rebel hideout. Hopefully they would reach the base before the real ambush group arrived. Back within the village of Kanoha things had gotten rather tense. A series of large pranks had been played on many of the shops, restaurants and even the clans in Kanoha for the past three weeks. The first string of pranks had been done the first morning of the first day of the week, when the store owners of several prominent shops, all of which had refused Naruto entrance, found all of their stock and inventory switched out with stuff from other stores. Even the items and supplies that had been locked up were swapped. Grocery stores found their food had been switched out with leather, silk, cotton and other cloth needed to make clothes, while civilian outfitting stores had their entire stock of clothing supplies replaced with fruits, vegetables, meats and canned goods. It took several hours for the stores to get everything sorted out. And when they did sort it out and go home, the next day they found their supplies had all been swapped again, forcing them to work extra hard once more. This continued on for a full week, and by the time the person who plotted this prank was done, the store owners and clerks were all so exhausted from working and trying to sort everything out that they had closed shop the next day. The second week consisted of two pranks. The first was sneaking into the Inuzuka clan compound and stealing several dozen bottles worth of dog piss and pheromones. All of the dog piss was dumped into the various food stuff of several different restaurants that had refused Naruto service, while the pheromones were set up in a spray bottle with a timed release on the ceiling fans, this way every hour on the hour, the spray would launch a concentrated dose of pheromones that would spread out across the room where people were eating. Many people had become sick after eating the food full of dog piss, but as soon as they tried to leave so they could go home, they were beset by dozens of horny stray dogs that proceeded to dry hump them. It became even worse when whoever had set up this prank had released a kennel for the Inuzuka dogs, so on top of the hundred of strays that had started molesting the civilian and shinobi population, they also had to deal with several dozen large horny nin dogs. Many people became mentally scarred that day. The second prank of that week had been on the Anbu headquarters. The entire building, which had previously been a nondescript gray color, was now a bright puke green. The inside of the building, which should be impossible for ordinary citizens to sneak into, had been entirely covered floor to ceiling in bubble wrap. The masks, which normally had a painted depiction of some kind of animal, had all been cleaned to their original white. Then someone had taken the liberty of paying crude-looking penis right next to where the mouths were. Some even had two penises. In the third week the prank seemed to have been taken a step up, and the prankster had decided to begin hitting Kanoha's clans. 
The first to receive the prank were the Nara and Yamanaka clans. The deers that the Nara clan looked after had all had their hair shaved into varying shapes, the leaf symbol, the Uzumaki swirl, a Horatian kunai, a very detailed depiction of Kurunayuuhi, Yugao Yuzuki, Hana Inuzuka and Anko Midarashi naked and fondling themselves. This not only caused a problem with all of the Nara clan wives, but also the four aforementioned women who, upon hearing of this, had stormed the Nara head house and demanded an explanation on the threat of castration. Poor Shikaku never knew what hit him. The next prank was played against the Hyuga clan, Aka the Wide Eyes, Aka the Weird Blind Guys, Aka the Clan of Closet Perverts. This particular prank had involved every single Icha Icha book ever made being placed in the dresser drawer of every male Hyuga. Needless to say, when the female members found the legendary perverted books in their husbands, boyfriends, brothers' drawers, getting Jayakin to death was the least of the worries. The only female who did not have any male Hyuga members balls off was one Hinata Hyuga, who had been given her own copy of Icha Icha. The minute she had looked at the pages upon pages of graphic porn, the poor girl had been blown back into a well. Receiving both a concussion and passing out from severe blood loss. The final prank was not against a clan per se. But it was just as, if not more vicious than the other ones combined. One day as Sasuke Ichiha was getting back from training, he had been busy entertaining thoughts on killing Itachi. It was because he was so preoccupied that he never noticed the small dart flying towards him until it became lodged in his neck. He had woken up, five hours later, stripped to his boxers, which were pink, and said I love men on them, tied up and hanging from the ceiling of Kanoha's only gay bar, which was where the next Sasuke Ichiha fanboy club meeting was to take place not five minutes later. The village of Kanoha soon played host to loud, terrified shrieks, making many assume ghosts were haunting the place. By the end of the third week, tension was running high, and everyone, civilians and shinobi alike were looking over their shoulder, wondering when they would be pranked next. In order to maintain the illusion that everything was under control, the Hokage had called all of the Anbu that were in the village for an emergency meeting. I am sure you all know why you are here, here is in Saratobi began, smoking on a multicolored pipe that looked like a child had gotten a hold of some pain and splattered it on. It was only a minor prank that had gotten him, but it was still annoying to know that someone could reach his pipe and do that. What if it had been poisoned? Because of the string of really funny ass pranks, right? Asked Anko, a woman with light brown pupil-less eyes. Her violet hair was done up in a short, somewhat spiky ponytail. As was her usual coat of dress she was wearing a tan overcoat, complete with a fitted mesh bodysuit that stretched from her neck down to her thighs. She wore a dark orange miniskirt, as well as a forehead protector, a small pendant that looks like a snake fang on a thick cord, rather than a chain to prevent it from being easily torn off in combat, a wristwatch, and shin guards. She also had on a dark blue belt around her waist that connected to her skirt that had an appendage-like sash. Hidden on the back of her neck on the left side was a seal, which had the appearance of three tomo. Currently, she was grinning like it was her birthday. I don't know about you, but some of those pranks had me laughing my ass off. You mean like the one where the Nara clan deer had a depiction of you naked on it? Asked a random person who instantly regretted talking as several snakes wrapped around him and slammed him straight into a wall. Was that really necessary Anko-san? Asked Siratobi. The woman just gave him a deadpan look, reminding him of just who he was talking to. Right, Siratobi sighed, he almost forgot who he was dealing with. As you know these past three weeks we have played host to a string of pranks. However, these pranks aren't just the harmless pranks of a child, somehow, whoever did this has managed to prank Anbu, along with some of our most powerful Keke Genkai clans. If someone can sneak into the compounds of our most prominent clans and Anbu HQ for a simple prank, then they could just as easily do the same thing for more devious purposes. Like say, putting poison in the Hyuga's water supply. That silenced everyone as they realized the seriousness of the situation. So what do we do? Asked a random person in the back. Obviously our patrols and guard points have been compromised, therefore we need to come up with entirely new patrol routes, as well as random inspections and guard shifts. The Hokage spent the rest of the time detailing their new plan to guard against these pranks, and the more serious threat of someone who may use the knowledge for more nefarious purposes. They never noticed a small fly that had been sticking to the wall disappear in a puff of smoke. The soft whistling sound could be heard by Arashi as he, Mei and Shijuro made their way to the Bloodline Rebel Faction's hideout. Scatter. He shouted, causing the other two to break away, just as several kunai with exploding tags hit the place they had previously been moving to, then exploding and taking out the tree they had stuck to in a blaze of fire. Arashi swore as he looked behind them to see nearly three dozen shinobi, he could tell these ones were the elite, from the way they moved and their flak jackets, which the first dozen he beat didn't have. I hope one of you two has a plan, he commented right before he sucked in a deep breath and then blew out a large fire dragon that roared fiercely as it charged toward several of the ninja. Suiten. Sujinheki, water release. Water wall. 
one of the shinobi called out, summoning forth a large wall of water that swirled around them as the fire dragon struck. There was a loud explosion of steam as the two cancelled each other out. Mei watched with a small amount of shock, as Arashi used a rather powerful sword without a single hand seal, that kind of ability took decades of dedicated training. She herself could only do the Mizubunshin, water clone, without hand seals. Just who was Arashi Kazama? Two of us are going to have to stay behind in order to keep the enemy from following, Mei said as she came up with a plan of action. The one who goes on ahead will go to our main base as fast as they can and get reinforcements to help the other two out. Well, considering I have no clue where the base is, I'm staying, Arashi commented. He was fine with staying here, this would be his first true test as a shinobi anyways, fighting bandits, and the occasional small-time ninja wasn't really much of a test anyways. How far is the base? Not far away, Chijiro answered for me, about a mile out from here. So who am I going to get the honor of fighting alongside today? Chijiro opened his mouth to volunteer, but may beat him to it, I will. Be but Titurumi sama Stuttered our Chijiro. Don't worry about me Chijiro, Mei said with a calm smile, despite the fact they were still being chazzed. I am a cage level ninja after all, I'll be fine. When it looked like the blue haired swordsman was about to argue she said, this isn't the time, the faster you get to base, the sooner you can get help. Now go. Chijiro knew when he wouldn't win a battle and quickly took off, leaving the two others behind. So, how do you want to do this? Asked Arashi, gripping his sword as he looked over his shoulder at the horde of ninja coming towards them. Mei smiled as she sped through a number of hand seals, we'll do it like this, you may want to get behind me. Futen. Kamu no jutsu, oil release. Skilled mist technique. Blowing out a deep breath, Mei created a cloud of mist from her mouth. Arashi, who had scrambled behind her before she blew out the mist, watched as the first wave of ninja were unable to slow down and ran straight into the mist. The effects were almost immediate as screams of pain sounded across the woods, the men who had run afoul of the mist were being melted. Of course, only about five of the nearly five dozen ninja ran into the mist. The rest were able to circumvent the ever-expanding cloud. Arashi dispelled his sword and went through a series of hand seals for one of his more powerful weapons. Futen. Yuzumaki Koku no Jutsu, Wind Release. Cutting Winds of the Whirlpool. It was his only original technique, it had taken him five months to come up with the idea for the, another two to figure out the hand seals, and three months of having 200 cage bunshin, all enhanced with a cane's yaki, practicing it to complete. The itself was not that complicated in what it did, but the amount of control one had to have over their wind chakra was astronomical. It had taken coming up with several of his own advanced exercises to train his wind nature beyond that of what was normally considered mastery. That it also extended the amount of time it took to master them, making it take a year and three months, with 200 cage bunch in each day to truly complete. Sucking in a deep breath, Arashi blew out a large stream of wind that soon became a spinning vortex of power cutting winds. The air rippled as the wind tore through the ground and trees, the shimmering form of it was shown as a giant whirlpool, nearly 65 feet in diameter. The ninja who had been in front of them didn't stand a chance, the winds tore through them like paper, shredding their bodies to the point where they didn't even look human, just lumps of bleeding flesh that was blown away by the fierce winds that the technique caused. Even the near dozen ninja that had not been caught in the epicenter of the blast were not left unharmed, those who were too close were sucked right into the, suffering the same fate as those who had been struck by the full force of the attack. While well, those who were too far away for them to suck up were blown away and sent flying in a dozen different directions. By the time they had died down, 22 of the ninja that had been after them were dead, while another dozen had been blown away and the last dozen escaped unscathed. Such incredible power. Mei thought in shock, he channeled insane amounts of wind chakra into his lungs, then manipulated it into a condensed whirlpool-like spiral and added wind blades into the mix, combining the two main uses of wind chakra into one fierce. Not only that, but he managed to add a rotating effect to the whirlpool, which sucked all those within a several foot radius into its power and expelling those who were too far away. That kind of nature manipulation is off the charts. I don't even know if I would be capable of doing something like that. Shocking Mei out of her thoughts, Arashi began to cough violently and fell to her knees. He placed one hand on the ground while his other went to his mouth as he began coughing up blood. D damn it, it's still not truly complete, a Kane Chan, damage assessment. You managed to cut up the inside of your lungs and throat, a cane said as she began channeling her into his damaged organs to regenerate them. Thankfully, you didn't tear your lungs apart like you did the last time you tried this. I don't think you'll be able to fully master this until you become a Hanyu. You simply don't have enough chakra to use and liberally coat your lungs and throat for protection at the same time. Right, note to self, wait until Hanyu to use again. Are you alright, Arashi-san? Asked Mei as she leaned over him. Yeah, that still isn't complete, so it takes a toll on my body to use, he said. 
Looking towards the area of destruction he caused he added, I apologize, but until my lungs heal, I won't be much help for the rest of this fight. Mei looked over to see what he meant and realized that there were still many ninja who had not gotten killed or injured during the attack. That's fine, she said with a smile, you just sit back and let me show you why I'm the leader of the bloodline faction. And with that she began running the gauntlet on hand seals, her movement so fast even Arashi could barely see them. Yoten. Jinsoku Yutama, lava release. Rapid fire lava bullets. Maid began spitting out several red globs of lava at a rapid pace, and Arashi got to see just how accurate she was as every shot fired hit someone. Sometimes she would get a headshot, resulting in the instant death of whoever was unfortunate enough to be hit, and others would hit limbs, torso, hands, no matter where she hit though, they always melted straight through, even the flak jackets that would often give some minor protection against kunai, would simply become molten ash. By the time the forces had gotten close enough to truly attack in force, they had already been cut down to 20 ninja. It was here that Arashi saw how powerful Mei's Tejutsu truly was. The woman's style seemed to be more centered on using her feet than her fists, lashing out with powerful kicks that would literally break bones with each hit, oftentimes the person that would get caught by one of her attacks would be sent flying into and sometimes through a tree. Several of the ninja tried to catch her off guard by combining their chakra for a powerful suetan jutsu, but thanks to Mei's dual sub-elemental keke jinkei, their attacks might as well have been buildings blocks thrown by a toddler having a temper tantrum. When the Kiri forces launched a combined water dragon at her, Mei created a power wall of lava that rendered the attack ineffectual and consequently saved her from several kunai that had been thrown in the hopes she would be caught off guard. Mei had then caught the entirety of the enemy ninja off guard by melting the wall back into lava and using it to create a powerful wave that swept the majority of the enemy forces away, right until they all melted down to their base components. There. Mei said as she clapped her hands together in a manner that said she was finished. She turned to Arashi and smiled, how was that? Not bad, Arashi said as he stood up, his lungs were healing along nicely, and he could finally breathe properly now. Using his quick reflexes he flicked a kunai that sailed right towards Mei and passed by her cheek, a thud was heard, and Mei turned around to see an enemy shinobi, with the same kunai Arashi had just drawn lodge between his eyes. She turned back to her red-haired companion and saw a smirk on his face, but you missed one. Mei couldn't help it as she burst out laughing, the absurdity and slight anticlimactic ending from that line was just too amusing to her. Letting out a little chuckle himself, Arashi was going to speak up when a voice came from several meters away, Mei-sama. They both turned and saw Ao, the real Ao, along with Chijuro and nearly three dozen rebel ninja. Mei tapped her foot on the ground and crossed her arms under her chest, unconsciously bringing attention to her bust. You're late, she said, tapping her foot on the ground and raising an eyebrow at the man. As you can see, Arashi-san and I have already taken care of our ambushers. Ao turned to look at Arashi, who noticed his gaze and raised an eyebrow. Can I help you? So you Arashi, the man said, nodding in approval as he looked the repeat over. We need all the help we can get, and it's nice to see that Tarumi-sama managed to get the help of a real man. Need. Real. Man, Mei's eyebrows began to twitch as she heard his words, but thanks to some odd form of selective hearing, only managed to hear the words that pissed her off more than anything else. It's nice to see you strong enough to stand on your own two feet when engaged in combat. Need. Real. Man. Engaged. By this point Mei's eyebrows began to twitch prominently and she looked supremely annoyed. Why, back in my day. By that point Arashi had stopped listening as he felt an intense killing intent coming from Mei. He turned to see her giving Ao a sickly sweet smile that absolutely scared the crap out of him. Ao, Mei said in a pleasant voice, shut up. Or I'll kill you. Ao blinked and took a step back from the auburn-haired beauty in no small amount of fear, what did I do? Profile on the Yuzumaki clan. Originally, the Yuzumaki clan had actually been a clan of samurai, well known for their powerful and talented swordsmanship. No one knows when the Yuzumaki clan gained the Kekei Genkai that would earn them the reputation as one of the most powerful clans in existence. All that is known is sometime during the era when the man known as the Rikidu Senen discovered Chakra, the Yuzumaki clan, were one of the first to appear with a bloodline. The bloodline is called Hitokage no Yeba and is a chakra-based bloodline. However, unlike most chakra-based, which are usually elemental in nature, such as Shadame's Mokuten ability. The Yuzumaki bloodline is based. Formed from the chakra of an Yuzumaki when their soul could be considered an adult, no two Yuzumakis will ever have the same blade. Each sword is distinctly unique, both in its looks and abilities. Records on the different abilities of an Yuzumaki sword are scarce however, some people have claimed to have lain witness to Yuzumaki's launching power cyclones out of their swords or swords that can produce powerful toxins, some have even claimed to have seen Yuzumaki blades that were capable of controlling the very elements, as if it were child play. Because of these powers, the Yuzumaki clan's bloodline is one of the most coveted in the world. 
Many have tried to gain an Uzumaki sword, only to fail due to how zealously the secrets of their bloodline were guarded. During the Third Great Shinobi War, the Uzumaki clan, which had founded the village of Yuzushi Agakura no Kuni, a powerful shinobi village, even though it was not considered one of the five great nations, had allied itself with Konoha, the Uzumaki clan had a long-standing friendship with the Senju clan. Because of the threat they represented, Kiri, Iwa and Kumo launched a simultaneous attack on Yuzushi Agakura. Outnumbered 10 to 1 the Uzumaki clan didn't stand a chance, the siege lasted for several months, Kanoha had tried to send aid, but were blocked off by Kiri's large armada of ships. In the end, the Uzumaki clan had been destroyed, and the few surviving members scattered. Aside from their power and bloodline, the Uzumakis were well known for the resilience their bodies possessed. Many of the surviving members of the force that had attacked Yuzushio would claim that it was like fighting the dead, as no matter how badly damaged an Uzumaki was, they would get right back up and keep fighting. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy it. If you want the next part of this video. Turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys next video.